Good morning and welcome. I would first like to remind everyone to please mute your line when you're not speaking. For media and press, the FDA press contact is April Grant. Her email and phone number are currently displayed. My name is Jorge Garcia and I will be chairing today's meeting. I will now call the first session of the February 9, 2023 meeting of the Oncology Drug Advisory Committee to order. Rhea Batts is the acting designated federal officer for this meeting and she will begin with introductions. Good morning. My name is Rhea Bat, and I'm the acting designated federal officer for this meeting. When I call your name, please introduce yourself by stating your name and affiliation. We'll begin with the ODAC members, starting with Dr. Conway. Dr. Conway, would you be able to unmute yourself and introduce yourself to the committee? Mark Conway, University of Virginia. Thank you, Dr. Conway. Next, we have Dr. Garcia. Jorge Garcia, I'm a GU medical oncologist, a professor of medicine and urology, and the chair of solid tumor oncology at the University of Hospitals Seidman Cancer Center at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Coons. Hey, good morning. My name is Pamela Coons, and I'm an Associate Professor of Medicine and Medical Oncology at Yale Cancer Center and Yale School of Medicine, where I serve as the Division Chief for GI Medical Oncology. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Coons. Next, we have Dr. Liu. Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Liu. I'm a GI medical oncologist and associate professor of medicine at the University of Colorado Cancer Center. I also serve as the associate director for clinical research. Thank you. Dr. Madden. Good morning. My name is Ravi Madden. I'm a medical oncologist at the National Cancer Institute. I'm head of the uh, prostate cancer clinical research section here at the NCI. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Madden. Next, we have our consumer representative, Mr. Mitchell. I'm David Mitchell. I am the president of an organization called Patients for Affordable Drugs, and I'm a multiple myeloma patient. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Next, Dr. Nieva. Hi, I'm George Nieva a thoracic medical oncologist, section head of solid tumors, University of Southern California, Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center in Los Angeles, California. Thank you, Dr. Nieva and Dr. Vossen. Hi, my name is Neil Vossen. I'm a breast medical oncologist and assistant professor at Columbia University Irving Cancer Center, and I'm also a laboratory head and a laboratory-based physician scientist. Thank you, Dr. Vossen. Next, we will move on to temporary voting members. First, we have Dr. Chang. Good morning. My name is George Chang. I'm a professor and chair of interim in the Department of Colon and Rectal Surgery at the University of Texas um, MD Anderson Cancer Center. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Siamber. Hi, I'm Kristen Siamber. I'm a GI medical oncologist and associate professor of medicine at Vanderbilt University. Thank you. Dr. Katsalakis. Hi, I'm Anzita Katsalakis. I'm a radiation oncologist and uh, clinical informaticist. Uh, I work for the uh, James Haley uh, Tampa VA in uh, Vinci Informatics an associate professor of uh, radiation oncology at the uh, University of South Florida School of Medicine and Tampa General Hospital. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have our patient representative, Mr. Mikowski. Good morning. I'm Paul Mikowski, patient representative, a rectal cancer survivor from Albertson, New York. Thank you, Mr. Mikowski and Dr. Park. 
Hi, <clears throat> John Park, radiation oncologist at the Kansas City VA. I'm also the co-chair of the Pharmacy, Pharmacy and Therapeutic Committee here. Glad to be here today. Thank you, Dr. Park. And we have our industry representative, Dr. Kraus. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Albert Kraus, uh, industry representative. I'm a biologist with uh, decades of drug development, cancer drug development in particular experience, and I'm currently an employee of uh, Pfizer. Thank you, Dr. Krause. Next, we'll move on to FDA participants. First, we have Dr. Pazder. Hi, uh, Rick Pazder. I'm the director of the Oncology Center of Excellence at the FDA. Thank you. Next, Dr. Klutz. Hi, uh, my name is Paul Klutz. I'm the deputy director for the Oncology Center of Excellence at the FDA. Thank you. Dr. Lemery. Hello, Stephen Lemery, Director DO3. Thank you. Dr. Fashoy Najay. Lola Fashoy Najay, Deputy Director, Division of Oncology 3. And Dr. Kasak. Good morning. I'm the acting team leader for the gastrointestinal malignancy team in the Division of Oncology 3. Thank you. That concludes panel and FDA introduction. Dr. Garcia. For topics such as those being discussed at this meeting, there are often a variety of opinions, some of which are quite strongly held. Our goal is that this meeting will be a fair and open forum for discussion of these issues and that individuals can express their views without interruption. That's a gentle reminder. Individuals will be allowed to speak into the record only if recognized by the chairperson. We look forward to a productive meeting. In the spirit of the Federal Advisory Committee Act and the Government in the Sunshine Chain Act, we ask that the Advisory Committee members take care that their conversations about the topic at hand take place in the open forum of the meeting. We are aware that members of the media are anxious to speak with the FDA about these proceedings. However, FDA will refrain from discussing the details of this meeting with the media until its conclusion. Also, the committee is reminded to please refrain from discussing the meeting topic during the break. Thank you. Rhea Bath will now read the conflict of interest statement for the meeting. The Food and Drug Administration is convening today's meeting of the Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, FACA, of 1972. With the exception of the industry representatives, all members and temporary voting members of the committee are special government employees, SGEs, or regular federal employees from other agencies and are subject to federal conflict of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws covered by but not limited to those found at 18 U.S.C. Section 208 is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. FDA has determined that members and temporary voting members of this committee are in compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws. Under 18 U.S.C. Section 208, Congress has authorized FDA to grant waivers to special government employees and regular federal employees who have potential financial conflicts when it is determined that the agency's need for special government employee services outweighs his or her potential financial conflict of interest, or when the interest of a regular federal employee is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the government may expect from the employee. Related to the discussions of today's meeting, members and temporary voting members of this committee have been screened for potential financial conflicts of interest of their own, as well as those imputed to them, including those of their spouses or minor children, and for purposes of 18 U.S.C. Section 208, their employers. These interests may include investments, consulting, expert witness testimony, contracts, grants, CRADAs, teaching, speaking, writing, patents and royalties, and primary employment. 
Today's agenda involves the discussion of the investigational new drug application 157775 for Dostarlamab-GXLY for injection, submitted by GlaxoSmithKline. The proposed indication or use for this product is as a single agent for the treatment of patients with locally advanced treatment-naive mismatch repair deficiency, microsatellite instability high rectal cancer. FDA would like to obtain the committee's input on the following. One, the adequacy of proposed trials to evaluate the benefits and risk of the Starlimab for the proposed indication, including trial design, study population, clinical endpoint, and patient follow-up. And two, the adequacy of the proposed data package to permit an assessment of the benefits and risks of Dostarlamab for the proposed indication. This is a particular matters meeting during which specific matters related to GlaxoSmithKline's IND will be discussed. Based on the agenda for today's meeting and all financial interests reported by the committee members and temporary voting members, a conflict of interest waiver has been issued in accordance with 18 U.S.C. Section 208B3 to Dr. Kristen Siamber. Dr. Siamber's waiver involved her employer's research funded by the National Cancer Institute, for which her employer receives between zero and 8,000 per patient enrolled in the research study. The waiver allows this individual to participate fully in today's deliberations. FDA's reasons for issuing the waiver are described in the waiver documents, which are posted on FDA's website at fda.gov slash advisory committees slash committees and meeting materials slash human drug advisory committees. Copies of the waiver may also be obtained by submitting a written request to the agency's Freedom of Information Division, 5630 Fishers Lane, room 1035, Rockville, Maryland, or requests may be sent via fax to 301-827-9267. To ensure transparency, we encourage all standing committee members and temporary voting members to disclose any public statements they have made concerning the product at issue. With respect to FDA's invited industry representative, we would like to disclose that Dr. Albert Krauss is participating in this meeting as a non-voting industry representative acting on behalf of regulated industry. Dr. Krauss's role at this meeting is to represent industry in general and not any particular company. Dr. Krauss is employed by Pfizer. For the record, Dr. Kimmy Eng has acknowledged being a principal investigator or co-investigator for several contracts or grants involving the National Cancer Institute, Cancer Research UK, Colorectal Cancer Alliance, Pharmavite, Evergrande Group, Janssen, and Revolution Medicines. Dr. Eng has acknowledged receiving speaker fees from Bayer and being a scientific advisor for Pfizer and Bayer. Dr. Eng has acknowledged being a scientific advisor for GlaxoSmithKline and receiving less than $10,000 in 2022. As a guest speaker, Dr. Eng will not participate in committee deliberations, nor will Dr. Eng vote. We would like to remind members and temporary voting members that if the discussions involved any other products or firms not already on the agenda for which an FDA participant has a personal or imputed financial interest, the participants need to exclude themselves from such involvement and their exclusion will be noted for the record. FDA encourages all other participants to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have with the firm at issue. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Garcia. Thank you, Ms. Bat. We will now proceed with the FDA introductory comments from Dr. Lola Fashoyan Aji. Morning, members of the committee, the GlaxoSmithKline team, invited guests, and FDA colleagues. I'm Lola Fashoyan Aji, and I'm a medical oncologist and the deputy director for the Division of Oncology 3. I welcome you all to this convening of the Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee to discuss the proposed clinical development program for Drostalimab for the treatment of deficient mismatch repair or microsatellite instability high locally advanced rectal cancer.
Dorsalumab is an approved program death receptor 1 blocking monoclonal antibody. GlaxoSmithKline, heretofore referred to as GSK, is developing Dorsalumab for the treatment of patients with deficient mismatch repair or microsatellite high locally advanced rectal cancer, which I will refer to as a proposed indication throughout my presentation. Prior to providing you an overview of the issues for discussion today, I refer the committee to reports of the preliminary efficacy results of a single institution study of dorsalumab in patients with deficient mismatch repair, locally advanced rectal cancer. These results have been discussed at major oncology conferences and have been reported on in prominent journals. In this single arm study conducted at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, patients received dorsalumab every three weeks for six months followed by non-operative care and were followed for clinical response. In a report published in the New England Journal of Medicine, study investigators reported a 100% clinical complete response rate for all 12 participants who had completed treatment. After a median follow-up of one year, none had needed other treatment or had had cancer regrowth. These results have generated enthusiasm and caution in equal measure. If demonstrated to be safe and efficacious in clinical trials, treatment with dorsalumab will likely change the treatment paradigm for this disease, providing a radiation-free, non-operative management treatment option for patients with locally advanced rectal cancer who would typically receive multimodality therapy that is associated with substantial toxicity and lifelong treatment-related sequelae. However, the preliminary nature of these data cannot be overstated and further study is needed to determine whether these results can be replicated in a larger cohort of patients and across many different clinical care settings that have variable expertise in the non-operative management of this disease. My presentation will follow this outline. I will conclude my remarks by presenting the topics for which FDA is seeking the committee's thoughtful discussion and recommendation. We referred this program for discussion at the ODAC as we have typically done to ensure transparency and to get input from the community on the clinical and regulatory issues before the FDA. GSK proposes to conduct a multi-center single arm trial sim similar to the previously described single institution study. The two trials will evaluate dorsalumab as a treatment that would replace the current standard of care which is administered with curative intent. The primary efficacy endpoint is clinical complete response at 12 months. Data from these two single arm studies are proposed to be the basis of a marketing application seeking accelerated approval. Analysis of clinical complete response and event-free survival after additional follow-up are, are proposed to provide confirmatory evidence of dorsalumab's effectiveness. We are seeking the committee's we are asking the committee to discuss and provide input on the adequacy of the proposed strategy to demonstrate the safety and effectiveness of dorsalumab as a treatment for DMMR MSI high locally advanced rectal cancer. We would like your thoughtful input on the measures that can be taken now, early in the clinical development of dorsalumab, to generate the data that will demonstrate the safety and effectiveness of dorsalumab for the proposed indication, specifically with respect to the proposed use of single arm trials in the curative intent setting, the clinical endpoints, the patient population, and the adequacy of the data to be generalizable to patients with locally advanced rectal cancer and across diverse treatment settings with respect to experience at administering non-operative management. I will now provide a brief overview of the disease background. Please note that FDA's invited guests from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute will provide a more extensive review of rectal cancer treatment and outcomes using standard of care treatment as well as the non-operative management approach that is used at some highly specialized centers. Rectal cancer is often described together with colon cancer, which may result in underestimation of its true incidence. According to the American Cancer Society, an estimated 46,000 cases will be diagnosed this year in the United States. Approximately 12 to 15 percent of colorectal cancer cases are DMMR or MSI high, with decreasing frequency as stage of the disease increases from stage 1 to stage 4. 
The data for DMMR prevalence in rectal cancer are limited, but published reports indicate 2 to 20% of rectal cancers are DMMR. Treatment of rectal cancer varies by stage, and uh, treatment of stage 2 and 3 disease is the topic for discussion today. This slide depicts the standard of care treatment of locally advanced rectal cancer and outcomes. And please note that this treatment paradigm is applied irrespective of MMR or MSI status. Details regarding the preferred neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiotherapy regimens and treatment sequencing used will be discussed in subsequent presentations. But following completion of neoadjuvant treatment, patients undergo resection of the rectum and may receive additional chemotherapy postoperatively. While outcomes are generally good, some patients do experience local tumor recurrence and distant tumor metastases. Treatment-related adverse events can be significant. As a result, interest in a surgery sparing or non-operative management approach has been the subject of ongoing investigation. This approach requires careful monitoring or watchful waiting of patients who have a clinical response to chemoradiation or chemoradiation plus chemotherapy. However, use of a non-operative management strategy is variably implemented, largely based on institutional experience and expertise and due to the limitations of the historical data that informs current use of this approach. Variability exists with respect to patient selection, treatment administered uh, prior to the period of watchful waiting, and in the clinical assessment methods used to determine clinical response. This slide illustrates the marked heterogeneity across studies, with variability at practically every decision point in the continuum of this approach, as highlighted by the orange arrows. The differences across studies poses challenges for establishing benchmarks for the non-operative management approach. Shown here are the largest series describing outcomes in patients who underwent non-operative management. These studies will be reviewed in detail in subsequent presentations. The only prospective evaluation of the non-operative management approach to date is shown on the right column. The organ preservation of rectal adenocarcinoma, or OPRA trial, investigated non-operative management using different sequencing of chemotherapy and chemoradiotherapy in patients with locally advanced rectal cancer. Patients were randomized to one of two treatment arms of 5-FU and oxaliplatin-based chemotherapy followed by chemoradiation, or the reverse. Please note the differences in tumor regrowth and organ preservation rates across arms, which differed only in the sequencing of therapy. To summarize, there is market heterogeneity across studies evaluating patients who underwent non-operative management for locally advanced rectal cancer, leading to residual uncertainties that stem from challenges in interpreting results. Consequently, benchmarks for the non-operative management approach have not been established in the overall locally advanced rectal cancer population, let alone in the DMMR MSI high population. Relevant to today's discussion is the unclear relationship of clinical complete response to long-term outcomes of benefit, and equally as important is the unclear significance of clinical complete response observed in the setting of chemotherapy and radiation therapy versus a clinical complete response in the setting of a radiation-free treatment approach as proposed in the Dorsalumab program. I will now very briefly describe the Dorsalumab development program as the applicants will be discussing this in greater detail. I will highlight some regulatory considerations. Although we will not be discussing the benefit risk assessment uh, in the context of a marketing application, I will briefly review FDA's evidentiary standard for approval because we are asking the committee to provide input on the adequacy of the proposed data package which GSK intends to be the basis of a BLA submission. To receive approval, a sponsor must provide evidence that the drug is safe and effective for its intended use, and the data must come from adequate and well-controlled trials. There are two approval pathways. Accelerated approval is granted to drugs that treat serious or life-threatening diseases to address an unmet medical need, and approval is granted based on an improvement over available therapy as measured by an intermediate endpoint that can be evaluated earlier before irreversible morbidity or mortality, and that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. In granting accelerated approval, FDA may require confirmatory trials to verify and describe clinical benefit. Traditional approval 
approval is generally granted to drugs that demonstrate clinical benefit as measured by effects on how patients feel, function, or survive. For approvals in the early non-metastatic curative intent setting, FDA has typically uh, requested randomized control trials that compare an investigational therapy to standard of care or that evaluate the investigational agent as an add-on to standard of care with approval based on, an esta on established endpoints of clinical benefits such as survival. Regulatory dossiers that include analysis of time-to-event endpoints in the context of a single arm trial are discouraged because the results are uninterpretable in the absence of a comparator group. A noteworthy exception to these general principles is the use of durable complete response rate as an endpoint in single arm trials investigating therapies for patients with BCG unresponsive high risk non muscle invasive bladder cancer with carcinoma in situ. In this clinical scenario, cystectomy provides a curative option, but it is associated with significant mor morbidity and a 9 day, 90 day mortality rate that may be as high as 10 to 15% in older patients. The considerations for acceptance of a complete response rate evaluated in a single arm trial in this curative setting to support approval of products for the treatment of BCG unresponsive high risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer in situ include the lack of suitable therapy to serve as comparator in randomized clinical trials and public stakeholder discussions with FDA's participation and agreement on endpoints trial designs, treatment assessment, and follow-up that would be adequate for trials designed to support regulatory action, and FDA subsequent guidance to industry that describes FDA's expectations for an adequate data package. The top of the slide shows the two single arm studies that GSK plans to submit in a future marketing application. The key efficacy endpoints are shown in the right columns. Clinical complete response rate at 12 months is proposed to support an, applic an application for accelerated approval, and in blue are the endpoints proposed to confirm and verify clinical benefit. A third study of perioperative dorsalumab in locally advanced colon cancer is proposed to provide supportive evidence of the safety and effectiveness of dorsalumab. I will now present the discussion topics. To facilitate um, adequate discussion across select issues regarding GSK's program, we have identified topics for discussion. While these are related issues, we ask that the committee allot time to discuss each topic separately to facilitate clear understanding of the committee's perspectives and recommendations. As a first topic, please discuss the adequacy of the proposed single arm trials to evaluate the efficacy and safety of dorsalumab, including the long-term benefits and risks of treatment, taking into account the curative intent setting and the fact that available non-operative management treatment option includes radiotherapy. We are also seeking the committee's input on the adequacy of the proposed clinical endpoints to characterize and verify the benefit of dorsalumab. Please take into account the uncertainties regarding the relationship between clinical complete response rate and endpoints denoting clinical benefit in the context of current treatment options. Discuss the magnitude and durability of clinical complete response rate that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit and the adequacy of event-free survival investigated in a single arm trial to characterize clinical benefit. As a third topic, discuss relevant issues to be considered in the general locally advanced rectal cancer population, which represents a heterogeneous group with respect to risk of recurrence, and the potential impact of a non-operative management approach that importantly will not include radiation therapy for local control. Are there subgroups within the locally advanced rectal cancer entity for whom the benefit risk assessment would differ significantly using a non-operative approach that that is for whom surgical resection is necessary to achieve long-term outcome? Are there patients who are at higher risk of recurrence who should be adequately represented in the proposed clinical studies to inform the benefits and risks of dorsalumab across the population? Finally, 
discuss the potential impact of the variability in care, expertise, and experience across diverse clinical settings on study conduct and ultimately on outcomes. Should site selection for the proposed trials consider the diverse settings that will likely administer dorsalumab should it be approved? Following what we hope will be an informative discussion, we ask that the committee votes on the following question. Will the data from the proposed single arm trials enrolling a total of 130 patients be sufficient to characterize the benefits and risk of dorsalumab in the curative intense setting that is DMMR, MSI high, locally advanced rectal cancer? This concludes my presentation. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Fashoy and Ajay. Both the FDA and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To ensure such transparency at the advisory committee meeting, FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages all applicants, including the GlaxoSmithKline LLC's non-employee presenters, to advise the committee of any financial relationship that may have with the sponsor, such as consulting fees, travel expenses, honor area, and interest in the sponsor, including equity interest and those based upon the outcome of the meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your presentation to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your presentation, it will not preclude you from speaking. We will now proceed with the presentations from GlaxoSmithKline. Good morning. My name is Ivan Diaz Padilla, and I'm responsible for immune oncology clinical development at ESK. We look forward to today's discussion about our planned study, which has been designed to objectively evaluate the benefit risk of dostarlimab for treatment-naive rectal cancer patients. This is a study that, if successful, is likely to change the treatment paradigm. First, it is important to note that mismatch repair deficient, microsatellite instability high tumors, known as DMMR MSI high, are highly susceptible to checkpoint inhibitors. This is due to several factors, including increased expression of PD1 and PDL1 in tumors, increased tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and increased neantigen due to high tumor mutational burden. A subset of rectal cancer is caused by this rare mutation. Like in other solid tumors, DMMR MSI high has become a well-established predictive biomarker of response to PD-1 inhibition. And that is also the case in rectal cancer. As such, NCCA guidelines recommend its testing for all patients with rectal cancer. Dostalimab is an established anti-PD-1 monoclonal antibody for advanced, recurrent DMMR MSI high tumors. It has received accelerated approval in two indications for adult patients. First, for endometrial cancer that has progressed on or following treatment with a platinum containing regimen. And second, for any solid tumor that has progressed on or following treatment and for which there is no alternative treatment option. These indications are based on our Garnet multi-cohort single-arm trial where those Talimab demonstrated deep and durable responses in second line and beyond DMMR MSI high solid tumors. Garnett showed an objective response rate of 44 percent. The median duration of response was not reached and the estimated percent of patients maintaining a response for 12 and 24 months was 92 percent and 85 percent respectively. Importantly for our discussion today, the study included 105 patients with colorectal cancer and demonstrated a confirmed objective response rate of 43%. While the median duration of response was not reached, 
it ranged from 2.8 to 41.5 months. Understanding dorsalimab's effectiveness in metastatic DMMR MSI tumors, it was also hypothesized that it could also be effective in locally advanced cancers. To investigate this, a team of researchers at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center is running an ongoing study using dorsalimab monotherapy earlier in a patient's rectal cancer treatment journey. As you will hear, the study is evaluating neoadjuvant dorsalimab in DMMR MSI high locally advanced rectal cancer and has demonstrated unprecedented efficacy, delivering clinical complete responses in all patients. And for those patients eligible for a 12-month evaluation following treatment with dorsalimab, the response has persisted. All have sustained their complete clinical response, achieving a CCR12. And further, all patients have avoided the adverse effects associated with the standard of care. Following on these results, GSK has designed a larger global study with endpoints that align with the MSK study to further demonstrate the benefit of dorsalimab in these patients. The study intends to enhance the robustness and demonstrate reproducibility of the MSK methods. This is the study design being presented for your input today. It is also the study we plan to do with the results from MSK to support accelerator approval in this indication. The study 219369 is a multi-center, single-arm, phase two study that will establish the efficacy of dostalimab in locally advanced DMMR MSI high rectal cancer. The primary endpoint is a sustained clinical complete response for 12 months, CCR12. Published evidence shows that achieving a CCR12 predicts for long-term clinical benefit, including being potentially curative without the need to surgically remove the rectum as often happens with the current standard of care. We plan to start enrolling patients in April of this year. Let me take a moment to define clinical complete response on CCR12. First, it is important to understand that a clinical complete response is a stringent endpoint, defined as the absence of any abnormality or residual disease based on both endoscopic and MRI examinations. Assessing CCR following the adjuvant treatment is being pursued by investigators as a means to manage a patient's cancer with a non-operative approach with the goal of organ preservation. CCR12 builds on the astringency of an initial CCR to demonstrate durability 12 months following completion of therapy. During this time, patients are carefully monitored with a non-operative management approach. Sustaining a clinical complete response for 12 months predicts for disease-free survival at five years and other long-term clinical benefits, including overall survival. With that as an introduction, here's the agenda for the rest of our presentation. All external presenters have been compensated for their time to prepare for this meeting. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Sersek. Thank you, Dr. Diaz Padilla. Good morning, I'm Andrea Sersek from Memorial Sloan Kettering. I'm glad to have the opportunity to discuss the challenges we face in caring for our patients with DMMR MSI high locally advanced rectal cancer. To begin, it's important to understand that we are discussing a rare form of a serious cancer. Locally advanced rectal cancer is defined as either stage two or three disease, and in the United States, more than 20,000 individuals are diagnosed with this stage of rectal cancer every year. And of those, only about 5 to 10 percent are known to have the DMMR MSI high mutation, which is a distinct group within the overall rectal cancer population. Biomarker status varies across rectal tumor stages. The highest incidence occurs in stage 2 and then decreases with increasing stage. So let's review the current treatment approaches. There are two established standards of care for treating DMMR MSI high locally advanced rectal cancer. Both include trimodality therapy with chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, which is also known as totomesal rectal excision where the rectum is removed. 
One approach, standard neoadjuvant therapy, utilizes neoadjuvant chemoradiation followed by surgery and then adjuvant chemotherapy. The second approach is known as total neoadjuvant therapy, or TNT, where all treatment is given upfront before surgery. And while these intense standards of care can be curative, approximately one-third of patients still succumb to metastatic disease. Many patients undergoing a total mesorectal excision require a temporary colostomy, and up to 30% become permanent due to the tumor location. Colostomy is associated with a variety of issues, including social, physiological dysfunction, depression, and stoma complications. Even without a permanent colostomy, the effects of surgery and radiation may impair survivorship and a patient's quality of life. Following a partial or total resection of the rectum, patients can experience low anterior resection syndrome, which is manifested by fecal incontinence, urgency, and diarrhea. In addition, rectal surgery results in sexual dysfunction in the majority of patients and can also lead to urinary dysfunction. Finally, radiotherapy results in infertility and menopause in women due to the location of the ovaries and uterus within the radiation field and has also been associated with a threefold increased risk of developing gynecologic cancers. These serious complications are among the reasons why there has been a growing movement towards non-operative management in patients who achieve a clinical complete response after neoadjuvant therapy. In fact, NCCN guidelines state that a non-operative approach may be undertaken in centers with multidisciplinary teams that can objectively determine a CCR. So not only do we have stringent criteria to determine a clinical complete response, but the protocol for non-operative management is also rigorous and includes careful monitoring throughout a five-year surveillance period. This enables early detection of any tumor regrowth, allowing for timely treatment. Despite these advances that have improved the rates of complete responses, the majority of patients are not candidates for non-operative management and are therefore unable to avoid surgery and its associated functional compromise. And this is within a population of all locally advanced rectal cancer patients. Data have shown that the tumors that are DMMR MSI high are less sensitive to chemotherapy. These outcomes emphasize the high unmet need for patients with this rare form of rectal cancer. They are treated with a standard of care that may be curative, but also carries significant morbidities and long-term sequelae. As such, our research at Memorial Sloan Kettering is not only focusing on identifying a more efficacious treatment for this biomarker-selected population, but also one that offers reduced morbidities and the potential for organ preservation with non-operative management. Let me now introduce my colleague, Dr. Josh Smith, who will walk you through the scientific rationale underpinning the selection of a sustained clinical complete response as a primary endpoint. Thank you, Dr. Sursik. I'm Josh Smith, surgical oncologist and associate attending surgeon from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Let's start with how a clinical complete response is correlated with disease-free survival at three years in a new adjuvant chemoradiation setting. These data from the landmark Organ Preservation Rectal Adenocarcinoma Trial, or OPRA, were presented at ASCO 2021. OPRA was the first prospective trial investigating non-operative management in locally advanced rectal cancer patients who achieved CCR after total neoadjuvant therapy. As seen in yellow, patients who attained a clinical complete response, which excludes near complete response, were more likely to be alive at three years without disease, keep their organ, and avoid surgery for three consecutive years compared to patients with a near or incomplete response. Here's a map showing the multiple institutions across North America that were all contributors in the OPRA trial. These sites were geographically diverse and included both academic and non-academic centers. When I reflect on OPRA, I see two key ingredients to its success. First, we were able to create consensus criteria that standardized the evaluation and determination for CCR using input from global experts, and second, we are able to then implement these criteria prospectively to allow for non-operative management in patients who achieve a clinical complete response. These are critically important considerations since the potential for intersite variability was one of the questions FDA has raised. Now, 
let's consider patient outcomes based on achieving a CCR12. Here I'm presenting published data showing that achieving a sustained CCR for 12 months is predictive of long-term clinical outcomes. When looking at disease tree survival on the top plot and overall survival on the bottom, 92% of patients who achieved a CCR12 and were managed by a watch and wait and had five-year disease tree survival and 100% achieved five-year overall survival. As you can see, the results for patients achieving a CCR12 are higher compared to those who achieved a pathologic complete response after new adjuvant chemoradiation compared with radical surgery for both five-year disease-free and overall survival. Now, focusing on anti-PD-1 efficacy in DMMR MSI high colorectal tumors, here are published data from phase two and retrospective studies that consistently demonstrate high complete response rates when anti-PD-1s are used as neoadjuvant therapy. These DMMR MSI high tumors show consistent susceptibility to immunotherapies, providing confidence in the ability to attain high rates of complete response. It's also critical to mention the growing consensus in the patient and medical communities for adopting the non-operative management approach, and CCR is an endpoint in rectal cancer clinical trials. Data from the OPRA trial, as well as in the retrospective analyses I just reviewed, have resulted in patients expressing unwillingness to be randomized to radical surgery versus a non-operative management approach after achieving a CCR to neoadjuvant treatment. Data are also influencing the medical and research community, and here I'm showing three new large prospective studies in rectal cancer that have adopted non-operative management and CCR as an endpoint. The first is the National Cancer Institute sponsored Janus Rectal Cancer Trial. I am the primary investigator and we plan to enroll more than 300 participants with locally advanced rectal cancer. And I'll note that we are excluding patients with DMR tumors since we believe they are a different population and may not be sensitive to chemotherapy. The Japanese study that was just presented at the ASCO GI Symposium last month and importantly also excludes DMMR MSI high rectal cancer patients is important to note. Notably, the 700-patient German study has rapidly accrued more than 50% of the patients given the integrated non-operative management approach, CCR endpoint, and of course, patient interest. One final point is that in the event that a patient does experience a local regrowth of their primary tumor, data support our ability to successfully perform surgery and deliver favorable outcomes. In OPRA, disease-free survival rates were similar for patients who had TME at restaging versus those who had TME at regrowth. The operation we would perform in this situation is exactly the same we would have offered the patient after total neoadjuvant therapy completion, and data and experience support that their long-term clinical outcomes, including disease-free survival, would not be compromised. Our MSK experience and other series support these findings. I'll turn now the presentation back to Dr. Sursek to describe the design and interim results from our MSK study. Thanks, Dr. Smith. The hypothesis of our study at MSK is that we could use neoadjuvant distarlamab to either replace chemotherapy or replace chemotherapy and radiation or to replace all three components of the current standard of care, chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. And I'll start with the design. So this is an ongoing, open-label, single-arm, prospective phase two study of distarlamab in patients with treatment-naive, locally advanced DMMR MSI high rectal cancer. Our initial target enrollment was 30 patients. Eligible patients with stage two or three disease receive 500 milligrams of distarlamab every three weeks for six months. Patients have two assessments during distarlamab treatment, and after six months of treatment, they are evaluated for response with imaging and endoscopy. Patients who achieve a clinical complete response at that time have the opportunity to proceed to non-operative management with active surveillance. Sustaining their clinical complete response for 12 months means they have achieved a CCR12. Patients who do not achieve a clinical complete response after six months of distarlamab go on to receive standard of care chemoradiation followed by another assessment of tumor response. The patients who at that time achieve a clinical complete response have the opportunity to proceed with non-operative management. However, if there's residual disease at that time, then they receive standard of care surgery. 
Our study is using two crow primary endpoints. The first is ORR, defined as complete response, near complete response, or partial response. And the second is CCR12, defined as sustained clinical complete response for 12 months after completion of Dostarlamab which is evaluated at 18 months since the start of treatment and determined by a multidisciplinary team, or a pathologic complete response in the patients who require surgery. Patients attaining a clinical complete response would continue with non-operative management that includes intense monitoring to confirm continued CCR at each evaluation. To that end, we're performing assessments every four months for two years, and then every six months in years three through five which is more frequent than standard of care practice. The assessments include imaging, endoscopic exams, biopsies, as well as blood tests. And I'll note here that our non-operative management approach is similar to the surveillance used in the prospective OPRA trial. And here you can see the study demographics at the time of our most recent public presentation at ASCO in June of 2022, where we reported on the first 18 patients in the study. We are enrolling a population that is representative of locally advanced DMMR, MSI high, rectal cancer. And I'll note that the majority of tumors were large, bulky tumors, 78% of them were T3 and T4, 94% were node positive, which means that these patients would almost certainly have required all three components of standard of care treatment. And now moving on to the results. All patients, 100% of them, achieved a clinical complete response following six months of this Darlamab. No patient required chemoradiation, chemotherapy, or surgery. And thus far, in terms of risk for treatment, all adverse events were grade one or two, and the safety profile is in line with other checkpoint inhibitors. And on this slide, I'm presenting the baseline and then serial imaging for just one of our patients who achieved a CCR. This is a young woman who was 30 years old at the time when she presented after having several months of symptoms. At the very top left picture is her initial endoscopic exam. You can clearly see a large, nearly obstructing tumor. The tumor is visible on the MRI as depicted by the red arrow, and this was graded as a T3 node positive tumor. She had her first endoscopic evaluation at six weeks, and this is after just two doses of Dostarlamab. You can clearly see that the tumor has decreased significantly. This was assessed as a partial response. There's still some residual disease, but her symptoms had already improved. At three months, while the endoscopic exam appeared normal and indicated a CCR, the MRI showed a bit of residual tumor, so she was graded as a near CR. And at six months, after completion of all planned Dostarlamab therapy, she achieved a CCR by endoscopy and MRI and moved into the non-operative management phase of the study. She maintained her CCR for 12 months after therapy, achieving a CCR 12, which is indicated here as an 18-month follow-up assessment. She now has had 28 months of follow-up and remains disease-free. Importantly, she feels great and has no lingering effects from treatment. And now I'll go on to the full patient population and the long-term follow-up. And here we're showing the updated data from the initial 18 patients that were presented in June of 2022 at ASCO. So this was from eight months ago, now updated. Patients have completed six months of Dostarlamab treatment, and all patients consecutively have achieved and maintained a clinical complete response, as noted by the yellow dot and green bar. Thus, our complete response rate remains at 100%. The first 10 patients have achieved 18 months of follow-up uh, post-Dostarlamab and remain in clinical CR, achieving a CCR12. Four patients have reached 30 months of follow-up, achieving a CCR24. And further, no patient has experienced disease progression or a recurrence with a median follow-up of 18.3 months. Since the presentation in June, we've enrolled a total of 30 patients. To date, we continue to see enduring responses in all treated patients, and every patient who completed six months of Dostarlamab has achieved a clinical complete response. We anticipate presenting updated data, including long-term follow-up, in the second quarter of 2023. Our study at MSK is showing that DMMR MSI high locally advanced rectal cancer is highly sensitive to neoadjuvant monotherapy with the Starlamab. And while the short-term benefits appear significant, we need long-term data with additional patients to demonstrate the durability of results and to better understand our ability to successfully retreat in the event that the cancer reappears. This underscores the importance of the proposed GSK study, 
A positive study will confirm the unprecedented efficacy we have seen with Cistarlamab. It will allow us to eliminate tumors as demonstrated by a CCR. And it will also collect data to confirm that CCR12 predicts for long-term benefit. And with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Diaz Padilla. Thank you, Dr. Sersek. I will now discuss the design of study 219369, which has been designed to confirm the results of the MSK study in a larger global population and demonstrate reproducibility. Importantly, GSK study design reflects input for more than 30 global key opinion leaders who specialize in rectal cancer. Treatment night patients with DMMR, MSI high, locally advanced rectal cancer will receive dorsalimab 500 milligrams every three weeks for nine cycles. At that time, patients will undergo post-intervention assessment based on endoscopy, rectal MRI, and CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Patients meeting the criteria for complete clinical response will begin non-operative management, along with rigorous monitoring and assessments that will be more extensive than surveillance for patients who undergo surgery. Evaluations include MRIs, CT scans, and endoscopies every four months for the first two years, and then twice a year through year five. In the event of residual disease or recurrence, patients will be managed with local standard of care. To address the appropriateness of a single arm study, it is critical to keep in mind the imbalance in both the frequency and nature of toxicities between dorsalimab and a standard of care. With the known treatment associated morbidities of radiation and surgery, we would anticipate high rates of dropout in a control arm. Second, the efficacy of dorsalimab in this DMMR population is well known, with a 100% clinical complete response rate from the Torsersex study. As such, Patients and physicians may be reluctant to participate in a study where patients could be randomized to standard of care. And lastly, I will also note that we are only enrolling patients with DMMR MSI high rectal cancer, a rare tumor with a limited number of histologically confirmed patients. We plan to recruit patients who are representative of the global patient population. Our enrollment criteria will mirror those of the MSK study. We anticipate broad global participation of more than 45 sites with multidisciplinary teams that will adapt a regression schema for evaluating tumors, similar to the OPRA trial. Centers will be in the US, Europe, and the rest of the world. Here are the study's pre-specified primary and select secondary endpoints. The primary endpoint of CCR12 is defined by the proportion of patients who maintain their clinical complete response for 12 months after six months of dostalima. This is assessed at the 18th month time point of the study. Secondary endpoints include event-free survival at three years and also CCR36, which is assessed at the 42nd month time point in the study. Additionally, we will assess overall survival and assist specific survival at five years. To conclude, GSK study is designed to evaluate the curative potential of the Salimab monotherapy for this disease. If the MSK results are confirmed, this therapy could change the treatment paradigm with an approach that would both improve cure rates and avoid the debilitating morbidities of the current standard of care. Because of this ambitious effort, we have designed our phase two study with rigor, supported by data, and with thorough planning and preparation. We solicited an integrated feedback from global experts and collaborated with academic institutions like MSK, as well as with patient advocacy groups and regulators. We look forward to generating additional data in this larger patient population to establish the efficacy, safety, and tolerability of dostalimab as neoadjuvant treatment for patients with this rare form of rectal cancer. Now, 
Dr. Abdullah will discuss our commitment to accelerated approval in this indication. Thank you, Dr. Diaz Padilla. I'll begin by emphasizing our team's strong interest in collaborating with all stakeholders as we seek to potentially change the treatment paradigm in this indication. The GSK Phase II study, together with the results from the Memorial Sloan Kettering trial, are designed to support accelerated approval for patients with locally advanced DMMR MSI high rectal cancer. This is based on the primary endpoint of a sustained clinical complete response, CCR12, which is reasonably likely to predict for a survival benefit. At the time of our submission, we will have data from our GSK-sponsored study, plus longer-term outcomes from the Memorial Sloan Kettering trial, giving us information on the benefit risk in at least 130 patients. The goal is to provide a potentially curative therapy and survivorship that spares patients the devastating long-term effects of surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. The plan is to follow an accelerated approval with a complete data conversion package that includes a supportive phase three trial in another stage two and three DMMR MSI high population. The submission would also include longer follow-up from both the MSK study and GSK's pivotal trial, including available survival data. We are in discussions with FDA now regarding the separate large randomized trial in patients with DMMR MSI high perioperative colon cancer. Let me speak for a moment about the role of this study in supporting our phase two rectal cancer trial. First, rectal and colon cancer are, are highly similar diseases in terms of their symptoms and biology. Second, both studies will only enroll a biomarker selected population of patients whose tumors are DMMR MSI high. Third, tumor tissue from both colon and rectal cancer that are DMMR MSI high are known to be highly responsive to anti-PD-1 therapies with durable responses observed across multiple tumors. Lastly, since a randomized study is not possible in the rectal setting, undertaking one in locally advanced DMMR MSI high colon cancer is the closest setting where the benefit of distarlamab in DMMR rectal cancer can be assessed in a controlled trial. Here's a preliminary schematic for the proposed phase three colon cancer study. This randomized open label trial will investigate whether perioperative use of distarlamab could replace standard of care adjuvant therapy. Importantly, the epidemiology of colon cancer with a higher incidence than rectal cancer supports the randomized design. It also enables a formal comparison of distarlamab monotherapy against standard of care in a DMMR patient population with appropriate primary and secondary endpoints assessed. To conclude, our phase two study is designed with an objective, evidence-based approach to appropriately evaluate the benefit risk of distarlamab for patients with locally advanced DMMR MSI high rectal cancer. The study population has been selected based on the known high sensitivity of early stage rectal cancers to immunotherapy. The preliminary evidence from the MSK study supports this. The study design provides non-operative management for patients who achieve a clinical complete response. As Dr. Smith reviewed, this can be safely undertaken when combined with close monitoring. And the GSK study does this for five years. We have established CCR12 as the primary endpoint. An initial assessment of a clinical complete response itself is predictive of favorable long-term outcomes the additional requirement of remaining in CCR for 12 consecutive months surely meets the threshold of being reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. Finally, longer-term outcomes from the Phase two trials on our proposed Phase three study in colon cancer will support these results. Thank you. Let me now ask Dr. Vlahovic to conclude our presentation. Thank you. I am Gordana Vlahovic, and I am the Starlimab Development Lead for GSK. The FDA has posed several discussion topics. We have worked to address each in our presentation, and I have summarized them here. Importantly, 
study 219369 together with the MSK study will allow us to adequately assess the benefit risk of the Starlimab in at least 130 patients. Our application will include long-term safety, response, and survival data based on several clinical endpoints, including CCR12, CCR36, EFS3, and overall survival. Thank you. I can uh, take questions now or later. Thank you. If there is no further presentation from GlaxoSmithKline, we're going to move forward with uh, and proceed with our guest speaker presentation with Dr. Kimi Eng. Dr. Eng. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much to the FDA for inviting me to give an objective overview of the published literature in regards to strengths and limitations about the current management of stage 2 to 3 rectal cancer. This is the outline of my talk because not everybody in the room is a GI oncologist. I will give some basic background on rectal cancer, review the data underlying current treatment paradigms, and then talk about some of the existing data supporting a non-operative management approach, and then end with future research directions. So colorectal cancer is a huge problem in the United States as well as globally. Currently, it is the third leading cause of cancer in both men and women and approximately 30% of colorectal cancers are rectal cancer. For a total of about 46,000 new cases anticipated to occur in 2023. Of this population, MSI high accounts for a very small proportion of all of these rectal cancers. According to the available literature, approximately 2 to 3% of all rectal cancers are MSI high, and it is thought that almost all are due to Lynch syndrome. I want to point out that young onset rectal cancer has been increasing across uh, the last few decades, and MSI high does seem to be enriched in these young patients. Colorectal cancer is also a leading cause of cancer-related death in the United States, and if you combine most men and women together, it is actually the second leading cause of cancer-related death, trailing only lung cancer. Currently, the staging and workup of colorectal cancer is according to the AJCC TNM staging classification, where different from other tumors, the T stage of the primary tumor is determined not by tumor size, but rather by depth of invasion through the wall of the colon or rectum. The N status is determined by the number of regional lymph nodes involved and M status by the presence or absence of distant metastases. Because of the complicated staging of rectal cancer, an MRI of the pelvis is critical for accurately staging patients to determine treatment options. An MRI is the best modality, modality to determine both the T and N stage, as well as assess the circumferential resection margin status, which is the predictor of local recurrence. Endorectal ultrasound can also be done if an MRI is contraindicated. CT scans of the chest and abdomen are required to determine the M stage, a CEA tumor marker level from the blood is also required for prognostication, and every patient diagnosed with colorectal cancer should undergo mismatch repair testing in order to determine the appropriate treatment option. Very critically, especially for stage 2 to 3 rectal cancer, a multidisciplinary team evaluation is absolutely important given the complexity of the different treatment paradigms in this disease. Key members of the team include medical oncology, radiation oncology, colorectal surgery, radiology, and many others that I did not have room to list here. This talk will focus again on the management of stage 2 and 3 rectal cancer, which is defined by a T-stage of T3 or 4, or by node positive status. In terms of the current treatment paradigms, this is the latest NCC and guidelines for the treatment of stage 2 and 3 rectal cancer. You can see that two different treatment approaches are endorsed, with the preferred strategy being a total neoadjuvant therapy or TNT approach, where all treatment, including chemotherapy and radiation, is given upfront prior to surgery. And two different sequencing algorithms are recommended here. The historical standard of care for many years had previously been long course chemoradiation or short course radiation, followed by surgery, followed by postoperative adjuvant chemotherapy. 
I'll now briefly go into some of the data supporting these approaches, starting with the historical standard of care, uh, which was established by the German Rectal Cancer Study Group trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2004. This study compared a preoperative chemoradiotherapy approach to the previous standard of a postoperative chemoradiotherapy approach. In terms of the primary endpoint of five-year overall survival, you can see there was no significant difference in the two treatment approaches, with a five-year OS of, a, of, six, of 76%. Disease-free survival at five years was also not different at about 68%. But interestingly, five-year local recurrence was significantly lower with the preoperative chemoradiotherapy approach compared to post-op chemoradiation. And this led to this paradigm being adopted as the standard of care. Five-year distant recurrence rates were not different between the two groups either at 36%. Ten-year follow-up of this trial was published in the JCO in 2012. And again, in terms of the endpoint of overall survival, no significant difference between the two treatment arms was seen, nor in disease-free survival. Ten-year distant recurrence rates estimated were at 30%, and it is notable that 8% of these distant recurrences did occur after five years. In terms of local recurrence, the benefit in favor of a preoperative chemoradiotherapy approach was maintained after longer follow-up with significantly lower rates at about 7% in favor of the preoperative approach. Also of note here, 12% of local recurrences did occur late after five years. So this is, a, this is a disease that is characterized by not infrequent occurrences of late relapse. The interest in total neoadjuvant therapy emerged for several uh, potential advantages, including improved tolerance and completion of the prescribed chemotherapy when given upfront prior to surgery. TNT does result in higher rates of downstaging, which may facilitate R0 resections. And there does seem to be higher rates of pathologic complete response with the TNT approach, which enables the potential for non-operative management. Patients treated with TNT have lesser time with a diverting ileostomy, which is quite significant for these patients. And theoretically, earlier administration of systemic chemotherapy may better address micrometastases and improve outcomes. For this reason, several randomized controlled trials, phase two and three, have been conducted comparing a TNT approach to the historical standard of care. I've selected some of the larger ones here, with uh, the Spanish uh, study being the only phase two study and the rest being phase three. You can see that the sample sizes are different across the different trials. The eligibility is also different across the different studies, with Rapido and the Polish study having high-risk populations. The TNT approach being investigated, investigated was also quite variable among the different studies with variations in the type of chemotherapy administered, with an intense regimen of fulfirinox tested in the PRODIGE trial, and then long-course chemoradiation versus short-course chemoradiation and different sequences of therapy. The administration of adjuvant chemotherapy was also either mandated or not mandated, and administration of this was variable across the studies as well. This heterogeneity may have led to the conflicting data on some of the oncologic outcomes. In terms of three-year disease-free survival, you can see that the majority of studies did not show a significant difference in favor of TNT in regards to three-year disease-free survival. The Rapido study and the PRODI study did show significantly better disease-free survival in favor of TNT. However, most studies did not show corresponding uh, benefit in three-year overall survival. The Polish study, which had a benefit initially at three years, did not have a benefit after eight years of follow-up. What does seem to be consistent is that pathologic complete response rates are higher with a TNT approach compared to standard of care. There does not seem to be any significant difference in three-year local regional relapse or three-year distant metastasis in most of the studies, although the PRODIGE, uh, sorry, the Rapido trial just seemed to show a benefit of lesser distant metastases uh, with that regimen, though this was a higher risk patient population in that study. So what can we conclude from all of these heterogeneous studies? The benefits of TNT do seem to be higher pathologic complete response rates, better compliance with the prescribed chemotherapy, and improved disease-free survival seen in some studies. There are some disadvantages, though, including that earlier stage patients may be overtreated with a TNT approach, where some of them may not actually need chemotherapy. There does not seem to be a difference in sphincter-sparing surgery rates or ileostomy rates, 
and there is no overall survival benefit. Therefore, there is insufficient data to conclude that a TNC approach is superior to standard of care. And this, this is consistent with the NCC and guidelines that continue to recommend both algorithms. Again, there's no significant difference in local regional failures and inconclusive data on three-year disease-free survival. We don't yet have long-term outcomes in regards to DFS or overall survival. And the trials are quite heterogeneous as discussed, making it difficult to make definitive conclusions. Importantly, there are no known biomarkers to date to better select who would benefit most from a TNT approach. So despite the fairly good outcomes for patients with multimodality therapy, unfortunately treatments for rectal cancer according to these paradigms is extremely toxic. And this has been reviewed already, but several components of the treatment algorithm result in significant rates of bowel dysfunction, urinary dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, infertility from pelvic radiation, and permanent ostomies, which then can result in body image issues and depression. And these can all negatively impact quality of life. Consequently, there is interest in de-escalating therapy while trying to maintain efficacy for patients with stage two and three rectal cancer. One option is to try to eliminate radiation from the treatment algorithm. The four-work trial published in JCO in 2019 compared the standard historical approach of long-course chemoradiation followed by surgery with adjuvant chemotherapy with two different types of chemotherapy regimens and compare that to a chemotherapy only approach where radiation could be administered but at the discretion of the treating investigator. In regards to the primary endpoint of three-year disease-free survival, there was no significant difference between the three arms, nor in the three-year local regional relapse rate or overall survival which is certainly intriguing in terms of whether or not radiation can be eliminated for selected patients. More data to inform this very important question will hopefully be forthcoming in the prospect trial for which we hope to have data later this year. This is a completed phase two, three trial of selective preoperative radiation for upper rectal tumors that are not T4 or N2. These patients were randomized to the historical standard of, standard of care compared to a chemotherapy-only approach, followed by selective radiation for those who have suboptimal response. All patients uh, then go to surgery, and postoperative treatment is at the discretion of the treating investigator. And then finally, another approach to de-escalation is to try to remove uh, surgery from the treatment algorithm. An interest in this came from initial retrospective studies from Dr. Habergama and resulted in this publication of long-term outcomes from a large international multi-center observational registry study called the International Watch and Wait Database. Of note, this was a heterogeneous study population due to being a registry study where there were many earlier stage patients included in this study. There was a non-uniform staging and response assessment methods, and variable treatment strategies were utilized, including sometimes only with radiation alone, and oftentimes not with both radiation and chemotherapy. However, the results are shown here and do seem promising for a non-operative management approach. 880 patients who were able to avoid TME and had a complete clinical response were included in the trial. And after a median follow-up time of about three years, the two-year tumor regrowth rate was 25%. Five-year disease-free survival, distant metastasis rate, and overall survival all seem very favorable in patients managed with the watch and wait approach. To characterize further the time course of the tumor regrowth, 64% were diagnosed within the first year, with the vast majority occurring by two years after completion of treatment. 18% of the people who also had tumor regrowth had distant metastases as well. The vast majority were able to receive TME as well as some receiving local excision, and most of these tumor regrowths were able to be successfully salvaged. In terms of distant metastases, only 11% occurred within the first year and only half within the first two years. Three quarters were diagnosed by three years after completion of treatment. Because of this initial promising data, multiple randomized trials are now going on testing non-operative management compared to standard of care. And uh, these trials are selected ones here for stage two or three rectal cancer. You can see that, again, the treatment schedules being tested are all quite variable with variations in whether it's long course chemoradiation or short course radiation being tested, as well as the sequencing of the various therapies. 
The response assessment time point is also variable, ranging from 12, 12 weeks after treatment start up to 38 weeks after treatment start. And the primary endpoints upon which these trials were designed were also different across the studies. This is a graphical representation of the variability in the endpoints and the time of response assessment. You can see the different treatment regimens being tested in these trials, the variability not only from time of treatment start to response assessment, but also from completion of radiation to response assessment, which we think may potentially impact outcomes as well. And the primary endpoints were also different as well as when they are being assessed. Of these trials, only the Oprah, style ha uh, the OPRA trial has been completed and published, and I will spend a little bit of time describing this important study. This was a phase two randomized multi-center trial that tested two different TNT approaches, induction chemotherapy followed by long course chemoradiation and a non-operative management approach for those who achieve complete clinical response versus a consolidation chemotherapy approach that started with long course chemoradiation, then chemotherapy, and then again, non-operative management if a complete clinical response was achieved. The primary endpoint was three-year disease-free survival compared to a historical control from the TNT studies just reviewed of 75%. These are the data out of 324 patients. Uh, the median follow-up time was three years, and three-year disease-free survival was 76%. Although this is technically a negative study because it wasn't superior to the historical control, it is reassuring that a non-operative management approach can result in similar disease-free survival to some of the prior TNT studies that included surgery. Local recurrence-free survival and distant metastasis-free survival were also quite favorable and, again, pretty consistent with prior TNT studies. Three year, uh, the time point of response assessment, as mentioned, was 34 to 38 weeks after treatment start. And clinical complete response rates were also high at about 75%. Tumor regrowth happened significantly more in the induction chemotherapy arm compared to the consolidation chemotherapy arm, but half the patients were able to achieve three-year organ preservation in the consolidation chemotherapy arm. This trial is important because it does provide the first benchmark data from a prospective randomized study on clinical complete response rates and organ preservation rates with a TNT approach. The other strength of the study is that it is the first to mandate uniform assessment of response at a specific time point and according to specific criteria for definition of a complete clinical response. This is outlined here and follows the uh, MSK regression schema used in other studies. The surveillance of patients undergoing non-operative management was also very rigorous and, and uniform across patients and involves frequent surveillance, especially within the first initial years after completing treatment. This is important due to the time course of tumor regrowth and recurrence rates seen in these patients managed by a watch and wait approach. The majority of tumor regrowth and local recurrences do occur within the first two to three years of completing TNT, as you can see from these curves. Local recurrence-free survival does seem to plateau out, again, at about the two to three-year mark. Distant metastasis-free survival seems to take a little bit longer to plateau out at about the three or four-year mark. Another important question is what happens to patients who uh, are managed by a complete, uh, for a complete clinical response by watch and wait, who then have a tumor regrowth compared to those who undergo immediate surgery after restaging with an incomplete uh, clinical response. You can see here from these curves that there is no statistically significant difference in disease-free survival between these two populations. Numerically, though, the disease-free survival does seem to be a little bit lower as time goes on for the watch and wait patients. In terms of the types of recurrences that happen after TME for immediate restaging or TME after a period of clinical complete response followed by regrowth, there again is no statistically significant difference in the types of recurrences seen in these two patient populations. Sample sizes are small though, and if you note the numbers here, the, they do seem to be numerically higher for local and distant recurrences among patients um, treated with a watch and wait approach. But again, sample sizes are extremely small. In terms of the type of surgery received in these two populations, slightly more patients who were treated with the watch and wait approach and then had tumor regrowth underwent APR with permanent colostomy compared to those who underwent surgery immediately after restaging.
The important questions of whether outcomes of watch and wait are equal to patients who do undergo immediate surgery with pathologic complete response, unfortunately, have very little data to uh, provide any answers. But from this meta-analysis of predominantly retrospective studies, it does seem encouraging that those managed with the watch and wait approach do not seem to have significant differences in non-regrowth recurrence rates or cancer-specific mortality. There did seem to be in this study uh, of improved disease-free survival for those undergoing surgery as, a pair, as opposed to managed with a watch and wait approach, though. Uh, but overall survival was not significantly different between these two populations. And ideally, what we would like to see with long-term data are that patients with a sustained clinical complete response having equivalent overall survival to those who undergo surgery with a pathologic complete response. The other relevant question is what happens to patients who do have clinical complete response but who undergo surgery anyway versus are managed by a non-operative management approach. And again, from this meta-analysis of mainly retrospective studies, there does not seem to be any significant differences in outcomes between these two patient populations. But certainly, prospective, more rigorous data are needed to more definitively answer this question. So that brings us to the Desarlamab trial, for which you have already heard a lot about. The primary endpoint for this study of MSI high, stage two to three rectal cancer patients, uh, was primary was overall response rate at six months per the MSK regression criteria or a PAPCR or clinical complete response at 12 months. And in the initial set of patients, there was a really promising 100% clinical complete response rate with a median follow-up of 6.8 months. As mentioned already, though, there are some limitations to this very promising data, including currently still a small sample size, short-term follow-up, this was a single institution study with extensive expertise in non-operative management, and there is no data on other clinically relevant endpoints or long-term data, which GSK is planning to address with their package. The importance of the endpoints cannot be overstated, and an international consensus group was uh, convened to try to standardize these endpoints and the definition of these endpoints across trials that are testing non-operative management. They recommend that for phase one and two trials of treatment intensification, that clinical complete response be used as the primary endpoint. For phase two and three trials, three-year organ preservation rate was recommended as the preferred endpoint. And they note that critically, secondary outcomes such as anal rectal function, toxicity, and quality of life absolutely need to be assessed in these trials. They also have some recommendations on the optimal response assessment time point because, again, that could influence uh, uh, complete response rates as well as ultimate outcomes. And also a strict schedule of surveillance for patients undergoing non-operative management approach is also provided in these consensus recommendations as well. So to summarize the data on non-operative management, I quoted this footnote that is now included in the NCCN guidelines for rectal cancer, because I think it does give a fair summary of where we are to date with the existing data. The NCCN now recommends that for patients who do achieve a complete clinical response with no evidence of residual disease as determined by digital rectal exam, MRI, and endoscopic evaluation, that a watch and wait approach can be considered in centers with multidisciplinary teams but we do not yet know what the risk of local and distance failure may be relative, relative to those patients undergoing standard treatment algorithms. Surveillance needs to be rigorous and frequent and include digital rectal exam, proctoscopy, and then imaging as well, especially in the initial first few years. So where do we go from here? The upcoming Janus Phase II rectal cancer study in the U.S., led by Dr. Joshua Smith, just recently activated and will pr provide further important data on uh, clinical complete response, as well as a non-operative management approach with TNT treatment. This trial will test a long course chemoradiation first, followed by two different chemotherapy regimens to see if an intensified chemotherapy of fulfirinox will improve response rates and lead to more non-operative management. The primary endpoint of this trial is complete clinical response. The other important data that we'll be able to get from the Janus study is, is data on whether or not this approach can be replicated across various cancer care settings. This is run through the intergroup and cooperative, group, uh, cooperative groups of the MCI, where a vast majority of the enrolling centers are in the community setting. 
So again, the feasibility of this approach will hopefully be able to be provided to us from this study. Other remaining questions include, what are the long-term disease-free and overall survival outcomes? Does non-operative management actually result in improved functional outcomes and quality of life, given that radiation is still included in these TNT approaches? Are there biomarkers, importantly, such as circulating tumor DNA or radiomics that can better predict who would benefit from a non-operative management approach? And what is the optimal surrogate endpoint for these trials? And as alluded to already, can this approach be replicated and feasible in a community setting? We do know from European data that centralized multidis multidisciplinary care and centers of excellence are associated with improved outcomes in patients with rectal cancer. Those who are treated by a colorectal trained high volume surgeon do better with decreased perioperative morbidity, decreased stoma rates, and improved disease free and overall survival. Back in 2011, a consortium called Ostrich was convened to quantify the quality and uniformity of rectal cancer care in the U.S. at the time. And very concerningly, they saw significant variation in the use of neoadjuvant treatment and noted that a vast majority of patients were not being treated in high volume centers. So there is now a national accreditation program for rectal cancer to hopefully try and more uniformly provide quality care to all patients with rectal cancer. In this one study that evaluated over 1,000 hospitals to see their readiness for meeting these national accreditation standards, which are quite rigorous, unfortunately, only about 3% of these hospitals actually met these thresholds for five of the selected criteria. They also very concerningly noted disparities in the types of centers that were ready for accreditation, being enriched in academic centers, high volume centers, as well as those that serve mainly highly resourced, high socioeconomic status populations. There are no outcome data yet, but hopefully that will be forthcoming soon, and currently only 75 programs are accredited. But there is significant concern about making sure that this accreditation program does not widen disparities in access to care, and that all patients with rectal cancer have equal access to high-quality care. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Ang. We will now proceed with the FDA presentation from Dr. Sandra Kazak. Dr. Kazak. My name is Sandra Kazak. I'm a pediatric oncologist and the acting team leader for the gastrointestinal malignancy team in the Division of Oncology 3. <clears throat> These are the FDA staff involved in the preparation for this meeting. During my presentation, I will discuss the following. Background on locally advanced rectal cancer and treatment options. Dostalimab's development in patients with DMMR, MSI high, locally advanced rectal cancer. And today's topics for discussion. I will now summarize some epidemiological facts about rectal cancer and discuss the current treatment options for locally advanced rectal cancer. Approximately 46,000 new cases of rectal cancer are expected to be diagnosed in 2023 in the U.S. Overall, up to 20% of patients with colorectal cancer have DMMR, MSI high, tumors. But these tend to be more frequent in early stages and in right-sided tumors. There are conflicting data on the incidence of DMMR, MSI high, rectal cancers. And in the literature for rectal cancers, the reported incidence of DMMR MSI high ranges from 2.7 to 21%. The standard of care for treating locally advanced rectal cancer, irrespective of DMMR MSI high status, consists of multimodality therapy that includes fluoropyrimidine based chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. The intent of treatment is curative. As you heard in Dr. Eng's presentation, there are several treatment strategies with different sequencing of each component of therapy, differences in length of treatment, intensity of chemotherapy and radiotherapy, etc. Overall, local recurrence rates range from 5 to 20 percent, and between 15 and 30 percent of patients develop distant metastasis. The disease-free survival at three years in modern trials using TNT ranges from 56 to 76 percent, 
depending on populations studied and clinical strategies employed, with survival at three years at approximately 90%. The prognostic and predictive role of the MMR MSI high in rectal cancer is not well characterized. The slide shows a retrospective analysis of patients with deficient and proficient mismatch repair rectal cancer treated at Memorial Sloan Kettering who were matched based on baseline tumor and demographic characteristics. Patients were treated with neoadjuvant folfox or fluoropidimidine based chemoradiation. As shown on the figure on the left, a higher rate of progression was observed in patients with deficient mismatch repair versus their mismatch repair proficient counterparts receiving initial treatment with Folfox. As shown on the right, no patient experienced disease progression before surgery, while or after undergoing chemoradiotherapy. The pathologic complete response for patients with deficient, DM, with deficient mismatch repair or their proficient controls were similar. However, as noted, this is a small retrospective study and results should be interpreted with caution. In another retrospective analysis of patients treated at MD Anderson Cancer Center, patients with DMMR, MSI high, stage 2-3 rectal cancer were treated with fluoropidimidine-based neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Of the 29 patients who underwent surgery, 28% had a pathological complete response. One patient had a clinical complete response and declined surgery. The authors concluded that fluoropidimidine as a radiosensitizing agent for DMMR rectal cancer seems to be associated with favorable pathologic response. Treatment with chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgery can adversely impact the quality of patient's survivorship. The rates of long-term treated related complications are difficult to estimate due to differences across studies on patient population and treatments used. Following radiotherapy and surgery, bowel dysfunction is common and up to 52% of patients have been reported to experience low anterior resection syndrome characterized by fecal and flatus incontinence, urgency, and frequency. In addition, up to 79% of patients have urinary and sexual dysfunction, and for primary treatment of the tumor or as a consequence of a complication, some patients require permanent ostomies. Infertility has also been reported as a treatment sequela. At some institutions, a non-operative approach may be offered to some patients following completion of neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiation therapy if a complete or sometimes near complete clinical response is observed. Patient selection for a non-operative approach is not standardized and different tumor characteristics have been used to determine eligibility for this approach, including tumor size, presence and absence of lymph nodes, relationship with other anatomic structures, etc. There is also marked heterogeneity across studies, not only due to differences in study populations, but differences in outcomes studied, the chemoradiation and chemotherapy regimens used, schedulous assessments, imaging protocols, follow-up protocols, etc., which limit the interpretation of data from this trial. The evidence supporting the non-operative management derives mostly from non-randomized retrospective studies. As such, there is limited evidence from randomized control studies that characterize the relationship between clinical complete response and long-term outcomes. Available data from small series using variable chemotherapy and radiotherapy regimens demonstrate a clinical complete response rates ranging from 10 to 78 percent. Of note, in studies exploring non-operative management, patients receive local therapy with radiation. The observational registry study of the International Watch and Wait database included 880 patients with locally advanced rectal cancer who underwent non-operative management after an observed clinical complete response. The incidence of local regrowth was 25%, with 88% of local relapses occurring by year two following initiation of non-operative management. 
In this retrospective series, the five-year-old survival rate was 85%. In another retrospective series of 113 patients treated at Memorial Sloan Kettering with clinical complete response following chemoradiation and chemotherapy, and who were managed following a non-operative management approach, the local relapse rate was 19.5%. 81% were able to forego resection of the rectum, and 18% required total mesorectal excision, or TME, for management of relapse. The five-year overall survival in this cohort was 73%. As mentioned before, Data from the non-operative management studies are difficult to interpret because, among other factors, there is heterogeneity in patient population included in studies and heterogeneity in results based on treatment strategy. The randomized OPRA study is an example. The figure on this slide shows the study design, which compared two different sequencing of treatment strategies, induction chemotherapy followed by, chemoradiother by chemoradiotherapy versus consolidation chemotherapy after chemoradiotherapy. After restaging, patients that had a clinical complete response or near complete response were offered non-operative management. As you can see on the table, of the 225 patients in both arms who went into non-operative management, 40% in the induction group and 27 in the consolidation group developed tumor regrowth during follow-up compared with 6% of patients who underwent surgery after chemo and radiotherapy. Please note that the population for which non-operative management was offered includes patients with clinical complete response and patients with near complete response, which highlights some of the heterogeneity described before. Also, as Dr. Eng showed, disease-free survival at three years was 76% in both arms but there is a difference between the rate of local regrowth observed in each treatment strategy, favoring early use of chemoradiation. This highlights the differences in outcomes related to treatment modalities described before. Data for outcomes in patients with DMMR, MSI high, locally advanced rectal cancer, who were managed with no local therapy, is mostly limited to the Memorial Sloan Kettering Study 19.288, which has been previously presented today. As presented at ASCO, 14 of the 18 patients involved were evaluated for disease response after completion of the Stalimab treatment. All have clinical complete response, and in all patients, the response was ongoing. 14 of these patients had a sustained response for 12 months or more. And as reported, as reported at the ASCO GI Symposium last month, more than 30 patients have already been enrolled. To summarize, standard of care for locally advanced rectal cancer combines chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery with curative intent. Outcomes are variable depending on the studied population, treatment strategy used, and endpoint definition. Although precise estimates are not available, Treatment, with locally advanced, treatment for locally advanced rectal cancer with standard of care is associated with significant morbidity. Data evaluating the DMMR subset are limited, but suggest similar responses to, in patients with proficient, to, sorry, to patients with proficient mismatch repair when exposed to radiotherapy. Based on mostly retrospective data, non-operative management of patients with locally advanced rectal cancer with a clinical complete response after neoadjuvant therapy is available in selected patients and institutions. However, there are no standard criteria to identify appropriate candidates for non-operative management treatment strategy, definition of clinical complete response, outcomes, frequency of monitoring, etc. The major risks of a non-operative strategy are the potential risk for tumor distance spread among patients with an apparent complete or near complete response who are initially observed, and the risk of excess rates of tumor regrowth that would require more aggressive surgery or that cannot be resected. In addition, there is lack of information on long-term outcomes from randomized trials. 
I will now summarize the proposed Sustalimax clinical development in patients with DMMR, MSI high, locally advanced rectal cancer. GSK plans to develop Dostalimab as a single agent for the treatment of patients with locally advanced, treatment-naive, mismatch repair deficient, or microcytolite instability high rectal cancer. This slide summarizes the proposed clinical development program to support a future supplemental VLA for this indication. The package intended for accelerated approval will include data from the upper and middle rows of the table. These are single-arm studies evaluating dostalimab as a single agent in a combined 130 patients with DMMR, MSI high, stage 2-3 rectal cancer, with clinical complete response at month 12 or CCR12 as the primary endpoint. Following an accelerated approval, GSK plans to submit the results of analysis of clinical complete response at month 36, or CCR 36, and event-free survival at three years as secondary endpoints to verify clinical benefits, along with other secondary endpoints, including total mesorectal excision-free survival, disease-specific survival, and overall survival. In addition, shown in the bottom row of the table, data from a randomized controlled trial in locally advanced DMMR MSI high colon cancer patients may be submitted as supportive evidence. As presented by GSK, study 21-9369 or study 2 is intended for registration of Ostalimab for the proposed indication. This is a global multicenter single arm study that will involve approximately 100 patients with previously untreated disease. This study has been previously described by GSK, so I will briefly go over it. But wanted to show that for patients who do not achieve a clinical complete response rate at the time of the first assessment, those patients with near complete response or incomplete response, if the patient and the investigator agree to a delay in implementing standard of care treatment, a second disease assessment, including rectal MRI, endoscopy, and CT scans will be performed at least four weeks and no longer than eight weeks after the prior assessment. If a clinical complete response is achieved then, the patient may proceed to non-operative management instead of standard of care. If the patient has any response less than a clinical complete response, or if they do not undergo the second assessment, four to eight weeks after the end of Ostalimab treatment, they will proceed to standard of care therapy. Non-operative management will consist of watchful waiting with regular assessment for, recu for recurrent disease as follows. In years one and two, patients will be assessed with endoscopy, rectal MRI, and CT every four months. In years three to five, these assessments will be conducted every six months. If at any time a patient develops evidence of recurrent disease during the non-operative management period, they will be evaluated for salvage therapy by the local care team and will transition to standard of care. The primary endpoint is clinical complete response at 12 months. CCR12 is defined as no evidence of residual disease by endoscopy rectal specific MRI and no evidence of metastatic disease 12 months after the first post-treatment clinical complete response assessment by independent central review. Key secondary endpoints are CCR36 as assessed by independent central review defined as maintenance of clinical complete Um, I will start over with the definition of CCR36. CCR36 is defined as maintenance of clinical complete response for 36 months and event-free survival at three years by investigator assessment, defined as remaining alive and free of disease progression, precluding surgery, local recurrence, and distant recurrence. Overall survival at five years will also be assessed. I will now introduce the topics for discussion. 
As you heard from Dr. Fajoy in Ajay's introductory remarks, there are several aspects Sorry. As you heard from Dr. Fajoin and Jay's introductory remarks, there are several aspects of the Dostalima program in rectal cancer that require further consideration and are centered on the adequacy of the proposed single-arm trials to evaluate the efficacy and safety of Dostalima, including the long-term benefits and risk of treatment, the proposed clinical endpoints, clinical complete response rates, and event-free survival to characterize and verify the benefits of Ostalima, including the proposed timing of analysis. The study population with DMMR, MSI high, stage 2-3 locally advanced rectal cancer for a non-operative management approach, and the potential impact of the variability in care and expertise across multidisciplinary staff and across study sites on study conduct and eventually on outcomes. The first topic of discussion is the adequacy of the proposed single arm trials to evaluate the efficacy and safety of tocotalimab, including the long-term benefits and risk of treatment. Approximately one-third of new cancer indications have been approved based on single arm trials evaluating response rate. However, FDA has generally required randomized controlled trials to support approvals in the curative setting where a comparative assessment to standard of care can be performed and endpoints of clinical benefits such as survival can be evaluated. Analysis of survival outcomes are uninterpretable in single arm trials. Additionally, single arm trials generally do not reliably characterize drug effects on symptoms or function. The available data that describes outcomes following non-operative management are derived mostly from retrospective series with highly, from highly specialized centers. These series evaluate different outcomes in heterogeneous populations who receive varied treatments posing challenges. As such, there are currently no benchmarks in patients with locally advanced rectal cancer for whom some type of local treatment with radiotherapy has been omitted or deferred. GSK states that conduct of a randomized trial in patients with DMMR, MSI high locally advanced rectal cancer is unfeasible, citing the rarity of the disease and the high rate of clinical complete response observed in the available preliminary data from the Memorial Sloan Kettering trial, which may be leading to lack of interest in a trial comparing dostalimab with standard of care treatment. It is not clear that DMMR, MSI high locally advanced rectal cancer is so rare as to preclude the conduct of a randomized study. Diseases with lower incidence have been successfully studied in the randomized setting. Although the preliminary clinical data in 18 patients are promising, cautious consideration of whether these data may preclude the conduct of a randomized study is warranted. Given these limitations, we would like the committee to discuss the use of single arm trials in the curative intent setting as a comparative assessment to standard of care cannot be performed and evaluation of time to event endpoints and other important information about outcomes to characterize clinical benefit may not be interpretable without a comparator arm. The second topic for discussion is the adequacy of the proposed clinical endpoints, clinical complete response rate, and event-free survival to characterize and verify the benefits of the Stanley map, including the proposed timing of analysis. GSK proposes clinical complete response at 12 months as assessed by independent central review as a primary endpoint for the proposed single arm trials intended to support a future marketing application for accelerated approval. In oncology, the efficacy endpoint most frequently used for accelerated approval in solid tumor malignancies is a durable response rate. The response rate is a reliable marker of drug activity since malignant tumors generally do not shrink without therapeutic intervention. However, the overall response rate bears an uncertain relationship to improvement in overall survival in diverse cancer types. 
GSK proposes to use clinical complete response and event-free survival at 36 months to verify the clinical benefit of dostalimab if accelerated approval is granted. As previously discussed, analysis of long-term survival outcomes, such as event-free survival and overall survival are uninterpretable in the absence of concurrent control. Additionally, evidence supporting the non-operative approach derives mostly from non-randomized retrospective studies. As you heard today, there is marked heterogeneity across studies which limit the interpretation of data from these trials. We would like the committee to discuss the limitations of historical data on clinical complete response rate as endpoint for locally advanced rectal cancer therapies, the magnitude and durability of clinical complete response reasonably likely to predict clinical benefits, and the interpretability of event-free survival as an endpoint of clinical benefit in a single arm trial. The third topic of discussion is related to the study population with locally advanced rectal cancer for a non-operative approach. Patients with stage 2-3 locally advanced rectal cancer are typically treated with standard of care sequencing chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. However, the presence of lymph nodes and or large tumors may signal a higher risk of recurrence. Additionally, it is unclear to what degree Patients with clinical disease features that may confer higher surgical risk or a higher risk of recurrence, for example, stage, presence of Lynch syndrome, have been included in or excluded from studies evaluating the non-operative management. The criteria to select patients for non-operative management have not been established. As such, discuss whether a pre-specified number of patients at higher risk of occurrence, for example, those with clinical T4 or node-positive disease, should be studied in the proposed trials to permit a benefit-risk assessment in the heterogeneous locally advanced rectal cancer population. The fourth topic for discussion is related to the potential impact of the variability in care and expertise across multidisciplinary study staff and across study sites on study conduct and ultimately on outcomes. Irrespective of the treatment strategy used, studies have shown that patients treated at high volume centers with surgical expertise and specialization in the treatment of locally advanced rectal cancer have better outcomes such as higher rates of sphincter preservation, decreased rates of post-operative morbidity and mortality, lower rates of local recurrence, and improved survival compared to those treated at lower volume centers. Non-operative management requires intensive follow-up to facilitate early recognition of local or systemic recurrences and to increase the chances of a successful salvage treatment. It is recommended that a multidisciplinary team be involved in the care of patients with locally advanced rectal cancer, particularly when implementing the non-operative management strategy as patients with locally advanced rectal cancer represent an heterogeneous group with respect to risk of recurrence. In study two, and if approved in the real world, patients will be followed across centers with viable experience with a non-operative management approach. The results of the preliminary evaluation of dostalimab in DMMR, MSI high, locally advanced rectal cancer indicate high clinical complete response rate. These results are based on a single institution trial conducted in a high volume center with the expertise to provide non-operative management as a treatment options to patients. Study two is a global multi-center study that will involve 100 patients 30 of whom will be enrolled in the U.S., including at Memorial Sloan Kettering. It is unclear the extent to which data will be generalizable to a broader population treated in centers with variable expertise in managing locally advanced rectal cancer using a non-operative management approach. 
discuss any specific recommendations for site selections to characterize the benefits and risk of treatment with dostanimab for this indication across diverse clinical centers. To conclude, GSK is developing dostalimab as a single agent for the treatment of patients with locally advanced, treatment-naive, mismatch repair deficient, or microcytelate instability high rectal cancer. However, there is uncertainty regarding the efficacy of the non-operative management in locally advanced rectal cancer, given the heterogeneity of data supporting this approach, the paucity of data for patients with DMMR, MSI high locally advanced rectal cancer, and in patients who have not received radiotherapy. In addition, there are also uncertainties on the adequacy of the proposed data package to permit a benefit-risk assessment for the proposed indication. We seek the, to gain the committee's input on the proposed data package for a future dostalimab application to support accelerated approval for this indication and to subsequently confirm clinical benefit. Considering these issues, FDA asked the committee to vote on the following. Will the data from the proposed single arm trials enrolling a total of 130 patients be sufficient to characterize the benefits and risk of the Stalimab in the curative intent setting for patients with DMMR, MSI high, locally advanced rectal cancer? Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kostak. We will now take clarifying questions for the presenters, GlaxoSmithKline, LLC, guest speaker, and FDA. Please use the raise hand icon to indicate that you have a question, and remember to clear the icon after you have asked your question. When acknowledged, please remember to state your name for the record before you speak, and direct your question to a specific presenter if you can. If you wish for a specific slide to be displayed, please let us know the slide number if possible. Finally, it would be helpful to acknowledge the end of your question with a thank you and end of your follow-up question with that is all for my questions so we can move on to the next panel member. So maybe I'll start with a comment and a question um, before the group uh, and the committee uh, starts uh, asking or commenting on presentations that we just heard. Uh, so it is clear to me that uh, I recognize how unlikely uh, would be for patients uh, with uh, MMR deficient and MSI uh, high uh, locally advanced rectal cancer to be randomized, their willingness to be randomized to a surgical arm if such a trial existed. I also recognize that uh, although Janus is a well-designed, well thought out trial, uh, it does exclude patients with uh, this uh, biology, if you will, with MMR and MSI high disease. So I'm not sure that, that uh, Janus will be applicable for the patients um, in question today. So a question for Dr. Eng and Dr. Smith from the surgical perspective and also from the medical uh, oncology perspective, as both of you are experts in the field. Uh, I recognize that GSK has expressed in their presentation uh, that there is an international consensus panel uh, that has been reluctant to do or move forward with a randomized study design just precisely because of uh, the potential for uh, 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 low accrual. But if the question for me is surgery and the ability for us to lead to a durable, complete response quote unquote cure that may delay or avoid perhaps the morbidity and potential detriment in quality of life with a surgical approach such as the TME and or the LAR, why would not, uh, and again I'm not a GI medical oncologist, but from the drug development perspective, why not to do a randomized trial where we look at the IO approach with uh, the Starly map against a chemo RT approach with an endpoint of complete clinical response, and only then decide who are the patients who actually may not be, uh, or may be ideal candidates for non-operative management. 
So Dr. Eng and Dr. Smith, if you can comment on that or perhaps answer that question. Sure, this is Kimmy Eng. I, I can start. You know, I, I do agree that a randomized clinical trial is not likely to be feasible in this population for many of the reasons that have already been presented. There is just such limited data on how these MSI high rectal cancer patients do with standard of care, although much of the data suggests they don't respond very well to chemotherapy, but may still respond quite well to chemoradiation. The problem is the toxicity of, of radiation, and I think with increasingly large numbers of young patients uh, being diagnosed with locally advanced rectal cancer, many of whom do want to preserve their fertility, for example, it will be very hard, in my opinion, to randomize to a chemoradiation uh, arm. Thank you, Dr. Ang. Dr. Smith? I'm, I'm here, yes. So I'll just speak to your uh, comment about the inability to randomize patients to a, a watch and wait arm. We know from the design of the Janus trial, in addition to the design for the OPRA trial, that speaking to patients, um, in addition to our own experience off protocol, that patients will not be randomized at the clinical complete res at the achievement of clinical complete response. They would not be willing to be randomized to watch and wait at that time. So I think there's a very important very important point that you bring up, and I completely agree with what uh, Dr. Ng just uh, stated. Um, and I think she's she's right on the point there, and right on what, and I agree with what she what she said. Thank you. Um, we have some questions from our uh, committee members. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Siumber. Thank you. Yes, I have a couple of clarifying questions for GSK about the 219-369 uh, study design. So specifically, a um, couple of detailed questions. Will you require um, central confirmation of MSI high status or deficient mismatch repair? And what do you anticipate in terms of the global reach of this study? You mentioned that there would be um, more than 45 sites, um, how, how do you anticipate that being distributed ac across the world? So this is Gordana Vlahovic, I'm the, the Stalin um, uh, development lead here, and I do have Dr. Alvarez, a repetologist, to answer your first question. Hi, my name is J.D. Alvarez. I am the head of precision medicine at GSK, and I am trained as a medical pathologist. So in this trial, we are allowing local testing for enrollment, but we are centrally confirming using a FDA-approved companion diagnostic, the Ventana uh, MMR IHC test. So we are quite confident that we can accurately detect these patients. So if, uh, uh, this is uh, Godano Vahovic back, if I can answer your second question, can you please uh, repeat, were you asking about global representation or sites within United, or, or, or sites per se throughout? Um, my question was kind of how we, do you anticipate the distribution of sites, either selected or participating mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, obviously you're hoping to have global representation, which is wonderful. Yes. Um, but any ideas of how many sites will be this will be opened, you know, in various regions of the world um, for this study? Yes, yes, we do. Um, we are for now feasibility is still ongoing, so we are still looking into uh, uh, some countries, uh, additional countries and sites. But for now, we have ten countries and forty three sites that we have identified already. And, um, and, and the, uh, the, our, our, I'm sorry, our um, global means United States. Um, we are going to Europe and we are going to Asia as well. Mm -hmm. And do you, I mean, do you anticipate that most of this will be ex-US or? Um, so um, uh, we, we are trying to, it is a smaller study and we are uh, aiming at uh, adequate representation in the total, totality of the number for US. Thank you. That answers my questions. Thank you. We move forward with our next uh, ODAC member, Dr. Madan.
Dr. Madana, maybe you're in mute. All right, in the interest of time, we'll move on then. Um, Dr. Nieva. Thank you, George Nieva, USC. Um, I have two questions. The, the first is for Dr. Sursak, and the, the second is for the GSK team. For, for Dr. Sursak, uh, how many people enrolled in the MSK study failed to complete six months of therapy? You know, what was the screen failure rate and what was the dropout rate? Maybe we'll stop there and then I'll, I'll ask the GSK team question. Sure, thank you. So to date, all patients have completed all six months of therapy. We have not had to stop therapy early. Um, the screen failure rate was three patients total out of the 30, um, as you could probably imagine initially, um, and, and the dropout rate, rather. Initially, the patients were unsure, so some patients proceeded with standard of care. However, now we are enrolling all patients that, that present um, because of their willingness and interest in enrolling. Uh, we have had three fails. Two were IHC positive, and then on repeat uh, were actually not mismetropair deficient. Um, and then one patient was mismetropair deficient, but uh, rather um, was mismetropair proficient, but rather than MSI. And so this patient should have been enrolled and, and then was not and was treated with standard of care um, of study. And then for, for the MSK team, I, I was wondering what the proposed failure looks like in the 219-369 study. Um, we have from OPRA 2 uh, a 75% uh, CCR rate, uh, CCR 12 rate. Um, would you propose non-inferiority uh, in the design to 75 percent. What, what in a single arm study looks like failure? And, and uh, why don't we start there? I'm going to invite um, uh, Dr. Chen, who is our statistician, to address your question. Thank you. Tai Chen of GSK Statistics. The study was designed um, to assume a CCR 12 rate. Uh, with a certain precision. Uh, currently, we have 130 patients, and with 130 patients, the maximum width of the confidence interval would be approximately 20%. So let's put this in perspective. If we have a CCR rate of 85%, the lower bound of the confidence interval will be approximately 75%. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And then in terms of the, you know, we, we heard from Dr. Sursek the, the challenges with interpretation of the biomarker. What are going to be the standards for biomarker interpretation for both eligibility as well as for um, being valuable for the primary endpoint? So we will enroll based on the uh, local testing when available, uh, and if not available, we're going to use a central testing. And central testing um, also will be provided, but at the end of the study, as a part of the bridging study, uh, to uh, as a as a confirmatory study. So we will enroll patients based on the local or central testing, and we will also analyze the patients. Uh, at, with all of them enrolled as, as uh, eligible for a study uh, with, within our denominator. And, and will that central review be something that is done by an outside vendor where GSK is blinded to that determination? Or is GSK going to be informed of that determination when deciding on eligibility? Uh, we, uh, so for if um, central, if local testing not available, the central testing will have to be provided for eligibility. Of, of, so yes, that information will be provided. After the study is done and completed, that particular information of the rest of the patients tested with local testing and having confirmatory central testing will be provided only after the study is done. Thank you. That concludes my question. Thank you. Move forward with Dr. Kunz. 
Great, thank you. This is Pam Coons. I have a question for Dr. Ng, and it's specifically on slide 31 regarding the consensus guidelines. Um, I have a question about the recommended endpoints um, and wondered if you could just review, it looks like from the slide that phase one, two trials have a uh, CCR as a recommended primary endpoint to enable evaluation of non-operative management, and then phase two, three, have organ preservation. I'm just wondering if you could comment how this relates to the proposed trial. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for your question. You know, I, I do think it's something that probably does need to be taken into consideration as you consider what the ideal endpoint is for a trial of, uh, that's being proposed. It does seem to be a phase two trial. It isn't intensifying therapy, though, um, in order to enable non-operative management. But again, it's a different biology that's being studied here and a different uh, type of therapy that is being studied. You know, I think the consensus group did recommend that for larger phase two, three trials where standard of care would be being changed, that three-year organ preservation rate is, uh, is the endpoint that is recommended. Great, thank you. Thank you. Move to uh, Dr. Kanaway. Yes, Mark Conaway. Uh, yes, I had uh, a couple of questions. One question is about yeah, the feasibility of the randomized trial. Um, and uh, the colorectal trial does have a randomization, both arms having surgery, though one is delayed. Can you expand a bit on why uh, randomization is feasible in that population and not in the rectal cancer population? Um, uh, sure. So we do not uh, we do not actually we randomize in the in the colon cancer uh, as as we believe uh, that uh, the surgery which is part of the both um, arms experimental and control is something uh, that we uh, still were not ready to uh, avoid in that population and the reasons why because the non-operative management has been long studied in the rectal cancer patients as the surgery itself is significantly more complex and associated with significant comorbidities which in the other hand colon cancer has uh, colon cancer uh, has a surgery that is less complex and certainly is associated with a less comorbidities uh, but going uh, j just just to kind of uh, uh, come back to what's really important here and why do we choose the, the colon cancer as the confirmatory study is we are talking about okay well I am so sorry I heard echo and I I thought you you asked me to stop so we are actually selecting um, very in uh, in very homogeneous population because both colon and rectal are DMMR MSI selected stages two and three. They are very similar when it comes to their biology. Uh, they have a historically already in metastatic setting established uh, very good responses and sustained responses to immunotherapy. And both the uh, the, the DMMR MSI high uh, colon and rectal have data supportive, not uh, suboptimal. Uh, and less susceptibility to chemotherapy. But furthermore, rectal is more rare, so there is a high incidence of colon cancer, so therefore randomization itself seems more plausible. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my next question uh, for anyone on the GSK team, uh, I heard the word representative um, sample for the future 100 participant trial. Um, how will you know or how will you design the trial to, to ensure that happens? Uh, it, it, are you, um, are you uh, applying to diversity of the population? Can you please clarify the question for me? Oh, just clarify the question that, that um, is there enough known about the population of uh, DMMR, uh, MSI high, uh, locally advanced rectal cancer patients to, to even know if this is a representative sample and to know if the information you're getting out of that study uh, is somehow representative of a larger population? 
So, so to begin with, uh, DMMR MSI high population is, is, is rather small. If you look at the numbers, databases, uh, even the numbers, the database we've used or FDA used, when it comes to the prevalence of DMMR MSI high, it is a lower, a lower percentage. So therefore, we are talking in the U.S. between two and 4,000 at the best case. So it, what's really important to mention is there is a data out there in metastatic setting in the MMR MSI high population that is strongly, strongly supportive of usage of the immunotherapy in that population where the responses were shown to be uh, significantly better than uh, what we uh, see with a standard of care. And very importantly, those responses are sustainable responses. Okay, Th thank you. That, that answers my question. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bastan, do you have a question? Hi, um, I had a question for Dr. Ng, um, and this is about slide 26 in your slide deck. I'm just um, still trying to make sense of using CCR as, as, as an endpoint and the role in locally advanced rectal cancer. Um, I guess just two questions. The first is just, you know, so this says that patients with sustained CCR should have an equivalent uh, over, overall survival. I, you know, we've seen this in the slide above, and I recognize that these are small numbers. We have a DFS. Um, uh, the DFS is preferring surgery, and I, I think in a lot of the other um, retrospective or single arm historical studies, it seems that the CCR rates are still associated with, with you know, with, with reasonably high DFS rates. So are there, do we have any evidence just overall that CCR really correlates with improved DFS in this disease? And then the second question was just in the um, IWWD cohort, were there patients in that cohort who had um, Lynch syndrome or MSI high? Uh, rectal cancer, and if we have any uh, uh, of those subset analyses. Hi, thank you for your question. So to address your first question, do we have enough data that CCR actually does correlate with increased survival, uh, long-term survival? Uh, we, we don't have robust prospective data. The data that has been cited largely stem from single institution retrospective studies uh, such as from Brazil, including some patients in the International Watch and Wait database that, in general, had the fairly favorable, um, you know, staging to begin with. The patients in that study also had uh, variable staging methods. M many were not staged with MRI, for example. The treatments were highly variable. Some only received radiation and not, you know, what we would consider the modern standard of care. Um, but in those studies, it did show that those who did have CCR did seem to have better outcomes. Um, but again, these are not data from prospective studies. In regards to your second question about how many patients in the International Watch and Wait database did have Lynch syndrome, I don't think that data is available, um, at least not in my recollection of reading uh, those papers. Thank you. Sia Gordana Vlahoik here from GSK. Um, please, um, would you allow me to, um, to, to invite Dr. Smith? He would like to add to that answer as well. Sure. So, Dr. You. Smith, you can move on. Sure. There, there are actually pros data from prospective trials. The German trial has long-term data suggesting and showing fairly definitively that there are past CR um, data demonstrating and supporting the data that I showed in my presentation in association with clinical complete response, I showed the high rates of disease-free survival. And in the German trial where patients all went to surgery and then had pathologic complete response, meaning no tumor in the resected specimen, high rates of uh, disease-free survival. So it's a correlation there, but I think there are, there are data to support that it, when you have a complete response, there's a strong association with um, disease-free survival. Well, I, I agree with pathologic complete response. I think the data suggests that that is true, but I, my question is really about the clinical complete response, which is really the endpoint in question here. Right, and the data that I showed, just to come back to the, uh, the prospective data from Oprah, and then, of course, the retrospective data that I also showed, but then Oprah is the, the strongest prospective data showing clinical complete response and a 
uh, strong correlation with disease-free survival, uh, shown here with clinical complete responders having an 84 percent uh, three-year disease-free survival uh, compared to the incomplete responders. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Madan, are you um, back to you ask your question? Yeah, I'm sorry for the technical issues. Um, I have a question for Dr. Eng first and then the sponsor. Um, for Dr. Eng, I, I think you said this, and I just want to clarify I understood this, but it seemed like the best data to evaluate the, the CR and its, its potential impact was at two to three years. Um, am I correct in interpreting your presentation, or, or you can correct me if I'm not? Thank you. Thank you. So in terms of the best time point to evaluate clinical complete response, I showed some data that suggests that tumor local regrowths can still occur at a significant rate up to two years after completion of TNT. So I, and rectal cancer does tend to be a cancer that does have later recurrences, so I do think longer-term follow-up is important. That being said, there are also data that about durability of response for MSI high tumors that has been shown in metastatic disease, so MSI high patients uh, may be a different population. Okay, thank you for clarifying. And then for uh, the sponsor, um, forgive me if you mentioned this, but what is the timeline you think it would take to accrue to this trial as you've planned it so far? Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Garcia, w um, or Dr. Maiden, would you please repeat the question? Yeah, what is the timeline to completing accrual to the trial you've proposed for in, the, uh, in, in your so, second uh, trial? Right, <laughs> so um, accrual time for our 100 patients proposed study is about 14 months. So 14 months, um, and uh, we we are planning uh, to obviously do the the follow up as proposed, as you've seen in the study design. Our uh, just as a reminder, CCR12 is uh, happens or assessment is at 18 months from the beginning of the study. We will also continue uh, with data collection and follow up on those patients, and we will have. Uh, data from uh, CCR, uh, to, we will have uh, at 36 months, at 42 months, and at the uh, five year at 60 months. We will continue with following patients and collecting all the data points. Um, thank you. Thanks. And then, and then one question, I guess, for the sponsor or the experts: What do we know about heterogeneity of the disease? You know, at, at this state, early stage, in patients who may have MSI high but also foci that are not MSI high and then therefore may not respond to this therapy? Kind of a general question for the sponsor and the experts. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and I will invite Dr. Sersek uh, to address this question. Thank you. I think heterogeneity has certainly been described. It's incredibly rare. We have not seen it uh, to date in our patient population, uh, but I think that will be an important uh, thing to keep in mind. Uh, going forward. However, in just generalizing in MSI uh, patients in general, immunotherapy is extremely effective. And what we've seen so far in, in the neoadjuvant studies, not just in the rectal study that we presented today, but in colon cancer as well, um, as we mentioned, uh, the responses, the pathologic complete responses to immunotherapy are really very significant. Thank you. I don't know if there was a second part to your question. Dr. Madana, no, did you question answer? Yes, thank you. That answers my question. Thank you, Dr. Sersek. Thank you, Dr. Madan. Maybe we'll uh, uh, go to the FDA uh, review division. Um, do you guys have a question or comment? Yes, good morning. This is Dr. Fasho and Ajay. Um, we uh, want to have a couple of, uh, uh, of our staff here uh, provide some additional uh, comments uh, to some of the questions that have been posed. I think, you know, as a start, um, I think it's really important that we make sure that we are all sort of have a clear um, baseline um, in, in sort of describing or characterizing the available data um, that would inform an assessment of the correlation between 
uh, clinical uh, complete response rate and long-term endpoints. And I think as you heard uh, from uh, all, uh, all of the presentations today, um, there's really a scarcity of data and the data that is available is quite heterogeneous. So I think it's, it's important that really um, this discussion be informed by really a, a clear understanding and, and sort of a collective agreement of actually what the data represent. Um, so I will first start by turning it over to some of our statistical colleagues to comment on some of the, the, the responses uh, with respect to uh, clinical complete response rate and, and relationship to long-term outcomes. Uh, hi. This is Salavia Mishrakoliani from FDA Statistics. Uh, you know, I, there was some discussion regarding the data available to characterize the association of complete response rate or clinical complete response rate and DFS or other long-term endpoints. Uh, so far, I, I think we just want to be very clear that the data that has been shown and the associations that have been found are from retrospective studies and mostly responder analyses, which are very hard to trust um, with regards to demonstrating anything other than potential correlation. Uh, we do need more data, preferably from randomized studies, um, and certainly uh, multiple studies would be very helpful in a meta-analysis to uh, really identify whether or not there's a true association between um, these endpoints or if what we're seeing is just uh, the improved outcomes due to uh, gradients of response. So, uh, you know, we, as Dr. Fascio and Ajay has just mentioned, there, there is very little data uh, available and from our perspective as regulators and as statisticians there's certainly not sufficient information available to uh, demonstrate or consider an association at this time between these endpoints. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pahavi. Um, I mean, Dr. Kalyani. <laughs> um, well, I will now turn it over to Dr. Uh, Stephen Lemery. Hi, thanks for uh, acknowledging me. This is Stephen Lemery, um, DO3. So I just wanted to make two two points. Um, one, uh, regarding, t you know, testing was brought up earlier, and, and we do feel that that's a, a very important point to bring up, the, the Sloan Kettering experience. My understanding, you know, patients uh, undergo testing with the MSK impact panel, which assesses patients for mutations of the DMR proteins, as well as microsatellite instability and tumor mutation burden. So, you, so I think those patients, you, you're, you're pretty certain that those patients who are treated in the tr trial have um, DMR microsatellite instability. I think, you know, that there, there may be a concern, you know, for, you know, patients who may get tested in local settings. Um, you know, if there's a false positive in this case, it's, it's going to be bad because the patients are going to be delaying um, definitive therapy that they would otherwise be receiving with chemo radiation. So, um, you know, testing we do find to be a, a, an important aspect of the care of these patients and um, a necessary component to, to ensure that these patients have accurate tests um, for this disease. And so, you know, the, the committee members may want to talk about that. The, the other issue it was um, asked to the company about was about the Represent, re representativeness of the of the patient population, and um, you know I think there are multiple layers to that, and you know we want the patients to be representative as far as the you know racial and ethnic profile of patients in the U.S. Um, you know, but beyond that, we want the patients to be representative of you know the, the patients with the the stages of tumors who who may you know benefit or not from, from receiving a treatment and, you know, especially in rectal cancer, a T4, patient with a T4 lesion is, is maybe very different in this setting than a patient with T3. And, I mean, it is good, it is good to note with, regarding nodal disease that most of the patients in the Sloan Kettering study had node positive disease, so that sort of gives you one level of comfort, but, you know, it would be helpful to know the number of patients who had N2, N3 disease, which may be much higher risk compared to patients who had N1 disease. So, um, you know, I, I think it'll be important, especially if the company seeking a broader sort of stage two, stage three indication to, to make sure there is a sufficient number of patients with high risk disease, especially if they have, uh, especially patients with T4 or N2 or N3 lesions to make sure that the 
the, the risk benefit profile is, is going to be um, uh, effective in, in those groups of patients. Thank you. For Debbie, do you have any additional comments? Thank you for now. Thank you. Okay, let's go back to our committee members. Uh, Dr. Chang, do you have a question for, for uh, please? Great, thanks so much. This is George Chang. Um, my question is directed at um, uh, probably Dr. Sersek, Dr. Smith, and I guess um, the GSK sort of investigator team. Uh, one of the critical components of a study like this um, and has been well described um, as the primary endpoint, um, um, when done well, has a very strong correlation with a pathologic um, clinical or complete response as well. So the question um, has to do with uh, you, how, what will be the plan for confirmation of the assessment of clinical complete, complete, complete response at each of the sites. You um, are currently planning on average approximately two patients per site. Um, so are there site qualifiers? Are, is there central review? Um, what other confirmatory process will there be so that you can assure that a, a, what is assessed locally as a clinical complete response indeed is um, or that further um, treatment may be necessary. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start uh, with answering this question from the GSK and I'm going to um, in, in invite later Dr. Smith and Dr. Sersek if they want to add anything else. But I um, would like to introduce Dr. O'Donnell, who is a medical director on our study, and he will provide you with those details. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Sean O'Donnell. I'm a senior medical director here at GSK. So. Um, in to address your question about how we plan to standardize the assessment of CCR throughout the study, we plan to approach this from a number of angles. First and foremost, the primary endpoint of the study, CCR12, will be evaluated by independent central review. We intend to centrally review both endoscopies um, with full video recordings of the entire endoscopy and a central review of MRIs. We also intend to use the MSK regression criteria, which has been successfully used in the prospective OPRA trial and has been published and uh, used in the community now for close to 10 years. We intend to train our sites and how best to interpret the assessments. We plan to provide trainings using experts from Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, both to our central reviewers as well as to providers in the community, both endoscopists and MRI. Uh, radiologists, I should say. Um, I'll also highlight that in terms of our long-term endpoints, uh, the CCR36 endpoint will also be centrally reviewed, and so we'll provide central confirmation there. So in total, we have carefully thought about the ways in which our endpoint can be standardized and used across a global population, and we think that that will uh, provide the robustness and certainty that FDA is seeking. This is Dr. Garcia. Just, just, just a question um, um, on your on your statement as to training sites. Could you could you explain as to how do you plan to train for endoscopic uh, uh, um, assessment? Are you? I mean, you're talking about that the MSK group uh, will be sort of the lead, leading that effort. Are you planning to uh, have uh, GI people? colorectal people going to uh, sites in the community to actually train um, sort of standard GI or surgical people to actually do scopes? Is that the extent of the uh, training? So the uh, assessment, the performance of the endoscopy itself is uh, is a standardized uh, flexible sigmoidoscopy. The training will be more in uh, toward interpretation of the findings. And so um, we will be providing uh, webinars and sessions um, to educate the uh, proceduralists who will be performing these endoscopies on what types of features they should be looking for to identify a clinical complete response. We also hope to leverage a large database of uh, existing data that uh, Dr. Smith has put together to help train providers in the OPRA and Janus trials to provide additional information to the sites. Um, and we may are looking into the feasibility of even in-person uh, opportunities uh, to get them in front of our experts to allow for question and answer. Thank you. 
Any additional comment? May I ask a follow-up question? So thanks very much. Um, that's very helpful information. I guess the one missing component is the digital rectal exam, and how do you plan to document, standardize and document that? Would you mind just to state your name for the record so we know who is asking the question? I, I apologize. This is George Chang, again, with a follow-up to my earlier question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chang. I, this is Dr. O'Donnell again. So um, obviously we can't centrally confirm physical exam findings, but we do plan to gather that data within our database and we'll um, use it as part of a sensitivity analysis for our primary endpoint. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Chan, with that, are you um, done with your questions? Yes, thank you. That completes my questions. Thank you. Maybe we'll go next to Dr. Park. Hello. Um, this is uh, John Park. Yes, um, I had a question uh, also for the sponsor on the CCR 12-month um, endpoint. Uh, I do share some of the concerns uh, that have already been brought up, but even if it was shown to be um, a good endpoint, I'm wondering if you can comment on you know, we're comparing uh, known treatments that can cure, you know, chemo radiation with a new, you know, single agent modality that we're not sure can cure. How do you kind of bridge that uncertainty with this endpoint? So, very importantly, I think here uh, to set the stage is that we understand. Uh, who is really our population, target population. Our target population are DMMR, MSI high patients who are known to be uh, exceptionally susceptible, regardless even of stage, uh, to immunotherapy. So here we have data with not just in from coming from uh, Sloan Kettering data that patients with rectal cancer have uh, on monotherapy exceptional 100% CCR, consecutive CCR. We also have data that it's growing and being shared publicly uh, as, 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 uh, as recent as ESMO in early stage colon cancer where IO alone has achieved a significant or 95% responses with actually 67% complete pathological response. So in the setting here where we are talking about uh, different population uh, where we know historically that chemotherapy might not be the most optimal therapy and where we believe that other standard of care therapy that provide the benefit but also are associated with significant comorbidities. We believe that uh, moving forward uh, with, uh, with, with the dostalimab, with a PD-1 inhibitor that has shown CCR thus far uh, we believe that this is a uh, this this is uh, the way to identify or to follow to further prove that those patients could indeed uh, benefit from the from from long term outcomes uh, and replace standard of care. I would like to invite Dr. Sersek here as well, just to reflect and share some of her observations. I'd like to just add that both in the MSK study as well as in the, in the proposed GSK study, the endpoint is a CCR12. However, patients are not withheld standard of care if they need it. So if a patient does not achieve a clinical complete response after six months of starlimab, they can undergo standard of care chemo radiation and or surgery as needed. And likewise, they are followed very closely once they achieve a CCR to reach that CCR12 and beyond. And so if the tumor regrows, they can undergo standard of care. Thank you. And uh, one more related question um, for the, maybe Dr. Abdullah, because he did touch on the phase three um, colon cancer trial. Um, I guess there seems to be a you know, little asymmetry because the colon cancer trial has surgery there, which, you know, we know can, help cure the cancer, which kind of relates to the other uh, question, um, kind of why not do the Starlimab only for that trial, and it was slide 44, if there's confidence in the rectal cancer setting, 
and just can you comment on that uh, kind of asymmetry? So, as as I think we we did address that uh, at least partially uh, in the prior answer, but this particular um, this particular study does have a surgery in both experimental and control arm, and surgery here um, is it was it, it is it is uh, something that is being less studied, and surgery by itself is significantly less complex, and, uh, and even though it's, it's curative intent and has a less comorbidity. So we did consult uh, with global experts, and the recommendation uh, to us or feedback to us was for this particular population where non-operative management was not studied and we don't have data versus in erectile cancer where we do, was to, to pre preserve the surgery as the part of the experimental arm. Now, the, what really is important here in this study and information and knowledge that we are going to gain is the neoadjuvant part of the study map where we are going to be getting information on the, on the pathological response. And at the end of the day, when we compare, when we use what information what we're going to use on the study to reference to the rectal cancer is the EFS. So magnitude of the benefit of the study map that we will capture from this study would be, in our belief, a good reference that could help actually reassure that benefit we are observing in rectal cancer is a true. Thank you. Thank you. No more questions. Thank you. Move on with Dr. Liu. Hey, this is Chris Liu. Uh, my question is for the FDA, and just trying to wrap my head around uh, the concept of accelerated approval in a curative disease setting. And the reason why I ask is I'm just trying to figure out where the level, where the bar is in terms of what the FDA would like to see. And uh, when we think about accelerated approval, I mean, we've seen these approvals in regards to overall response rate, and that's been in the metastatic setting. And obviously, the corollary here would be complete clinical response. But just want to get a sense for what the FDA is looking for in the accelerated approval setting, given that this is a curative setting and not the typical metastatic disease setting that we've seen previously. Does anybody from the FDA wants to address that question? Well, I will. This is Dr. Pastor. Obviously, it has to be higher, okay? Uh, it doesn't preclude the use of uh, accelerated approval because it's a serious and life-threatening disease. But if you're going to be uh, the, the uncertainty, uh, it's far more acceptable when you're dealing with patients in a single-arm trial where, who have, uh, have no other therapies available to them. And that's a common scenario that we're using accelerated approval in uh, is the uh, metastatic disease setting, usually in patients that have uh, have uh, have uh, gone through the available therapies that are are here. Uh, here again, this is the whole reason why we're bringing this to the committee. Uh, is what is this risk that uh, is tolerable here? Okay, uh, from a regulatory standpoint and also from a practice standpoint, because you are dealing with a curative therapy. So uh, there should be greater scrutiny here, and that's why we're bringing this application or this uh, this proposal to this committee. That's very helpful. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. Dr. Katsalakis, do you have a question? Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, just a, I guess a, a couple of, of questions and maybe then some comments later. But um, I guess there was some uh, discussion about also doing um, possible patients that were not MSI high based on uh, incorrect classification, and um, I guess three out of 30 patients is about a, a 7% um, rate, and I worry about that being amplified later on. Um, but in addition to that, I guess um, for the initial uh, presentation from the MSK uh, team, if I, unless I misread, uh, um, and I know this was sort of alluded to previously with an N1 versus N2 or 3 disease and how many lymph nodes are involved, Similarly, with T4 disease, I believe there are only two patients um, enrolled from the initial uh, cohort. Um, however, they were sort of lumped in with the T3s, and the T4s, you know, traditionally behave very differently, and that's one of the reasons that we 
you know, they invade into other organs. That's why we give radiation um, and local therapy um, in order to, uh, you know, have significant, you know, benefits um, on these patients. Uh, and we also know for tumor size, this is a really large uh, bulk of disease and uh, in the metastatic setting, um, there isn't as much of a response. And while tumor size has been traditionally uh, used for staging, um, I do wonder about the, uh, the actual T size for, for these patients. There were thought to be large tumors, but I didn't see any uh, specific data on that, if that could also be uh, shown in addition to the to the nodal status. I think that would be very useful. Um, that's my first question. Um, I'm going to invite Dr. Sersek to respond to this question. Right. So, in the initial in the initial uh, 18 patients, um, and Dr. Eng showed this slide as well. Uh, there were two patients that had T4 tumors invasive um, into uh, adjacent organs, into the vaginal canal, um, and both responded and had a clinical complete response. We don't grade the, in regards to the node status. Uh, we've, in a, as a field in general, moved towards node positive, but we did look at that, and about half, if not over half, of the patients had N2 disease. So it was, they were large, bulky tumors. Uh, uh, to you know, a significant extent, and, and it continues to be what we're seeing. But we are, but you will be including um, T4 patients just based on two uh, patients that had a complete response. I just wanted to just to clarify yeah. that because um, I just worry about delaying their care as well. If we know that chemo radiation as the standard modality um, generally they respond well for them, um, for those patients and the ones that may be misclassified about you know do have you know, concerns about delaying their care and micrometastatic um, disease and what that means um, for them long term. Um, and then my other question, I guess, is also uh, some of the PEMBRO trials um, use CTDNA. I just was wondering if you're going to be also um, using other, other um, blood markers um, in addition to that. Um, yes, yeah, so I can, I can answer in the, in the MSK study. So the, we, we are enrolling T4 patients. The patients are followed very closely on treatment to ensure that we're not missing progression. They have an endoscopic exam at six months and then at uh, three months, uh, sorry, rather at six weeks and then at three months, they have a full assessment with an endoscopy MRI as well as uh, imaging to uh, defend, uh, CT PET uh, to assess for metastatic disease. And then again at six months at the completion of therapy and then every four months thereafter um, in, in follow-up. And so PET CT will also be incorporated, not just CT, because in some of the slides yeah, so it seemed like it was CT. And then I just wanted to make sure because oftentimes we pick up, you know, micromedicine that the CTs do not. So I just wanted to, to just ask them that as well. Yes, yeah, so in the MSK study, we are doing PET CTs. This was a research question initially when the trial was designed, borrowing a bit from the uh, metastatic study, because normally in rectal cancer, the, the assessment is just with right. CTs, and we're actually finding that the um, CTs and the MRIs are, are adequate um, to assess response in rectal cancer, even in this patient population. Okay. And then finally, and, also, and just to um, follow up your other question, I apologize. The CT DNA, we are collecting CT DNA uh, at all time points that we've been assessing. We have not yet evaluated it, but that will add additional data, um, you know, as to the clearance of CT DNA and, and as, you, as you said, the potential risk of uh, micrometastatic disease and eradication. Yeah, I think the Ludlow, the Pembro trial, um, they used they uh, used it. I think for um, some of the uh, for uh, the earlier responders. I think that was a marker that they used. Um, but you can double check that. But that's what I, I believe I, I was reviewing. And then my last question, I guess, is if um, this does go through, um, how will you um, assess whether um, this versus other PD inhibitors like nivolumab or Pembro? Um, will have equivalent, uh, you know, CR rates um, as they're all being studied. Um, will they have? Will there be, you know, sort of uh, equipoise amongst them, or um, is this one supposed to be the, the the winner? And if it is, how will you then? I mean, how will you compare if um, the star lab is, is if if it goes through for exposure approval? If Pembro is just as as effective or or, or whatnot? Thank you. I think I'm done with my question. 
Hi, this is uh, Dr. O'Donnell again from GSK. Um, I wanted to take an opportunity to clarify um, the, the uh, answers to your questions that you asked as they'll pertain to our study. Um, we will be uh, performing the uh, same assessment schedule that Dr. Sersik was in terms of close follow-ups. We will also be performing endoscopy at six weeks and endoscopy, MRI, and CT at 12 weeks, and then again at the end of treatment. Um, we will also be assessing CTDNA at a variety of time points throughout the study to look both at response as well as uh, potentially recurrences later down the road. Um, in, in terms of your question about the, the role of distarlimab versus you know, other PD-1s, you know, we can only answer the questions that we have in front of us and we know that the data that we are following up on are with our drug and so that's the one that we can develop and speak to. Um, we think that we uh, if are optimistic that we will be able to recreate what Dr. Sersik has shown. There's a nice, um, there's a nice editorial um, by Vinay uh, Prasad that was uh, published recently just um, discussing clinical trial design and um, also uh, reviewing just other versus other um, PD-1 inhibitors and what a, a you know clinical trial design would would look like. But I thought it was, was very um, very um, nice. Um, I also did want to say as a radiation oncologist that radiation has evolved over time, and uh, that the toxicities are much uh, less than they they used to be. And some of the reports um, are, are a little outdated using. Um, some of the 1970s data I, I believe I was reviewing. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pastor, I see your hand is up. Do um, you have a question or a comment? Actually, Dr. Fasher and Ajay from the FDA. May I ask a question? Please, go ahead. So um, I just wanted to follow up on the issues around sort of uh, training and expertise at the local levels. And I wanted to ask Dr. Sersek and maybe Dr. Eng to comment on the sort of imaging protocols and whether or not, you know, one can uh, reasonably expect uh, them to be the same in sort of the highly specialized centers versus, you know, other centers. Um, and, um, and then sort of uh, ask uh, GSK to comment on uh, any training uh, they may be providing to ensure um, adequate uh, evaluation of the MRI imaging as part of uh, the assessment of the endpoint. Thank you. So, Dr. Eng, uh, do you want to answer first, or do you prefer the GSK goes first? I can answer quickly first. Um, you know, being from a large academic medical center, I have limited experience with what the imaging capabilities are of some community centers in other parts of the country and the ability of the radiologist. But I can say that at least with all the community centers affiliated with our institution, uh, they are all adequately trained to be able to do this. And Again, this is where I think the, the Janus trial will be really useful because that's conducted through the cooperative group sites, many of which are in the community, and we will be getting valuable information there about the quality of the reads and the assessments uh, from that study. Now to, um, to share his, uh, his perspective on the training, since he uh, has actually done the training uh, of the other investigators on OPERA. This is Dr. Smith. So we will use training similar to what we did for Oprah and what we're doing in Janus. And I'll echo what Dr. O'Donnell brought up earlier about the central view of the both the endoscopy and the MRI and bringing in experts both with use of online tools and uh, webinars to train uh, the centers, which we found can be very helpful in this in this regard to um, enforce the use of standardized consensus criteria, which is very helpful in uh, determining CCR uh, as we move forward in a prospective trial. Thank you. Dr. Koons, do you have your hand up? Do you have another question? I do. Thank you. This is Pam Koons. I have one more question for GSK. Um, we've talked considerably about um, patient preference um, in terms of the design and how a randomized design may be impractical due to that. I'm wondering if you could speak to the degree of patient input from patient advocates that you've had in the design of the study. Thank you. 
So um, we have we have collected um, uh, feedback from m multiple uh, experts throughout actually uh, the globe uh, regarding the preferences uh, of the of the participation in such a study and recommendation to their patient to go in to be enrolled in such a study in randomized fashion versus single arm. It was almost unanimous response based on the rarity of this disease, all the comorbidities coming from the treatments. And, uh, uh, and and all, all, all the all, all the um, data actually the, that has um, after publicly shared all the responses and awareness of the data, the uh, physicians um, uh, were not or or experts were not necessarily in support of the randomization, and for those reasons we uh, we felt it's uh, it's not feasible. I will also invite our medical director here, who actually did have communication. With a lot of those experts to share his experiences. Hi there. Um, so in addition to the external experts um, from around the world that uh, Dr. Vlahovic mentioned, we also presented um, this design of the study to uh, GSK's Patient Expert Council, which is a, a group that represents patients in the community. Um, I can also ask Dr. Sursik um, to come and speak with uh, regarding the interactions that she has with patients and the advocacy that her patients have done on behalf of this idea. Thank you. I can just add to that that, uh, as I described initially, when we opened the study in late 2019-2020, we did have a couple patients that chose to proceed with standard of care. Since the data became publicly available, we have been actively sought out, and I think our accrual attests to that, where we were at 18 in June, we're now over 30 patients. Um, and so patients are actively seeking us out, are, are hoping to be mismatch repair uh, deficient when they're diagnosed with rectal cancer. So I think uh, with the knowledge, of course, that they can receive this therapy and potentially not have radiation or surgery. So I, I believe that really um, a randomized trial would, would not be feasible. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Chan, do you have your raise, uh, your hand raised? Do you have another question? Yes, thank you. Thanks very much. I just have one more question. You know, one of the real appeals of this approach, um, of this class of, of drugs, um, particularly for this population, is the is the is the uh, tremendous demonstrated efficacy and low toxicity in general. Um, could this is a question for the GSK team? Um, could you just speak to um, to Starlimab and its um, and, um, any information you can provide about comparative sort of toxicity data compared to um, other currently established um, PD-1 inhibitors? Thank you. So, so the Stalimab overall, the Stalimab um, uh, benefit risk, um, particularly when it comes to the safety profile, is aligned with all other um, uh, therapies that are, that are being used or approved uh, PD-1 or pd one inhibitors. So um, the data that we have is coming from our phase two study. We are going to have um, soon to be shared data from, uh, from phase three study. But the most frequent, uh, the immune-related AEs, which is, uh, which is about 4%, were hypothyroidism, arthralgia, pruritus, and ILT increase, which is very much aligned what we have seen with other uh, PDXs uh, that are being used for different indications. So there's really nothing different or, um, or, or that they can pinpoint or differ, differentiate the Talibab when it comes to its pro uh, safety profile from other PDXs being currently approved for different cancer indications. Dr. Chan, are you satisfied with, your, uh, with the answer? Uh, yes, thanks very much. Thank you. Maybe we can move to Dr. Madan. Dr. Madan, do you have another question? Yeah, just a, a follow-up question for either the experts or the sponsor, just so I can have clarity. I understand the concerns about the randomization of, the, of patients 
and they wouldn't be willing to do it. But just can, can someone let me know if the patients chose not to be randomized to this trial, what would be their standard options outside of the trial? Thank you. Based on our study design, are you asking what would be option for the patients um, on, on they, they would they would be enrolled and then chose to go standard of care, or what is the standard of care? So, so my my question is, if a patient was provided with the opportunity to do this trial, if it was randomized, and one of the concerns that's being raised consistently is that they wouldn't submit to randomization. So I'm, I'm just trying to understand what would be their path to therapy outside of a trial like this. Yeah. Hi, this is Dr. O'Donnell again. So um, patients who opt not to participate in our trial would proceed with um, conventional standard of care. Um, as was highlighted in our presentations and in a, a lot of the other talks today, the standard of care approach for patients with uh, locally advanced rectal cancers involves some combination of chemotherapy, radiation, and often surgery. Um, so we would expect that patients who didn't participate in our study would proceed with uh, some uh, version of uh, local standard of care, uh, probably chemoradiation and then uh, potentially surgery. I'm all, um, I would like to just invite Dr. Sirsek here just to um, share her own perspective uh, while this study uh, at MSK was open, uh, what patients really were asking regarding the, all the toxicities, the comorbidities coming from standard of care, quality of life, um, and so on, which, which were uh, very important in, making, in helping them making a decision to actually participate in the study. The standard of care approach for locally advanced rectal cancer is total neoadjuvant therapy with chemotherapy, chemoradiation, and then surgery. Um, and that is what the patients would be offered and are offered uh, now off study. And of course, as we've heard, uh, this treatment occurs significant toxicity for the patients, particularly radiation, bowel bladder dysfunction, infertility. Uh, and sexual dysfunction, as well as surgery, uh, you know, with very similar toxicities and, and chemotherapy as well, although not necessarily as toxic, can result in, in permanent neuropathy in about 10% of our patients. So all three modalities have significant potential toxicity for the patients. Just, just to, I guess, a comment. I think that, you know, we're saying that patients wouldn't submit to randomization because they don't want to have surgery, but it sounds like if you were to do a randomized trial, they would either submit to randomization or submit to surgery anyway, unless I'm missing something. And, and that's the end of my question. Thank you. We would just like to highlight that, you know, while um, randomization to surgery is something that is being resisted throughout the community, we also have noted that resistance to radiation is quite high. Um, and one of the values of, uh, one of the challenges in running a, a randomized trial in this setting would be the a randomization to an arm that would contain radiation and the attendant uh, risks uh, associated with that. So it, it's not just about randomizing to or away from surgery, it's also randomizing to and away from radiation. And, and furthermore, if this is Gordana Vlahovic, if I may add, uh, the standard of care is combination of chemotherapy, radiation, and then surgery if necessary. But just by itself, chemotherapy and radiation was resisted on, and radiation because of the significant um, toxicities that are associated with it, and later comorbidities, uh, not to mention secondary malignancies uh, that, is, uh, that is a risk associated with, uh, with the radiation, but also the fact that we know that the MMR MSI high population is not as susceptible to chemotherapy. Just, just for information, uh, for reference, uh, we, there is a study done with, uh, by cooperative group in the uh, UK, Foxtrot, that actually demonstrated a response to chemotherapy in the MMR, MSI high colon cancer to be around 7% versus when we looked at MMRP, 22%. So in totality, standard of care, as much as it is um, when you look at, at uh, provide success for this early, uh, early local, local, uh, locally advanced rectal cancer, it is also associated with significant comorbidities and certainly with irreversible change of the lifestyle. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, Dr. Foster? Yeah, I have. Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, answer Dr. Madden's question. Uh, I think many people would use uh, off-label use. Not that I'm advocating off-label use, but the practical situation would be that many people would consider that either this drug or another PD-1 drug. Um, but I wanted to ask some questions of the sponsor. We saw a great deal of variation uh, in how common this disease is, ranging from 3 to 20 percent, which is a huge spread here. So what is your uh, current analysis of the landscape here as far as how common this disease is uh, as detected in the primary tumor, not metastatic disease, primary tumors we're talking about, patients that present with localized disease? How common is this? I, yes. I, Can you give me better numbers than 3 to 20 percent? Because 20 percent mm -hmm. could mean that you could do a randomized trial. 3 percent is kind of vague, so to speak, like, could it be done? I don't know. So I'm going to invite Dr. Sersek, actually, uh, Dr. Pazdur, if, if you don't mind, to, to respond to that question as she does see those patients and she is uh, an expert in the, in the field, so she can provide you with her own perspectives uh, regarding the, uh, the prevalence, actually, of DMMR and MSI high in, uh, mm -hmm. in rectal cancer. I think you're, you're absolutely correct, and I think it's actually probably on the lower end of that spectrum. What we've seen recently in the, in the community, it appears to be about 2.7%. Some of those may have also been metastatic, um, but we believe probably it's on the order of, you know, 3 to 5% and not some of the higher numbers that were quoted. But we really don't know. We don't know, but we're collecting data, okay, you yeah. know, as, as Okay, so as that, that brings us how much we know about how this, uh, this entity uh, behaves clinically. And I, I guess this is a question uh, for GSK is, uh, at the end of the day, I don't know if we're going to be able to do this randomized study uh, in colon cancer, and I'll, I'll come back to that point, but uh, others have brought this up. So at the end of the day, we might be just looking at complete response rate in a single arm trial and then having to compare it to an external control. How, how much do we know about MSI high primary rectal cancer and their clinical outcomes treated with conventional non-operative approaches of radiation therapy and chemotherapy? How many patients do we have here and what are the clinical outcomes? So I will invite Dr. Sersek to help me to answer this question. Because so this know is, at the end of the day, something that we might need to really have an understanding of. We're, uh, you know, going to be looking at what is the recurrence rate, what's the, what's the clinical outcome of patients treated in this single arm trial. So, so what do we compare are, it to? Yeah, data are somewhat limited and they're they're retrospective. Um, we looked at patients treated with total neoadjuvant therapy, and in our case, it was chemotherapy first followed by chemoradiation and surgery, and we thought that 29% of them, this was a cohort of 21 patients, but 29% of them actually progressed on induction chemotherapy, which was in sharp contrast to the mismatch repair proficient population where either everyone responded or had stable disease. In colon cancer from the Foxtrot study, where patients had resectable colon cancer, but they received neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which was our standard 5 fu oxaliplatin based chemotherapy, the response rate in the MSI population, which was about 100 patients, 105 patients, was 7%. So really very poor responses to chemotherapy. Okay. Um, and then so again, the number of patients, rectal yeah. cancer, but mm -hmm. going back to rectal cancer, uh, we do have data that the patients do respond to chemoradiation, um, and they can respond, therefore, to a total neoadjuvant package, including chemoradiation. So um, there is a, a study from MD Anderson published in 2016 where they looked at 62 patients that received neoadjuvant therapy, and the pathologic complete response rate was 27%. So they did respond, but they received radiation. So those are some of the variabilities here in treatment um, and, you know, potential associated. So what, uh, what were their outcomes after this complete and, clinical complete response rates? Do we know that? They, we do. The, the overall survival, I believe, a fiber survival was close to 90%, um, and there were two other smaller series published of about each of about 20 patients with mismatch repair uh, deficient cancers. And there, there was a bit of variability with the DFS of 50% and then an overall survival also on the higher end, I believe 80 or 90%.
So small data sets, somewhat variable, but... Uh, so the total you know, N on these data sets are what? The total number of patients we're basing? I would say in patients. rectal total, about 100, maybe a little over 100. Okay, okay. And I'd like to go back to GSK about the randomized study that you're uh, suggesting be done. And here again, you know, we've had a lot of discussions about uh, confirmatory trials having been done, have to be done in a timely fashion. And one of the reasons that we want trials to be done uh, before we uh, not be done, but to be adequately adequately accruing patients is can they be done? Uh, and do you actually think that with and I know this is been alluded to by several of the committee members that there is going to be equipoise here to actively enroll patients. Uh, you kind of minimize the aspect of surgery here, uh, and nobody wants a hemicolectomy, and if they could avoid a hemicolectomy, uh, they'll do anything in the world to do that, so to speak. Uh, so I'm, I'm just wondering, I, I don't want to agree necessarily to a trial that can't be done. And do you actually think that over time, when if this drug is approved in rectal cancer, that there will be equipoise, that people will say, okay, I'll go on to do surgery, okay, or will they just say, okay, I got a CR, I just want to take a wait and see approach to this? What is what has been your discussion on this? Because so, I, I really think people will try to avoid any type of invasive surgery. Obviously, a hemicolectomy people would want to avoid. So we have considered that. Uh, we we've actually really um, spent a considerate um, a considerate amount of time discussing uh, this this particular issue. We have um, uh, seeked and received advice uh, specifically regarding surgery or no surgery for colon DMMR MSI high patients. And interestingly, uh, all uh, different specialties, uh, feedback experts in the field were that at this point, because of the type of a surgery, even though we acknowledge still it is a surgery, would be harder to omit. And, uh, and it, it is... It is, it is something certainly that we would like to consider to investigate further uh, in a different setting, but for this particular uh, study, uh, the randomization was something that has been strongly recommended by experts in the field. And uh, again, again uh, patients uh, would, would uh, uh, we are hoping, we, are, we, we think, uh, and have a, a confidence that we are going to be able to enroll. We are maximizing, actually, the randomization towards the experimental arm. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully with that, patients will have higher chance to uh, receive IO versus, uh, versus the standard of care. Um, and Dr. Pazdor, if I may go back to your first question, I would like to add something else that we are currently doing, and uh, that's something that would probably bring some uh, information for regarding the control arm. So right now we are um, looking and doing the feasibility of the sites that we have identified where we can actually build an external control arm, particularly in the DMMR, MSI high stages two and three, uh, 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 stages two and three uh, rectal cancer patients. We have identified five sites thus far and uh, we are planning when we uh, complete our assessment to come back to the FDA for further uh, interaction and for your advice. But getting back to the randomized study, obviously this is what your investigators and key opinion leaders tell you now. However, their opinions as people get more and more experience uh, with treating patients and see that patients are getting complete response, uh, their opinions may change, and that's obvious. Right. Wouldn't you agree to that? Right. Y yes, I would. Yes, so I that would. Study, but this study may not be able to be done. Okay, and I well, think we just have to be clear. Well, but one thing that at, I would at this like point to we say. can't. The proof. I guess what I'm trying to say. The proof is in the pudding. As you, we'd like to see the accrual on a study like this. Okay, but, um, uh, and I we've made like that point very clear that we want uh, confirmatory studies enrolling uh, at the time of an accelerated approval. Okay, that that we've made multiple times, and it's actually been uh, in a recent legislation. 
Okay. Dr. Pasley, if you allow me, I would like I would like to invite Dr. Abdullah to actually comment. Maybe on, on um, your question. Just 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 in the interest of time, uh, perhaps if it's acceptable to uh, you, Dr. Pasley, and to GSK and uh, on the applicant, if we can just actually probably just take a break. I know. Okay, that would be fine. That's fine. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I think we're going to be able to uh, address and uh, have some clarifying questions after the OPH session. So uh, maybe we can uh, move on. You know, so uh, we're not behind. Um, we'll just simply uh, we'll now take a 30-minute break. Panel members, please remember that there should be no chatting or discussion of the meeting topic with anyone during the break. Uh, we'll resume at uh, 30 minutes. That would be around. Uh, uh, 2, uh, 49, 250, perhaps we can do it. Uh, so we're going to start on time. Dr. Thank Dr. you. Garcia. Yes. If, if it's okay, it's Dr. Abdullah from GSK. Just can I, can I just get 10 seconds only, and then we can go to the break? Uh, I would prefer, if you don't mind, uh, as my prerogative as a, as a chair, just to actually have any other additional comments in the next session, if you don't mind. No problem. No problem. Thank you. I appreciate okay. you. Thank you all. Okay. 250 for everybody. Thank you very much.
We will now begin the open public hearing session. Both the FDA and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To ensure such transparency at the open public hearing session of the advisory committee meeting, FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages you, the open public hearing speaker, at the beginning of your written or oral statement to advise the committee of any financial relationship that you may have with the sponsor, its product, and if known, its direct competitors. For example, this financial information may include the sponsor's payment for your travel, lodging, or other expenses in connection with your participation in the meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your statement to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your statement, it will not preclude you from speaking. The FDA and this committee place great importance in the open public hearing process. The insights and comments provided can help the agency and this committee in their consideration of the issues before them. That said, in many instances and for many topics, there will be a variety of opinions. One of our goals for today is for this open public hearing to be conducted in a fair and open way where every participant is listened to carefully and treated with dignity, courtesy, and respect. Therefore, please speak only when recognized by the chairperson. Thank you for your cooperation. Will speaker number one begin by stating your name and any organization you are representing for the record? Hi, this is Sasha Roth. Um, I have no financial disclosures. Should I continue? Please proceed. Okay. All right, so my current age is 42. I live in the Washington, D.C. area, and I now own my family's home furnishing business with my older sister that my parents started in 1991. When I was diagnosed in the fall of 2019, I was originally going to undergo standard of care treatment, which was chemotherapy, followed by radiation and surgery in the DC area. I was referred to Dr. Patey, a surgeon at MSK, through a mutual friend who had been treated a year or two prior, and it was serendipitous that this path brought me to MSK. I quickly learned through genetic testing at Sloan that I had Lynch syndrome, which put me in a situation where standard care treatment, while it being the only option at the time, would, have not, would not have been a treatment path that would have worked well for me. While sitting in doctor's pay office, I was told that standard chemotherapy does not respond well with Lynch patients, and surgery was not an option based on the location of my tumor, with it resulting in life-altering changes. I was then quickly introduced to Dr. Sersik and her team and came to find out I was a perfect match for their trial, which was awaiting FDA approval. I put all my faith in Dr. Sersik and her team and waited a few months until I got the call about two months later that the trial had been approved and my treatment could start. As the way the trial was originally written, I was to undergo six months of immunotherapy followed by radiation paired with a chemo pill and if needed, surgery would follow. As I started treatment, I was absolutely amazed that, that immunotherapy did not alter my everyday life. I could go to New York and back and still continue on with my life the way it always was. Working out, running a business, and not being compromised by, the, by all the toxic effects of standard chemotherapy that I had witnessed other family members experience during their cancer treatment. Seeing as I worked in D.C., I would travel to and from D.C. to New York every three, three weeks for infusions. At the end of the six months of immunotherapy, I made all of my arrangements to move to New York City for the greater part of the summer while I would undergo chemo radiation. On the Friday night before my move to New York City, I got a call from Dr. Sersik that there was no need for me to come. The scans, the scans that were done after my final immunotherapy treatment showed absolutely no sign of cancer. I was officially cancer-free, and Dr. Sersik and her team found no need to radiate my body without any sign of cancer. This was not only a relief because I was getting my summer back and I could stay in the comfort of my own home with friends and family close by, but this meant not undergoing radiation and, and surgery, which would have lifelong effects on my body. For women that chose not to get an ovarian transposition to move the ovaries out of the radiation field after patients could undergo, could, that, or, 
the radiation field patients could immediately go into menopause. The ability for women to even carry a baby after radiation would not be an option due to likely scarring of the uterus. There would also be damage to likely your bladder, sexual function, and the list continues. For me, the greatest gift was being told I was cancer-free, but knowing I would no longer need to radiate my body was a huge relief. Seeing as I was the first patient in the trial, nobody knew how this would play out for all the other patients behind me, but each and every patient had complete remission. While I continue to go back to MSK for scans regularly, I feel wonderful. Wonderful. I have no scarring or lifelong issues I need to deal with, but I just have my story to share in hopes that we can gain access for other patients out there just like me. Most stories do not end this way, and I owe measuring amounts of gratitude to the work of Dr. Sersik and her team. I want the greatest takeaway from my story to be not only that I was given the gift of this trial, but I was given the gift of, it, of achieving remission without the toxicity of chemo or the scarring effects of radiation and or surgery. Thank you to everybody for your time and for giving me the opportunity to share my story. My hope is we can hear many more stories like my own and people not only in the U.S. but all around the world can celebrate their remission as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Will speaker number two please begin by stating your name and any organization you are representing for the record? This is Kelly Bonito. I have no financial disclosures here from Memorial Sloan Kettering. I am 31 years old and live in Bradley Beach, New Jersey. My journey with cancer begins with my diagnosis. I was diagnosed with rectal cancer while living in New Jersey, which was soon after moving across country from the West Coast and eight months after having my son. After my diagnosis and doing some research regarding treatment, we decided that being treated at Memorial Sloan Kettering in Manhattan was my best option. Once at MSK, I was quickly, quickly diagnosed with stage three colorectal cancer at 28 years old. During my first visit with the colorectal surgeon, I was informed that I most likely would never be able to carry another baby because of the damage that would be caused from the radiation. Initially, the traditional full box treatment was recommended that included chemotherapy, radiation with chemotherapy, and surgery. There were three major events with this treatment that would alter my life forever. My uterus would be rendered useless, a cloth knee bag, and significant, and significant amount of pain to endure. Thankfully, we had time to work with fertility to harvest my eggs, fertilize, and freeze embryos in hope to expand our family in the future. My treatment date was looming, and I had appointments with a multitude of doctors at MSK. During one appointment, I was approached by a research nurse with the suggestion of an alternate treatment plan. They had evaluated my tumor type and determined that I was a match and candidate for a drug that was in clinical trial. Instead of chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, I elected to go forward with the alternative option of a clinical trial immunotherapy treatment. The possible side effects were described as far less painful. This sounded a lot better than the traditional treatment, but radiation and surgery were still on the table at that time. I am patient number four in the trial you are speaking about today. After my port surgically was inserted, I started treatment in March. By the second treatment three weeks later, I felt 10 times better. The tumor was shrinking, ulceration was closing, and my impacted valves were beginning to clear and re-regulate. By my fourth treatment, I was told that my tumor had reduced by 50%. And by my last treatment in August, my tumor had disappeared, and I was declared in remission. Thankfully, I did not have to go through radiation or surgery. It was a true miracle. I firmly believe and am extremely grateful for the opportunity to receive immunotherapy treatment. This clinical trial and research by the medical community gave me a second chance at life. The immunotherapy provided a medical intervention that did not cause side effects and pain that chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery would have caused in the process. I am so happy to report that I'm currently 16 weeks pregnant with a baby girl. That is a result of the fertility experts with an embryo transfer. Without this clinical trial treatment, I would have experienced life-altering events that would have not given me the quality of life I now have for my, myself and my family. Being diagnosed at 28, making treatment decisions, having an option, has taught me so many life lessons. I know that colorectal cancer is on the rise in young adults, and I hope this clinical trial will be available to many others in the near future. I'm eternally grateful for this life-changing opportunity. 
In addition, I appreciate the opportunity to provide my story to you, as I hope it helps you understand why an option like this is important to many other people like me, people who want to live the life they wish to live as a cancer survivor. For my husband and I, that's traveling as much as we can with our family, to show our toddler, our new baby, how beautiful Mother Nature is, to teach them about our country and the environment and about kindness along the way. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you. Will speaker number three please begin by stating your name and any organization you are representing for the record. Uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. I'm Dr. Diana Zuckerman, President of the National Center for Health Research. Our nonprofit research center scrutinizes the safety and effectiveness of medical products, and we don't accept funding from companies that make those products. So I have no conflicts of interest. My perspective is based on postdoctoral training in epidemiology and public health, my previous policy positions at congressional committees with oversight over FDA, my previous position at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and as a faculty member and researcher at Harvard and Yale. I'm also a founding board member of the Alliance for a Stronger FDA, which is a nonprofit coalition that urges Congress to provide sufficient appropriations so that FDA can do its very important job. On a personal note, a close family member recently died of rectal cancer, and I am well aware that this is a terrible disease and the standard treatment is toxic. A less toxic, equally effective treatment is urgently needed. I find the research promising, but there are too many unanswered questions that two small single-arm trials can't answer. Designing a randomized control trial now is our best chance to answer these important questions. These questions will be impossible to answer if the drug is approved for this indication a few years from now based on the proposed studies, because patients are much less willing to participate in a randomized control trial for a drug approved for the same indication. I have three points. Number one. The sponsor proposes two open-label single-arm trials. You've heard that it may not be feasible to do a randomized trial. I'm sure it would be difficult, but this specific disease is not so rare that it's impossible. It would be a mistake to give up on a well-designed study without even trying. There are patients who can only afford good treatment in the context of a clinical trial or who are afraid to deviate from a well-established standard of care when there are no long-term overall survival data for the experimental treatment. The people recruiting patients for the trial would need to clearly explain to patients why both arms of the randomized trial are good options, a proven treatment versus a promising but unproven treatment. The standard of care arm can be smaller than the experimental arm, but the study should be randomized. Number two, as previous speakers have specified, rectal cancer patients <coughs> excuse me, who are treated at the best high-volume medical centers have much better outcomes than other patients. Memorial Sloan Kettering, for example, is not an average cancer center. It's one of the best in the country. And this is another reason why a randomized trial of a representative sample is so important. My third point, patients deserve to be able to make treatment decisions based on meaningful clinical outcomes. That's why a solid study design is so important. Overall survival is the key outcome, and quality of life is as well. The new treatment doesn't need to be superior to standard of care, but it does need to be proven to be at least as good. And beyond the specifics of this FDA decision, let's think of the big picture. When FDA allows single-arm trials, it sets a dangerous precedent. Future sponsors will try to follow that precedent by also demanding single-arm trials. 
and FDA will be pressured into making randomized trials optional instead of required. And as we all know, without an appropriate control group, it's not possible to provide the type of evidence that patients and doctors need to make informed decisions. Even relatively small studies with a somewhat smaller randomized control group is better than a single arm trial. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Will speaker number four please begin by stating your name and any organization you are representing for the record. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Stephen Cohen and I am a GI medical oncologist at Jefferson Health Abington Hospital and the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center in Philadelphia. I've been an oncologist for 20 years and my practice is largely in the community setting and focused on patients with gastrointestinal cancer. I have served as an advisor for GSK in the past, but I am not being compensated for my time today. Uh, as has been eloquently stated, rectal cancer is a major health problem in the United States, and the treatment for locally advanced rectal cancer, which involves the full thickness of the rectum and or lymph nodes, has historically involved surgery. Over the years, chemotherapy and radiotherapy have been utilized to improve outcomes in addition to surgery. And while potentially curative, as we've heard quite eloquently, the treatments have a large number of acute and chronic side effects, including short-term diarrhea, fatigue, and infection risk, as well as long-term challenges with bowel function, pain, and sexual dysfunction. Thus, the concept of a watch and wait approach was developed with the recognition that some patients with complete clinical responses to chemotherapy and radiotherapy may not benefit or require surgery. The treatment of colorectal cancer in general has been approved through the use has been improved through the use of molecular biomarkers and targeted therapies and in metastatic colorectal cancer a small percent of patients have tumors which are mismatch repair deficient or MSI high and for these patients the initial use of immunotherapy improves outcome compared to chemotherapy and given the benefit of immunotherapy in metastatic colorectal cancer patients with deficient mismatch repair tumors, a natural next step was to evaluate it in the locally advanced setting for patients with deficient mismatch repair rectal cancer. And that was the foundation for the initial distarlamab experience in deficient mismatch repair stage 2-3 rectal cancer. And the results in that initial single arm experience were very provocative, albeit in a relatively small group of patients. Essentially, all patients had complete clinical responses and could potentially avoid surgery. There may even be some patients with deficient mismatch repair locally advanced rectal cancer who are cured, as we've heard, or can have long-term disease-free survival without surgery. That is what is so exciting to practicing oncologists and patients alike about the proposed GSK Phase II study design to further evaluate the Starlimab in a larger group of patients with MSI high deficient mismatch repair locally advanced rectal cancer across multiple sites. This study has the potential to confirm the benefit of this therapy in a larger group of patients and across a number of different types of practices. The data from the initial single arm trial were so provocative that patients are asking about this therapy outside of a clinical trial. Providers also feel this is a very promising therapy and may be more than tempted to treat with immunotherapy outside of a clinical trial and this is all the more likely with observations in multiple diseases that chemotherapy may be less effective in MSI high tumors. Thus, the proposed single arm phase two study is appropriate and reasonable and I think important to move forward. While a randomized design against the historical standard of chemoradiotherapy and or chemo would be another option, Given the excitement in the colorectal cancer patient and provider community regarding the already seen benefit from the pilot study, a randomized design would be very challenging. It's very likely that patients would enroll and if randomized to standard therapy drop out to pursue immunotherapy outside of a clinical trial, or providers would be tempted to treat with other immunotherapy outside of a study. Given the toxicities of chemotherapy and radiotherapy, it would be extremely challenging for patients and providers to accept a randomization between chemoradiotherapy and immunotherapy. 
The selection of community sites is an important aspect of the trial design to document the generalizability of this approach and findings across practice sites. The majority of cancer care in the U.S. is conducted at community oncology practices, and the testing for mismatch repair is quite standardized, and local results for mismatch repair testing have been acceptable in U.S. NCI trials evaluating immunotherapy and deficient mismatch repair colorectal cancer. Thus, as a practicing GI oncologist for 20 years and now with a large community practice, I strongly support the GSK Phase II design of this trial to evaluate the starlimab and locally advanced deficient mismatch repair MSI high rectal cancer. If this trial confirms the benefit of this agent in this patient population in terms of high complete and importantly durable clinical response rates, it will certainly change the paradigm for treatment of this challenging disease and potentially spare many patients the toxicities of chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and even surgery while offering the promise for long-term survival. Thank you very much for your attention and the opportunity to present. Thank you. The open public hearing portion of this meeting has now concluded, and we will no longer take comments from the audience. We will now take remaining clarifying questions for all the presenters thus far. Please use the raise hand icon to indicate that you have a question and remember to put your hand down after you have asked your question. Please also remember to state your name for the record before you speak and direct your question to a specific presenter if you can. If you wish for a specific slide to be displayed, please let us know the slide number if possible. As a gentle reminder, it would be helpful to acknowledge the end of your question with a thank you and the end of your follow-up question with that is all for my questions. So we can move on to the next panel member. Dr. Garcia, it's uh, Hishan Abdul from GSK. I was wondering if I can be recognized just to follow up on some questions from before the break, if that's okay? Absolutely, Dr. Abdul. Thank you. And uh, yes, uh, please address Dr. Pazer's questions or comments. Thank you. Um, Hisham Abdullah, Global Head of Oncology Development at GSK. And I just wanted to uh, maybe provide some important information uh, that's probably relevant for the, um, the committee and the panel members to consider. Um, and maybe just to get at um, a couple of questions that Dr. Pazder had raised. One specifically relates to um, the ability to be able to conduct uh, the, uh, the randomized uh, controlled study in colon cancer. Um, and, uh, and then the second really is, is, is very much interrelated um, in terms of being able to provide confirmatory evidence um, for an accelerated approval that, uh, that is potentially considered um, or uh, if granted based on the rectal cancer single arm, single arm data. So um, I'll start out first by highlighting, of course, um, GSK's continued commitment and respect um, of the accelerated approval regulations um, and, of course, um, the confirmation of benefit um, in, that, in that regard as well, too. So with that in mind, um, I would like to highlight, of course, that both the single-arm uh, rectal cancer study um, as well as the randomized colon cancer study would be done and conducted in parallel, not in sequence. That is an important clarification that I think we need to highlight and consider specifically. The rectal study, um, which is the GSK-sponsored phase two trial, um, would start recruitment in March of 2023, so in just about a month. Um, and the colon study, um, the randomized controlled phase three trial, would actually start recruitment in June of 2023. So as you can probably tell, both of them will be run in parallel and conducted um, through parallel parallel tracks. With that in mind, uh, we're anticipating, of course, data to emerge from the rectal study, uh, primary analysis for CCR12, um, in Q1 of 2026. Um, so that's about maybe 32 months or so uh, from when the first patient is, uh, is, is enrolled. Um, and by that time, uh, we anticipate um, that uh, the last patient in the colon study will have received um, their first dose. Um, and I would probably say that the majority of patients in the colon study, by the time that the rectal study reads out its primary endpoint, will have already gone through surgery. So I think that is another important clarification to make. Um, with that in mind as well, too, um, I think it's, it's probably something that we can think about, consider, probably have a discussion with the FDA around, um, that once the data from the single-arm rectal study uh, which will, of course, be pooled from across both the MSK and the GSK-sponsored trials. 
um, and are being considered for regulatory decision making, we can certainly look at the data from the colon study and its level of maturity um, to assess whether or not it would be appropriate in terms of timing to consider potentially um, interim data analyses or looks. But again, of course, that'll be you know certainly dependent on um, where we're at with um, treatment of patients, follow-up, um, and of course, the maturity of the results. And that is something that we're very happy to address with the FDA as well, too. So um, I think probably one of the things that I'd just like to conclude with is really uh, what's important for us to remember. Why are we here? Well, um, I would say that first and foremost, uh, we're here to really um, discuss uh, what is a potential path forward based on what are the uh, preliminary data uh, that are being generated from the MSK trial. They're certainly intriguing, yes, preliminary, but very striking given the magnitude of effect, which is important to highlight. Second, we're looking at a biomarker-defined population in rectal cancer that is an orphan population, as you've heard from some of the prevalence numbers quoted by Dr. Sersik. And then third, um, I would certainly highlight, of course, the continued unmet need given the current standard of care, which based on some of the data Dr. Smith presented earlier in the presentation, um, is looking at possibly from the OPRA study, what is a 35% clinical complete response rate in these rectal cancer patients. Um, and so we're looking for a large magnitude of effect here in the single arm rectal study. Um, and um, I'd like to maybe call on Dr. Smith to maybe just comment on uh, this benchmark of 35% for clinical complete response rate uh, from, uh, from the OPRA trial and his experience in that regard as well, too. <laughs> This is Dr. Smith. I'd like to just comment on some of the numbers that were shown earlier in the presentation. You remember in, in OPRA that uh, the patients who had a clinical complete response and near complete response were given the opportunity for organ preservation. And so the mature data um, were able to demonstrate what was called TME free survival in that, in that paper and in that presentation. In, our, um, in my presentation earlier, we were looking at patients who had a clinical complete response compared to near complete response. These are patients who, if you look in, our, in the OPRA data, this was about 38% of that group. This is clinical complete response. These are the patients who had um, the best disease tree survival um, at 84%. And so this is where we make a very conservative estimate of those patients who would have a clinical complete response uh, based on the data that we have um, from OPRA. Thank you. Dr. Pazur, uh, are the comments from the GSK team and Dr. Smith addressing uh, your comments and your questions? Actually, oh, is Dr. Pazur on? This is the FDA um, as well, but let's see if Dr. Pazur has a, a response. FDA, if you want to uh, make a comment or a question, sure. uh, please proceed <laughs> while, while we get Dr. Pazur. Yes, thank you, Dr. Garcia. This is Paul Klutz uh, from the FDA, and I just wanted to provide just one brief comment on context because this has been, you know, it's a very complicated space. So I want to summarize a little bit. The benefit of non-operative management is reduced morbidity of surgery, as we've heard, but the risk is progressing to inoperable or metastatic disease. We've heard that the field has accepted that uh, the risk benefit for a non-operative approach is acceptable in some cases for patients who, receive, who achieve a clinical CR and in a select set of treatment settings with multidisciplinary expertise. When we were talking about the endpoints, I want people to think a little bit about the difference here between the response rate we're talking about in this setting and the response rate we often talk about at ODAX because we do a lot of uh, metastatic settings. Clinical CR is very different than objective response rate in the metastatic setting. Here, clinical CR is has some meaning in and of itself. It's in this setting, the objective trigger to non-operative management uh, and the subsequent delay and avoidance of surgery and its complications. So I wanted to make sure that we looked at this endpoint differently than we do, for instance, objective response rate in the metastatic setting. But again, the risk is missing the opportunity for cure and progressing to inoperable or metastatic disease. And so these longer term endpoints EFS and OS are intended for us to gauge that risk of progression to inoperative or metastatic disease or inferior survival. 
And as has been mentioned, the challenge in interpreting these three and five year endpoints is we don't have a benchmark in particularly in this biomarker to find population. So I hope um, that this context helps a little bit as we discuss the next four uh, discussion points. And that ends my comment. Thank you, Dr. Klutz. Maybe, maybe I can just uh, 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 peek on, on that Garcia, comment. Dr. Garcia, uh, Gordon Vlahovic here from GSK. Do you mind if I add um, some few more thoughts to uh, what we just heard? Uh, no, please go ahead, and I can uh, ask my question sure. later. Go ahead. So, uh, first of all, uh, do you mind if you can switch the slides? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I would like to um, just to share a slide with you while I'm speaking here. Um, yes, indeed, uh, co clinical complete response is different from ORR, which is in metastatic setting. However, in our design um, and in design of MSK, we also have patients followed uh, in surveilled very closely throughout the duration of the study, which is five years. And if there is any sign of a disease regrowth, tumor regrowth, uh, patients will be uh, treated with standard of care, which includes uh, chemo, radiation, and if necessary, surgery. We know uh, from the prior experience that Dr. Smith has spoken to today that those patients do as well as the patients who receive that treatment upfront. Uh, and very importantly, even if disease regrowth happens later, at two years, there is also organ preservation and quality of life preservation that lasts for two years. But overall, when it comes to the risk to the early stage, uh, we believe that the way how the study is designed and our careful monitoring on the study will definitely be addressing that concern. Thank you. Um, more, more so, there is a small um, data, a uh, small cohort of the DMMR rectal cancer patients who were treated with neoadjuvant chemo radiation, and actually uh, the complete uh, response rate uh, from that cohort is about 26.6%, 27.6%, as you can see on a slide. So that gives us some kind of a benchmark, which us choosing actually 35%. Uh, the clinical complete response as the benchmark from standard of care is uh, rather conservative co compared to what we have seen from the DMMR population. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to expand on Dr. Klutz, this is Jorge Garcia. Uh, uh, as I, you know, it's, it's hard for me to avoid thinking as to uh, how do we define surrogacy in cancer and when we do drug development. And, and I'm, I don't know if it's semantics or it's just actually the lack of a statistical data to support um, uh, the CCR at 12. Uh, so uh, everybody has been talking here about a CCR 12 as a reasonable likely to predict OS, which is a hard point for me to understand. So I'm trying to, maybe I can gauge the FDA and also GSK and their stats team to how do you define surrogacy uh, and ha have we really actually defined surrogacy where you follow parentheses criteria or something else? Could you both uh, independently uh, speak to that CCR as a true surrogate marker for outcome improvement? This is Paul Klutz from the FDA. If I can begin, Dr. Garcia? Please, Dr. Klutz. So we've been thinking about the tumor-based endpoints more as intermediate clinical endpoints than surrogates, especially in this case where, as I said, this has meaningfulness in and of itself in that it essentially is the gateway to a clinical intervention that is a de-escalation and has the benefit of decreased morbidity and, and um, subsequent potentially even mortality for some of these major surgeries. Uh, and so in this setting, we would be thinking of this as more of an intermediate clinical endpoint. But as I said, the risk here is the uh, waiting for so long that you may have a incurable scenario by the time you catch it. And, you know, that's an important risk, particularly for these younger patients, really any patient. And how we capture that is going to un uh, unfortunately be a three- and five-year longer-term endpoint for which we have no concurrent control. And that, I think the endpoint discussion is going to end up probably in how are we going to really evaluate three and five year OS or EFS 
in a setting where it seems as if a randomized trial, if not infeasible, will be challenging to, to conduct. If I could just follow up on what Paul mentioned, I think we have to realize that all clinical CRs may not be the same, and this has to uh, be analyzed. Okay, is a clinical complete response rate from chemo radiation the same thing as a clinical complete response rate from an immunotherapy? Uh, not having radiation therapy. So I, I think, you know, you have to be, uh, have some discussion on that because uh, they may not be the same thing, okay? Uh, and I, I think that is an important point. Uh, I don't think we could say that these are true surrogates at this time with our limited information, specifically with the um, uh, immunotherapy at hand, uh, since they uh, really don't have any in this disease, uh, have a, uh, uh, long-term follow-up. So, you know, there are some problems. And here again, I'm focusing not on all of rectal cancer, but on the CRs that come from immunotherapy, this PD-1 inhibitor, uh, and its relationship to uh, uh, a long-term outcomes. But I, I think that you, one has to make the t distinction between a CR, is that from chemo radiation therapy, does that have the same meaningfulness? Uh, and it may be actually better, I don't know, okay, uh, from uh, immunotherapy, okay? So I, I would like Thanks. to just go down about Holly here again. I would like to uh, just address what we have, uh, what I've just heard about the, the risk and, and a weight. So just to um, make clear to everyone, we are not going to be waiting. So patients will be enrolled on the study, and those patients who have any signs, as we are uh, restaging patients and monitoring patients, any signs, clinical radiographic of disease progression, will be immediately treated with, uh, with uh, will switch and be treated with a chemotherapy radiation and surgery if necessary. Now, it can also, the same path is going to be for the patients, they achieve clinical uh, complete response and if they have any tumor regrowth. Now, again, going back to the data that does exist, that I will, I'm going to invite Dr. Smith to, to speak all the patients that actually had regrowth uh, we were subsequently treated with TNT radiation and their long-term outcomes were similar to the patient's outcomes who have been having that treatment, standard of care treatment up front. Dr. Smith, would you please just um, come to the podium and say a few. All right, so Dr. Smith again. So I'll just rehash the data from from Oprah and then also from our own retrospective data from uh, MSK that patients who had to undergo salvage TME that we were able to perform the same um, surgical um, uh, technique that we would have done at the beginning um, should they have gone to TME after the completion of therapy. In addition, I would just like to call attention to the point that um, patients who have clinical complete response, this is the, the point about surrogacy of outcome, but we do have data um, showing that clinical complete response, there is an association with disease free survival in the OPRA data that was that I alluded to earlier, and also just call your attention back to the German trial where they looked at pathologic complete response and its association with disease free survival. These are mature data out of randomized um, studies. So I think this is something we cannot overlook. I'm sure you could point back to retrospective data and say that all the limitations there, but we do have data from prospective studies showing a very strong correlation with response uh, and, and uh, very important oncologic outcomes. Thank you all. This Dr. Nieva, Sorry, this is Andrea Sarsic. If I can just add just a little bit of um, further thoughts on, on this question. With regard sure, specifically to a CCR as we know it, with, which is achieved with chemotherapy and chemoradiation, whether this CCR now with Dostarlamab alone is equivalent. I think as best as we can tell with the criteria utilizing to assess a clinical complete response, the tumor has completely disappeared by endoscopic exam, biopsy, um, as well as by MRI, and thus the CCR appears to be the same. And importantly also, we're talking about two CCRs here. One is at the completion of six months of therapy, and then the CCR12 is actually after 12 months after the achievement of the first CCR. And during that time period, the patients are followed very closely every four months, so to ensure that they have 
are sustaining their CCR that they achieved after treatment. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Garcia, this is uh, Lola Fashonaje from the FDA. May I may I um, uh, make a, a comment, please? Please go ahead, Dr. Fashonaje. So I, I just want to, you know, again, sort of come back to my previous comment about really making sure that we are all on the same page about sort of how we are interpreting the available data that we have. You know, this notion that, you know, we have established a relationship between, you know, CCR and DFS, I, I think uh, is one that, you know, is, is not necessarily supported. Um, you know, we have data from several analyses um, in, in, in quite different contexts in terms of the population study, the treatments administered. Um, that is based on a responder analysis. So we don't know really what the relationship of CCR lack thereof is uh, to uh, these uh, longer term outcomes. So I just want to sort of um, put that on the table here. Uh, one question I do have for GSK is, you know, just based upon uh, the description uh, regarding the enthusiasm for the study, whether they foresee any difficulties enrolling more than the proposed 100 patients uh, that they, they've described. So our proposed. Thank um, you. Oh, it, it, sorry, Gordana Vlahovic here. That we uh, proposed a study with a hundred patients, um, and certainly as we initiate the enrollment, um, we will keep monitoring to deliver on uh, all the all the necessary um, the the subpopulation or that we are hoping or trying or we will do our best to deliver in the meaningful numbers so we can assess the benefit. Um, and would you please clarify the questions for you asking, would we be uh, enrolling more than 100 patients? No, this is uh, Lola Fashoyanaji again. Uh, I, am, I am certain of what your proposal is, which is to enroll yeah. 100 patients. Sure. I am asking whether you anticipate having difficulty enrolling more than 100 patients onto this trial. Because I think, you know, we are really operating here um, in, in a data-free zone for the most part. I mean, we have these preliminary uh, efficacy results, but we don't really know the sort of natural history of this particular population. Uh, you know, we don't know whether we would expect recurrences to take longer to recur or, you know, we don't have a lot of information about sort of subgroups within this uh, heterogeneous population. Um, and so what I'm asking is uh, what are your thoughts about the feasibility of enrolling more than 100 patients? So we believe that we actually, with 100 patients, can answer the uh, the uh, our our question. Um, we believe that uh, 100 patients would provide us with a precision in the conference interval uh, regarding the when we benchmark to 35 percent that we can actually see the treatment effect that it's uh, that it's approximately doubled. With a, with for instance, uh, just as an example, 65 percent being being the lower bound. So um, from that perspective, we actually believe that 100 patients will be sufficient to provide us with the information and confidence that those DMMR MSI high population in locally advanced rectal cancer do benefit uh, from the Salimov. Hi, this is Steve Lemery. Can I chime in? I, I think, um, you know, to, to, to follow up on, on those points, um, I think we shouldn't be talking here about a benchmark of 35 percent. The reason why that's one thing is, you know, the reason why we're here is that we saw, we've seen so far 100 percent um, complete CR rate. And, you know, I think if we see, you know, we'll put the number of patients aside, but, you know, five years down the line that, you know, the, the, the complete clinical response rate is 100 percent and no, no patient relapses, I mean, I think, I think everyone's, you know, super happy, um, but at some point, you're going to, you know, that's probably unlikely to be the real world situation. And so, I think we're having some discussion about sort of what, what sort of decrement in that would be concerning, and, and also looking at, you know, something like DFS. We, do, we, there are some paucity on the, on the long term DFS of standard therapy in, in, 
patients with mismatch repair, deficient uh, rectal, sorry, not colon cancer, but rectal cancer. And so, you know, if, if we had in theory a 100% DFS at five years, well, I think, you know, everyone would probably acknowledge we're done. Um, but what is, you know, from almost a safety perspective, what what is sort of the decrement in DFS at three years, at five years, that sort of would be concerning. So that's, you know, that that's some of our points. And, and to, you know, to, to probe further on the number of patients, you know, I, I, I talked about, you know, T4 earlier, and I, and I think that will be important to have a sufficient number of patients with T4 or N2 or 3 lesions. I mean, even from a safety perspective, you know, you know, could there be a concern that a small number of patients with T4 lesions will perf, um, which would be a, you know, a catastrophic, 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 catastrophic event. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if, if that occurs, we want to be able to sort of describe that in labeling of, you know, what is the risk of, of, you know, a PERF in a patient with a T4 lesion, for example. So I think, you know, there are, there are a lot of uncertainties here. I think everyone is excited, you know, especially based on the, the 100% and no one's, you know, that we know of has relapsed so far. But, you know, ultimately three and five years down the line, what kind of data package would say, okay, you know, we're comfortable with this data. Uh, we're not pa putting patients at higher risk. We're not getting, you know, uh, increased numbers of, of um, you know, distant metastases, um, you know, and, and, you know, because we are talking about a single arm trial here, I, I think, um, which, which will increase the uncertainties at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, I, um, I wanted to just share the FS3 uh, rate locally advanced rectal cancer that we have pulled, and I do have a Dr. Smith here who can speak to it, um, but I just wanted to uh, uh, kind of a bring it to your attention as at least for uh, for DFS3, the benchmarks uh, that, we, that we identified, or EFS3 in our, in our particular case. But, but going back to, um, to it again, uh, I would like to remind everyone the data we are sharing, and yes, there are data from, from retrospective uh, studies. There is a, a prospective study, one opera that we mentioned today, um, that is, uh, is very important to, to note it's coming uh, from the population that is much more heterogeneous than what we are actually targeting in our study. So that's the population of DMMR and MMRP. Again, our population is homogeneous in essence because it is biologically very similar. It does have a biomarker for which we are selecting, and it has a good history when we select that uh, disease or when we select patients based on that biomarker uh, response and susceptibility to immunotherapy, even in metastatic setting. Um, I would like to just bring uh, uh, everyone to, uh, uh, to remind everyone that patients who are DMMR MSI high in metastatic setting re who respond to immunotherapy, to PD-1 inhibitor, have sustained responses, long-term uh, benefits and survival in a metastatic setting where we would expect patients actually to die within the one year. So um, in, in all that in totality, I would also want to remind that patients with DMMR MSI high do have less benefit from chemotherapy. So I will, I will here invite Dr. Smith just to kind of add on some additional pr perspectives uh, on, on these uh, primary outcomes. These, these data are just shown to demonstrate the disease-free survival rates in uh, relatively recent randomized trials that show that 76 to 70 percent is fairly, uh, fairly um, representative of what you would find in non-selected populations. Thank you. And I would, now, uh, before we are we, we complete with our response, I would like to ask, ask Dr. Abdullah also to add on a comment. Hisham Abdullah, GSK. Um, Dr. Lemmer, you just want to to respond to a couple points that you raised as well, too, just in, in, uh, in terms of um, the sample size of the study itself. I mean, certainly from our perspective, we'd be happy to work with you, with the FDA, um, around how to best make sure that we um, have a, um, a patient population that is certainly representative of key uh, baseline demographics, prognostic variables. Um, that is enrolled um, into the study. If that means that we might need to go over, you know, slightly over 100, um, I think it's something that we can think about, consider, assess, evaluate, 
um, and discuss with you further. And it's something that we can certainly continue to monitor while the study is ongoing um, and uh, evaluate based on the demographics of the patient population that we are able to recruit just to make sure that, um, that we actually uh, recruit uh, certainly a, a diverse uh, population that is representative of the, uh, of, of the disease um, and the various prognostic variables associated with it as well, too. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we can uh, just um, allow Dr. Katsalakis to uh, ask, uh, to make your comment or ask a question. Dr. Katsalakis. Oh, sorry. Uh, just a question. I know a lot of the, the discussion really um, for the CCR, as we was previously mentioned, uh, is immunotherapy the same as, um, you know, chemo radiation? And uh, the long-term follow-up is, is really, like, what's, what's, what's missing. It's going to be kind of the key to interpret all of this. Um, I guess uh, data was shown that, um, you know, this study's follow-up is similar to Oprah's study um, in terms of the rigorous uh, follow-up, and I know it's, uh, in the initial, in the study design, there's, uh, you know, there's an incomplete response. Initially, they're, they're checked, I think, up to eight weeks, and then if, if they don't show or they don't come, come back, I guess they go to chemo radiation, and so far all the participants seem to have had an excellent response. But for the um, for the Oprah study, I wasn't sure if anybody was aware of um, you know how many patients were lost to follow up because I do have concerns um, in the community setting. Uh, you know what will happen to the patients that are like, oh my stem looks great, I'm cancer free, I'm not coming back because we you know we have encountered patients like that. Um, and uh, you know, in the GU setting, we don't put, always put patients on active surveillance protocol. You know, pre-treatment is completely different disease. But if they're not going to come back, you know, sometimes we really kind of um, you know uh, advocate for a treatment for them as opposed to a program that they're not going to be able to follow. So, just if you could comment on that, that would be great. Thank you. I think if I understand your question, you're asking what was the dropout rate in Oprah during, um, as we followed them um, after TNT? Yes. Okay. Yeah. We, all the yes. patients were followed throughout. There was nobody lost to follow up. And so we would anticipate the same thing. I think the distinction here is that, remember in Oprah, that we allowed patients who had a near complete response to then evolve to a clinical complete response in this study. Um, we were going to be very strict using the same regression criteria to um, only include patients who have a clinical complete response. Thank you. Thank you all. Dr. Garcia, this is uh, Lola Fashena Jay from the FDA. May I um, make a comment and suggestion? Um, yes, perhaps we can take uh, this as the last uh, comment suggestion before we can move on, so we can move on to our discussion session. Uh, so go Wait. ahead, please. Yes, that's exactly what I was going to suggest. I think, you know, we really are very interested to hear from the members of the committee. We are really grateful that, um, you know, GSK and their invited guests have been, are able to share the experience at Memorial Sloan Kettering, but we do want to hear from other members of the committee uh, about sort of their thoughts on the specific topics that uh, we have posed to the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Great introduction to move on. So the committee will now turn it, its attention to the task at hand, the careful consideration of the data before the committee, as well as the public comments. We will proceed with the questions to the committee and panel discussions. I would like to remind public observers that while this meeting is open for public observation, public attendees may not participate except at the, uh, at the specific request of the panel. We're going to read question number one. So we have about, um, you know, we're supposed to be finishing around five, uh, you know, um, a little bit over 5.30 or so. So maybe what we'll uh, do uh, just for the ODAC committee members, um, there are four topics for us to actively review and discuss among ourselves. Ideally, we want to take this time to actually uh, have our own conversation rather than pitching back comments and questions to uh, either the applicant and or the FDA, but rather just to spend the time talking about um, the subjects that uh, the subject at hand and also the uh, 
presentations that we heard today. We have a talented group of people in the committee uh, with GI oncology expertise, so I'm hoping that we can be an active uh, group. Um, question number one, uh, we can probably spend around 15, 20 minutes on, uh, on each uh, topic, take it and leave it uh, before we can vote. So question number one, I'm going to read it, discuss the adequacy of the proposed single arm trials to evaluate the efficacy and safety of dorstalimab, including the long-term benefits and risks of treatment. Are there any issues or questions about the wording of this question? If there are no questions or comments concerning the wording of the question, we will now open the question to discussion. Maybe what I'll do, uh, all right, so we have uh, some uh, hands uh, up. So Dr. Nieva, do you want to uh, lead this uh, discussion? Sure. Uh, George Nieva, USC Norris. <laughs> yeah, I, I think defining effectiveness here is important when we're thinking about, you know, the single arm study 2, 219-369 as the benchmark. Um, I, I think the benchmark for CCR12 really should not be 35%. If we're going to be defining um, effectiveness with a single arm study, you know, I, I think really 75, 80% is really, you know, the benchmark that we should be looking at. And, and I think the other concern I have is that with single arm data, there are bountiful opportunities for bias to enter in data cleaning. And I think there needs to be great vigilance to prevent these biases from entering into the clinical trial because we don't have a control arm. Um, you know, there can be biases created in how radiographic findings are interpreted, you know, by using, for example, very strict criteria for the definition of uh, persistent disease uh, rather than looser criteria. You know, I really think the radiographic review has to be blinded and independent and I'm concerned that any training of radiologists could be biased in ways to reduce um, declarations of a less than CR. I think central review of eligibility, uh, as they're doing with uh, central review of MSI, you know, generally is good for internal validity, but it reduces external validity. And lack of external validity is really the risk we're all concerned about with this treatment paradigm. We're worried that rectal cancer patients might be treated with this regimen based on bad MSI assessments uh, or will be treated in centers where the multimodal treatment teams will provide less than ideal follow-up. So while I think that a single arm trial here is appropriate based on the extraordinary preliminary data that we have, I do think we need to build a confirmatory trial that minimizes bias in favor of declaration of CRs and I think we need to use real-world determination of MSI, and we need to enroll in smaller centers that maybe don't have the multimodal teams. And so how all that is executed, I think, is going to be critical to be sure that we can really believe the uh, results of a single-arm study. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Neva, may, may, maybe I'll just push back, uh, I'll just push a bit, a bit on your comment uh, in the sense, could you just expand on, on your thoughts as to you talk about maybe building uh, a better trial, a confirmatory trial? What do you mean by that based upon uh, the challenges that clearly, you know, uh, GI oncology experts in the field appear to feel, you know, that, or predict, if you will, that we may not be able to do such a trial in the future? So, so to clarify, Jorge, you mean that um, we, we want to, the, the, the question is, what do I mean by the, the trial two or trial three? Correct. Trial two. So, yeah. So in trial two, there are lots of things that are built into the current design of trial two to maximize internal validity and maximize declarations of CR. That could be done through, you know, training of radiologists. And, and my concern is that if there are patients who don't achieve a CR on trial, that those patients are going to be doubly scrutinized in order to find reasons to declare them ineligible. So I, I want to be sure that, you know, when we come up with the rate 
of, of what the CCR 12 rate is, which I actually think is a perfectly appropriate endpoint here, that, that we're doing this really based on an intent to treat analysis uh, as opposed to a, a refined eligibility population. So I'm not asking that the trial design be fundamentally changed. I'm, I'm simply suggesting that we need to have safeguards in place to prevent biases that are going to be prone to overestimate a CCR rate by excluding progressors. Does that make sense? Yep, yep, yep. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Fjambor? Yeah, so I just wanted to make a couple comments about this discussion point. Um, and perhaps from my experience, I'm, as was publicly disclosed, I'm the national PI for a cooperative group trial that is looking at a different immunotherapy regimen in the same patient population in MSI high locally advanced rectal cancer. Um, and sort of from that experience, as well as my broader experience as a GI oncologist uh, treating mostly colorectal patients, um, you know, I, I completely agree with some of the points that have been made in, in terms of uh, by Dr. Cohen and others that you really cannot do a randomized trial here. As much as, as we love randomized trials and, um, and, and that would be the ideal, I think um, what has been mentioned is, is completely accurate in the sense that if you are randomizing to current standard of care, these patients will either not enroll on the study, afraid that they will be randomized to that, um, to that arm, or if they enroll and get randomized to the standard of care arm, they will drop out. So you, you won't actually get, um, get that, that question answered, unfortunately, um, as much as we, you know, would love to see the comparison. Um, and we, we've actually experienced that, you know, with, with the design of our trial and input from patient advocates and, and others. So I think the single arm trial is kind of what, what needs to be done. We need more data. We need more long-term follow-up um, and done in a multi-institutional way, not only with this potential trial, but others. Um, so that was one of my first points, but I can come back. There's a lot of hands up, so maybe others want to comment as well. Thank you, Dr. Chamber. Um, Dr. Katsalakis, do you want to comment? Sorry, I think that was an error, I apologize. Okay, great. Dr. Chang, then. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I want to just comment on the question about the adequacy of a proposed single-arm trial and, um, and, uh, and, and simply say that, you know, given the response rate that we've seen um, in the Distarlumab study that was presented um, uh, by Dr. Sursak, uh, the study conducted at MSK and other data that we see, including data that we've published uh, from MD Anderson as well, um, the rate of response is, is um, incredibly high. If it's not 100 percent, it's pretty darn near close to 100 percent. And for a, for a primary endpoint of clinical complete response, um, it's very hard to um, it's very hard to see. Um, the rationale for a randomized uh, design because there's no other treatment that we have that can achieve a clinical complete response rate even close to that. And so notwithstanding all the great comments made by everybody about whether or not patients could be randomized or not, if there ever were a study where it was appropriate to do a single arm trial, I think this would, this would be it because what we're really talking about is exactly um, the comment that Dr. I think Nieva made earlier I mean, there will be a 80% um, or higher rate of, of complete response. If we were to do a power calculation, I don't think you would need very many patients were patients even able to be randomized. So I do think that it's quite appropriate to, um, to address this in a single-arm way. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Conaway? Uh, yes, Mark Conaway. 
Um, I agree with everything that's been said, and I think, you know, from a statistical point of view, with the current trial, uh, there's a very impressive response rate, to say the least. But with that, you have to ask, are there issues about how participant selection and the treating institution affect that response rate? And uh, I'm concerned that with the single-arm trial, we're going to be asking those same questions at the conclusion of the trial that, that you could ask now about the current trial. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I understand completely the difficulties in a, in a randomized trial and understand the weight of evidence, uh, you know, for this agent. Um, but, you know, uh, ideas have, have been floated here today. You know, you don't have to randomize one-to-one. -one. If randomization is completely impossible, I've heard the ideas of constructing a control group, right? You've got 43 sites right now and 100 participants. That means Every site is going to do two to three participants. There will be participants at those sites who can't get on trial, um, and it seems like they would be a natural control group. So it just seems like um, the design has dropped back from a one-to-one -one randomization, which might be infeasible, all the way back to a single-arm trial that, that might not answer the question. And, and I'm just advocating for an exploration of some space in between um, that will help answer some of the questions. Thank you. Is your suggestion, uh, uh, Dr. Conaway, to use uh, the, screen fail, uh, the screen failures, if you with the patients with screen fail, who get onto standard of care as controls? Dr. Conaway? All right, maybe we'll we'll move to someone else. Dr. Vasan. Hi, Neil Vasan. Um, I uh, to echo Dr. Nieva's comments about um, standardization and implementation of CCR, really the implementation. You know, the, the sponsor had said that this is a stringent, robust, biomarker. However, it requires this multimodal team coming together and, and making this, this assessment. And so I think that showing some data for standardization of this metric across disease sites from uh, large cancer centers to smaller hospitals will be really critical for thinking about CCR as a biomarker. And I'm somewhat reminded of, I think, some of the discussions that this group has had about PAPCR and the nature of PAPCR in other disease contexts and other drugs as a biomarker. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Madan and Dr. Park. Dr. Madan. Maybe mute. Ravi? All right, I cannot hear him. So uh, maybe we'll move with Dr. Park, and then we'll go back to Dr. Madan. Maybe we're having some technical glitch as we speak. Dr. Liu? Uh, sure, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Chris. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Great. Well, I'll skip the line here. Uh, this is Chris Liu. Um, just, I'm going to make this relatively short. I agree with everything that's been said in regards to the, the you know, inability to make this a randomized trial. I, I think that's been our experience here at University of Colorado as well. Yeah, I thought a lot about what the bar is uh, to allow single arm studies. And, you know, if we're talking about a CCR rate, that was around 50 percent somewhere close to what we might be able to achieve with standard of care, I think there it would be inexcusable, right, to not do a randomized trial. But just because these response rates are so incredibly high, um, I think that that's where, uh, you know, we're kind of at this point where this, this is likely, you know, our only option. And then the last thing being, you know, we 
this, this data doesn't exist in a vacuum, and, and Dr. Chang had mentioned data from MD Anderson. We certainly have data from the niche studies that, that show that, you know, the, the power of this type of therapy in this setting, and I think that that data needs to be kind of considered in aggregate. And, you know, one might wonder, well, then, is it possible that we're just looking at a subset that's just going to do well no matter what? And I think that it's clear with at least the data that's available that that is not the case with our standard therapies. In fact, there's data to potentially the contrary, where our standard therapies may not be as effective. Uh, and therefore, um, this is the reason why uh, I think the study design is uh, appropriate the way it is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and maybe what I'll do, I'll, I'll summarize some of the key points for this uh, um, question number one, so we can move on to question number two. Uh, since uh, many of us also have been talking about endpoints and the appropriateness of those endpoints uh, as a bar. So, so it, it, that, it appears that it's clear that we all, or most of us, do agree that uh, it is impractical and maybe impossible to do a randomized trial. Um, one, obviously, as you may uh, hear from, uh, uh, Doc, uh, from our uh, group from Vanderbilt, uh, Dr. Beaver, that, you know, practically would be uh, really hard to do, but equally important just by virtue of the high responses that were observed in uh, this long catering data. Um, uh, we also talk a little bit about the importance of uh, standardization, um, that endpoint of CCR across sites, uh, and the concerns again as to uh, what I what probably will talk again a little bit at the, uh, for the four point, which is uh, variability of how people are reviewing uh, CCR. Um, and again, uh, I think every, pretty much the group is pretty impressed with the CR rates observed in this specific patient population. Uh, so clearly um, it does appear that for the purposes of this drug, in the context of where this drug has been assessed, uh, that it would be impractical to propose a phase two uh, a randomized trial. So let's move on to question two. So I'm going to read the question. Uh, the committee is asked to discuss the adequacy of the proposed clinical endpoints, complete clinical response rate, a very free survival, and to characterize and verify the benefit of dorstalimab, including the proposed timing for their analysis. Are there any comments concerning the wording of the question? If there are no questions or comments concerning the wording of the question, we will now open the question uh, for the uh, ORAC committee to discuss. I see Dr. Coons, do you want to uh, start? Yes, I'm sorry for the delay. This is Pam Coons, happy to talk to this. Um, so I agree with prior comments that have been made and just have some, um, I guess, suggestions or recommendations for consideration of adding some stringency, I think, to the endpoint as was previously suggested. So one comment is um, considering adding organ preservation as either a primary or secondary endpoint as per the international consensus, consensus recommendations. And I think we also have an opportunity um, to really evaluate, evaluate variability in imaging, perhaps through banked digital images. I think that this has been raised a number of times, that we may see some heterogeneity, and I think this is really an opportunity for study and should be considered um, as another perhaps secondary or tertiary endpoint. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kunz. Um, let's go back to Dr. Madan. Yeah, see if it works this time. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Robbie. Oh, go ahead. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry about that. This actually is kind of dovetails with what I was going to say with, with the first uh, point. And that is really that, um, you know, I think I just have a little bit of a concern with the 12-month endpoint. I think we all know that the response rates are high and, and they're really good, as was just alluded to. Uh, but, but, you know, this data is immature. And I think we still don't know, you know, what happens three or four years down the road, or at least two or three, in an otherwise curable population. So I understand the need to pick a time and go with it, but I think the follow-up here is going to be the key. That's going to be the ultimate justification to validate 
whatever shorter term endpoints that are used. Thank you. Dr. Park? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we, we can. Please go ahead. Yes, I just had a similar comment. I think this endpoint uh, CCR 12 months is inadequate. I mean, we are taking away known treatments um, that can cure, you know, when we look at all the other data, and we're kind of extrapolating out to um, single agent modality that has never been, we've, we haven't seen anything like that. And so I agree, I think it's, we should not base it on that endpoint. If it was a different endpoint, they were saying, like maybe some of their secondary endpoints I saw three-year event-free survival, if they're going to say, hey, if we hit 95% and uh, it's hard to run a single um, randomized trial, so we'll use that, then I think maybe we can have a discussion about accelerated approval. But for this early endpoint, I, I have, that's based on chemo radiation data, I have a lot of trouble accepting that. Thank you. Just to, just to push you a, a bit on, on your thoughtful comments, uh, so, so so if, if CCR12, you think it's inadequate as an endpoint, uh, what is specifically, you know, what is the delta of that difference that you're looking for? I think they, uh, you know, we heard quite a bit as to, you know, what a CCR, you know, indicates in the long term, you know, with regards to uh, disease-free survival, and in fact, even overall survival. And also there was a lot of stress on the fact that, you know, when people have local recurrences, they still can go and have salvage approaches and if you look at the outcome, even with the limited data that they have, that we have, that we saw today or we heard today, uh, it appears that an outcome that is not different uh, compared to those patients who move forward with the standard of care. Yeah, I, um, my thoughts on that are, you know, this is a phase two trial going for accelerated approval. I think to have a more definitive thing, I would definitely talk about randomization, but just for this specific endpoint, um, because there's just so much uncertainty and to pack that all down on another uncertain endpoint, we're just maybe, you know, heaping uncertainty upon uncertainty. And so I think we have to have just a, we can't, that's why we can't use that endpoint, even if we switch it later on, because number one, we're not going to do a randomized trial for that. If we did, that may be a little different, but because we're talking about 100 patients, new paradigm, lots of uncertainty, we have to pick a better endpoint with a very high bar that can maybe break through some of that, grant accelerated approval, and then test that in a randomized fashion. So, and that's just uh, the way I was thinking about that too. Maybe forego some of the uncertainty we have. We have to have a much higher bar. Yeah, this is this is Robbie, man. I'd like to add to that just inside the similar. We we both had the same comment. If that's okay. Sure, go ahead. Uh, I think the other thing is, you know, the data we have that highlights the path to the the twelve month endpoint really comes from with different therapies. So we don't know that with immunotherapy that that carries the same relevance, and that gets back to, you know, the question of are there, you know, non MSI nests that are left behind, and what. What are the clinical uh, outcomes in, in that situation? So I think it's encouraging, and I have, you know, I'm comfortable, you know, using that as a as a as a best known at this moment. But it still is not exactly the data that we need to have confidence 100% in this endpoint. And and again, I think we're used on this committee to talking about incremental benefits of progression or survival. I mean, this is a curable population, so, you know, as has been said many times, the bar needs to be high. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Coons, do you have another comment or question? No, my apologies. That was left over. All right. No worries. Uh, Dr. Nieva? So I, I think the endpoint here is is actually a, a good one. Uh, I, I don't see waiting out, you know, three years or four years to be um, 
something that, that we necessarily need to do. I think it's a predictive endpoint in that regard. Um, that, you know, my only concern is, um, you know, that, that there be some kind of validation that the radiographic reads and, and endoscopic interpretations are, are independently um, scored and, and not uh, only scored by a, a single entity. And I think that's, that's a pretty easy change to make. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Chang? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, I would agree with Dr. Nieva that, that this is a, a good endpoint. Um, there is um, ample data about the um, excellent prognosis in patients who achieve a complete response with our, who achieve a complete response with our current uh, treatment modalities, notwithstanding um, the very um, um, good concerns and comments that have been raised about is it the same if it's immunotherapy versus traditional therapy. Um, I guess we don't quite know um, that answer right now. If this were a randomized design where DMMR patients are randomized to conventional treatment uh, versus um, versus uh, uh, a immunotherapy-based approach, I would um, I would hypothesize that um, it, um, we would have a pretty dramatic difference. We would certainly have a dramatic difference for clinical complete response, um, but um, we would also anticipate a pretty dramatic difference in um, subsequent event-free survival. So my question actually, so, so I actually have a, um, in my comment, um, I actually have a question as well, and this is sort of procedurally for the FDA, is um, if this drug is granted accelerated approval based on a clinical complete response rate, um, or what, are, are, there, are there subsequent, um, will there be subsequent opportunities to then monitor that event-free survival and that would, that would then result in a modification of that, um, uh, of that uh, uh, accelerated approval? Um, it, it certainly seems that, um, you know, given what we know, uh, this is ex achieving clinical complete response will be expected to be associated with all of the more favorable outcomes that we'll see. And so if we, you know, compare the rates of failure with standard treatment versus what we see in patients who are complete responders, I anticipate there would be a pretty large difference there. Um, but <clears throat> the question has to do with, you know, if approval is granted based on this, um, what mechanisms are, um, exist for monitoring that subsequent event free survival. Thank you very much. Well, this is Dr. Pazzer. The event free survival would have to be determined by uh, a external control because you don't have a control here. Uh, so that's the why I was pressing the company uh, and they agreed to perhaps give us more information uh, and develop a uh, external control here. One would hope that given the big effect that we're seeing on this clinical complete response rate that this would uh, be much greater uh, and obviate some of the problems that we see with uh, uh, using external controls. This is uh, Lola Fashunaj. I'd like to sort of expand on Dr. Pazder's comments. I think, you know, the 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 the, the, the approval decision, um, if it were to come to that, uh, would really be mostly based upon the the endpoint here, this clinical complete response rate. And I think any additional data that we collect. Uh, long term uh, in, in the various mechanisms that have been proposed here may provide some supportive uh, information. Um, I, I think we want to know that, you know, patients who are recurring aren't having adverse outcomes compared to what would be expected with, with standard of care, for example. Um, and so, but, but those data would really um, be supportive. Uh, we don't anticipate that they would sort of um, result in sort of independent endpoints um, uh, due to some of the limitations that, you know, we discussed uh, earlier. And, and I think, you know, any sort of external control data, you know, comes with a lot of 
concerns, um, you know, that is probably uh, too much to get into in, in the context of this meeting. So we would have, you know, some reservations about sort of the utility and the role that those types of data would, would uh, have uh, in our assessment of the effectiveness of this therapy. But, you know, it would be, it could be something that's better than nothing. Um, so, you know, we would, we, we would certainly take a look at, at, at uh, more specific uh, detailed proposals. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm going to ask a question to our uh, ODAC panel, specifically to Dr. Conaway. Uh, and while he processed uh, my question, uh, we can go on to another uh, panel member. Dr. Conaway, you know, I mean, we're talking about maybe defining or finding an external control, you know, that can be used to contrast uh, the endpoints or the benefits that this therapy may lead to this uh, specific patient population. Uh, I'm, 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 from the statistics perspective, I, I wonder what would be the best way to build that external control and maybe, you know, um, if you can think as to how would you counsel us as an ODAC committee members to think through that uh, design uh, just to see if we can actually really actually see the, what is the true delta of that difference since clearly we won't be able to actually have long-term follow-up data addressing the question as to, you know, is, is a true CCR uh, a true predictor of outcome improvement in the long term? But while you think of that, maybe I, like, I can ask uh, doc, uh, Mr. Makowski if you have any comments. Yes, thank you. Thank you. This is Paul Mikowski um, from New York. Um, I'm sitting as the, uh, as the patient representative. I just really wanted to um, I think circle back, you know, we're discussing uh, endpoints. I just want to really circle back on, uh, you know, the quality of life issues. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm eight years out. I had standard of care. I went through the whole, um, you know, the whole sequence of everything. Um, and the quality of life issues are, um, you know, are very real. So, as we've been having this discussion, you know, I've been thinking, you know, to myself, uh, you know, if I had it to do all over again. Um, so I, I guess one of the takeaways, um, you know, that, that I'm thinking of, again, is just, you know, really circling back on, you know, the quality of life issues. You know, I won't, you know, try and, you know, state that, um, uh, you know, the, the 12 month, you know, CCR, you know, I would say, well, that sounds good to me because this, you know, sounds, um, you know, like such a positive development in terms of, you know, addressing the, you know, the, uh, the quality of life issues. Um, and, you know, as I understand the, the regimen and, and the study, and even if this were to ultimately become a treatment, there's always the fallback of going to, um, you know, returning to standard of care. Um, you know, if there was not, a, you know, if there was not a response, um, uh, you know, evidence. So, um, you know, I just want to circle back to focus a little bit on that, you know, of the, uh, you know, the quality of, uh, of life issues um, and how important, you know, that would be um, or how important I think that is, uh, you know, in, in, you know, in, in trying to move this, uh, you know, trying to move this forward. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughtful comments. Dr. Liu? Yeah, this is Chris Liu. I, you know, I, I just want to, you know, highlight just one point in regards to CCR12. And we know, when you look at the International Watch and Wait database, you know, there's prom really promising data of a correlation between CCR and DFS uh, with the MSK data. But when you look at the International Watch and Wait database, you know, if you're looking at local regrowth, 64% diagnosed within one year, 88% within two years, and then distant metastasis rate only 11% within one year, and then 54% within two years. You know, even though the CCR12 is actually 18 months from the time that somebody enters into the study, you know, the question is, is that enough time? And you know, to echo some of the points made by Dr. Park and Dr. Madan is just, you know, if you, you know, you're kind of lumping two unknowns at the same time, right? I mean, we assume that CCR, you know, is a surrogate. Uh, for DFS and, and potentially even OS, but we don't know that for sure. And we also don't necessarily know 
the natural history you know, of these patients. And so that, that's my only concern in regard to CCR12. We make a lot of assumptions, and I think they're going to be right about what that means for our patients, but we don't know that for sure. And then when you look at like an external control or utilization of real world data, um, you know, I think that that will help clarify some of the natural history of, of what these pa patients experience with standard of care. That's obviously fraught with all kinds of different biases. But, you know, one of the things that I think, you know, we should keep in mind is that, you know, we assume that these patients are going to have really, really great responses based off our preliminary data in, in, in the prior study, along with all, many of the other studies that have also been done, you know, in, in, in this space with immunotherapy. Uh, and so really with any type of external control, you just want to make sure that this patient population wasn't all cured with standard of care therapy, right? Uh, where the incredible numbers that we're seeing in this group and in the trials that we've seen to date are, are just what's gonna happen with these patients. And I would just make the, the point again that, you know, from what we've seen thus far, uh, there's no data to support the fact that all these patients get cured with standard of care therapy. Uh, but, you know, and so the comparator here, uh, it, It'll be it'll be important to to understand that all, not all of these patients are doing great, and some of the data that we're seeing preliminarily uh, is is pretty impressive. So, so just just to uh, expand on on, on your thoughts, uh, Doctor Lee, you know, I think the bigger question often, and, and you know, again, you you do this on a daily basis in in the your GI oncology practice, but if if the question right now is, can I actually put someone in a clinical CR? Uh, that may, for some, may be cure, right? For some, may not, and there still is a chance for recurrence. But also, because of that, you're delaying a time to a morbid intervention that clearly causes significant detriment in quality of life. And if you salvage or rescue those patients with a standard of care, I think the bigger question for me is: if I got, if I can delay the time to a morbid approach, and at the end, you know, my outcome won't appear to be any different than if I had started with a morbid approach from the beginning, would the time of quality of life be important to our patients if it doesn't really change the clinical outcome? You know what, I'm, you know what I mean yeah. with that? No, absolutely. And, you know, if you take the example to the extreme, let's just say in every single patient, all we're doing is just delaying a time to surgery. Uh, that's not necessarily insignificant in terms of quality of life. And I think this is where quality of life metrics in a study like this are so critically important because of the morbidity of some of the interventions that, that we're proposing. And then if you kind of take it halfway and just say, well, maybe half of the patients that otherwise, you know, would have received uh, surgery and radiation did not receive surgery and radiation, then there's a benefit, you know, al already there. Uh, I think what we want to make sure of is that you're not delaying patients, you know, a curative operation, and then they all have distant metastasis. Again, I do not think that that is the case. There's no evidence to suggest that that's the case, but that's where an endpoint of event-free survival at three years becomes so critically important. And so I think it's kind of the marriage of those two things together to show that complete clinical response does lead to this incredible improvement in event-free survival at three years. And then, of course, what's happening concurrently here is the confirmatory phase three study, uh, which will also, you know, partially uh, answer some of these questions. Thank you. Dr. Kanaway, any thoughts uh, about building external controls? Well, <laughs> it's Sorry. a hard question for the few minutes I had to ponder this, but, um, you know, uh, the easy answer is the natural control would, be, would come out of a randomized trial. But if that is not done, then I'm not sure there is an answer to the question, what's the best way to do that? It sounds like GSK has considered some options for constructing a control group, but no matter what, if you're going to do a single arm trial, you need something to compare those results to. Historical controls, contemporaneous controls, collected in some way with structured with structured data collection. Um, you need to be able to put the study in context, right? And so I don't know if I have specific advice about the best way to do that. Thank you for your honest opinion. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but. Uh, just let me let me sort of summarize some of the uh, comments and thoughts that the group has had. Um, and if anybody wants to ask, uh, please feel free to do so. 
So it, it does seem that the theme from the group is that there are, we, we have a need to add additional endpoints into these clinical trials. Um, Dr. Kunz mentioned the adding organ preservation based uh, endpoints. Um, we also heard the importance of uh, quality of life endpoints that really, really are key uh, to really ensure the success of these approaches as we uh, know the morbidities of standard of care. Uh, we also talked, some, some in the group felt that CCR at 12 months was inadequate, but yet uh, the uh, group of people also felt that it was sufficient just by virtue of the high rates that we have seen, at least in the preliminary data from the Sloan data, uh, which is supported by many, uh, by many other uh, da data out there uh, within the international community, also within the United States. Uh, but clearly the biggest uh, challenge that we all appear to have is the long-term outcome improvement and whether or not you really are leading to uh, outcome improvement with that CCR, you know, and maybe you may be missing some people who are no cure and the potential for local recurrences and therefore distant metastasis, which obviously one third of our patients with locally, uh, locally advanced rectal cancer still succumb to their disease. So clearly a big need in that context. Did I miss anything else, Tim? All right, let's move on then to question number three. Ms. Beth, I wonder if we can have question number three on the screen. Thank you. This one is a bit hard for me to understand specifically. Um, maybe I'll ask uh, some advice from the FDA as to how they want us to handle that or specifically what they're asking us to uh, uh, debate or discuss here. And that is discuss the study population with the stage two and three locally advanced rectal cancer, uh, MMR deficient, MSI uh, high and stable for non-operative management approaches. So if I, if I just have the FDA to clarify exactly, you know, what do you have in mind with this question is the differences between uh, TS stage specifically uh, and the differences that we saw uh, in this long data with less than 20 or 22 percent of patients with uh, uh, T2 disease. Yes, um, this is Lola Fashona Jay from FDA. I'm happy to clarify. I think what we are asking the committee to weigh in on is uh, whether or not, you know, there are subpopulations within this sort of entity of locally advanced rectal cancer for whom, you know, we expect um, a disease recurrence to be um, higher based upon, you know, the degree of invasion, so T4 tumors um, or the presence of nodal metastases such that, you know, we want to make sure that those patients are adequately represented in the database um, that is brought forth to FDA uh, for us to render a benefit risk uh, uh, assessment for the entire locally advanced rectal cancer um, uh, population. Does that clarify? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions concerning the wording of this question? If there are no further comments or questions concerning the wording of the question, we will now open this question for discussion. I'm sorry, Dr. Garcia, this is Lola Fashion again, just a quick uh, addition sure. here. Uh, I think the other is sort of consideration for patients with Lynch syndrome uh, for whom we know they have a higher risk of having, you know, additional or subsequent tumors um, and whether or not there's any consideration for whether or not a non-operative management approach um, would or would not be uh, appropriate. So we just want to hear discussion and your thoughts on that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Or maybe I'll start, but, you know, one of the things that caught my eye was obviously the, <clears throat> the difference between um, MMR deficient and MSI uh, high patients uh, between a stage 2 and a stage 3, and if I heard correctly, it does appear that, you know, as you develop more advanced disease, probably in this case nodal disease, that uh, that sort of genotype changes and uh, goes lower, uh, at least uh, statistically speaking. So I don't know for the GI um, oncology uh, members in the, in the group, 
Um, what are your thoughts as to the, those differences between a stage two and a stage three when you dissect the uh, uh, data that was presented today? Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pick on Dr. Kunz. You can help me start that discussion. Hi, sure. It's Pam Kunz. Happy to start. Um, I mean, I think it's critically important that those data be collected. Um, I guess the question is whether or not um, the design should allow for or include pre-planned subgroup analyses. I think obviously if it's not randomized, we can't do stratification factors, but I think evaluating um, for Lynch syndrome and also including the patients with T4 disease will be important. I guess the question is how can we ensure that enough patients from that represent those groups are included, but that may be difficult. I, I think it's fine to include both stage two and stage three. Thank you. Um, Dr. Siember? Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment that um, we, I think you also have to be careful, especially with the MSI high disease, in that sometimes um, radiographic assessment can overestimate stage, so we tend to see that more with colon than probably rectal, and it's also another um, um, reason why the, I think actually the colon study will not be as helpful for a host of different reasons, but that being one of them, um, to, to getting the answer here. But, um, but I, I would take the staging with a grain of salt because sometimes we see these really aggressive, terrible-looking cancers and they wind up at resection, even without neodymium therapy, being actually not as, not as bad. So obviously that doesn't happen as much in the rectal population, but still a possibility. And since I know you, you were also uh, obviously um, quite involved in the development of the cooperative trial, uh, the cooperative trial that you described earlier, uh, did you guys face the same challenges when you were thinking as to ideal patient population and how to stratify? Um, no, we see. You know, I think it was pretty straightforward for us as we were thinking about this design, just because stage two and three, we wanted to keep it as inclusive as possible, um, but also um, because we didn't really think that there was dramatically different um, prognoses with uh, stage two versus stage three as opposed to a non-MSI high rectal cancer. Of course, that was a, an assumption and a hypothesis, but, um, but we felt that stage two and three would, would be a reasonable group to analyze together um, after immunotherapy. Thank you. Dr. Chang? Thanks. Um, I do think this is a reasonable population, but to more specifically um, respond to the FDA question, um, it often can be quite difficult to distinguish between stage two and stage three because lymph node evaluation on clinical examination, including with high-quality MRI is, um, has, has uh, much more limited accuracy than what we once thought. Um, there are many other factors that we do look for uh, on the preoperative evaluation uh, that are probably more prognostic, such as the presence of vascular invasion or um, lateral pelvic lymph node involvement, et cetera. Um, you had, so, so I would say that um, it, it's certainly appropriate to look at a stage 2, 3 population and arguably you know, uh, um, I could see investigators locally trying to upstage stage one patients so that they could be eligible. Arguably, that's a group of patients who um, are most easily treated um, with this kind of an approach. And so that would, be, that would be one thing to consider is actually including stage one. Considering this does not involve um, radiation or chemotherapy, it is um, immunotherapy, which um, uh, it has does not carry the, the same level of toxicity as the traditional approaches. And then, and then I, I, will, um, I would say that there's a population of patients, certainly those who have adjacent organ involvement, and certainly with MSI high tumors, we can have very local advanced tumors. And um, as, was, as, as the comment that was made radiographically, often even after response, we don't 
Um, we may not see the same level of radiographic response dis despite the fact that there will be a pathologic complete response. And that's certainly something that's well known about MSI tumors. But what I would say is, especially for those tumors that are um, quite locally advanced, such as T4B disease, one could argue that those patients um, do stand to benefit the most from an approach that might allow us to avoid or defer um, the need for surgery. So uh, I would not feel that that's a population that could not, you know, that that um, that should that would not be um, uh, eligible for for a study of this kind of design. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Dr. Vasen. Yeah, it just seems like so much of the discussion that we've had so far has been on just the small numbers of patients with this disease. Dr. Sterstek had mentioned 2.7% uh, based on the New, the New England Journal um, IHC paper. It, it just seems like trying to parse out, even if, even if there were a randomized trial, trying to parse out some of these differences with T4 and some of these clinical subsets might still be quite challenging just given the overall rarity of this entity. Thank you. Dr. Siambur, you have an additional comment? Or I see your hand up. I guess no. So um, if there are no additional comments or questions, it does seem, does anybody want to comment about the Lynch syndrome question? Um, Dr. Liu? I don't know if you have experience with those patients. Um. Yeah, I mean, this is something where I would actually like Dr. Chang to, to kind of uh, discuss his management as well, because some te sometimes these patients do go on to, you know, total colectomy, depending on uh, what's going on and, and their and, and patient's own individualized risk of, uh, of developing cancer. Um, in regards to inclusion of that population uh, in the study, I, I don't personally have any concerns uh, at all, but, um, you yeah, know, there, there are times where these patients do go on to, to have surgeries, uh, but that's just to prevent future uh, um, uh, future cancers. George? Dr. Chang, do you have any comments? All right, we'll move on and um, maybe we can piggyback with uh, Dr. Chang if he gets unmuted, but it does seem that <clears throat> Pretty straightforward uh, discussion. You know, everybody felt that uh, the stage two and three uh, seems to be a reasonable patient population. Uh, there were not major red flags to uh, include or not include patients with Lynch syndrome. Uh, granted that, you know, uh, there, there may be some surgical considerations uh, for these patients uh, due to their nature of their disease and the possibility of uh, uh, new recurrences and uh, within the colon. Um, the group also felt that it would be difficult to stratify patients based, uh, uh, based upon a staging just by virtue of the single nature of, uh, of these trials. Um, and clearly, uh, we heard uh, strong opinions as to the importance of critically staging uh, these patients, not only before treatment, but certainly after they complete therapy due to the variability of what they see, you know, objectively and what one may find uh, pathologically. Let's move forward with question number four. Um, Dr. Garcia? Yes, who's this? Um, this is George Chang. Okay, go ahead, George. Do you have any comments? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I, the system wasn't on, a lot, I wasn't on meeting for me. I just wanted to respond to Dr. Liu's comment and, and also the specific question about Lynch. And I think, the, I think what's behind that question is by not resecting are we increasing the patient's risk for metachronous tumors? And certainly um, there, there are some people who would advocate for a um, more extended resection, a prophylactic uh, proctocolectomy, if you will, um, for patients with Lynch. And there is actually pretty good data that would suggest that, um, uh, that um, with adequate surveillance, depending upon the individual patient characteristics, actually from a quality-adjusted life expectancy, 
um, perspective that in many situations, um, um, a more limited resection for patients with Lynch syndrome uh, combined with ongoing um, surveillance um, is, um, is, is as good if not, um, if not associated with better quality adjusted life expectancy. So um, I agree with Dr. Liu. I would not have a concern about um, Lynch patients. Uh, they obviously will need to uh, undergo ongoing surveillance. And the potential quality of life benefit, particularly for rectal cancer patients, um, is even greater. Um, so uh, that would not be a concern. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, yeah, you know, I, I agree. I would predict that that patient population would be one that will be super, super excited to uh, enroll in, on a clinical trial of this nature, just by virtue of what you're describing. Thank you. Is that if we can move to question number four? This one is, I think, it's probably to me one of the most important topics uh, because there's no doubt that. Uh, you know, most of us do agree that uh, this agent has efficacy, has safety, uh, but certainly, you know, some of the concerns that the entire committee have expressed individually and collectively relate to the variability of care, right, and how people are going to be staged, how people are going to be followed, uh, the quality of care, and Dr. Eng uh, eloquently also uh, presented data uh, of what really happens uh, outside major academic centers uh, with high volume uh, for this particular disease. So I'm going to read the question, um, uh, and um, the question for the committee is for us to discuss the potential impact of the variability in care, expertise, uh, and alike across multidisciplinary study staff, across study sites, on the study conduct, and ultimately on outcomes. Are there any questions or comments? concerning the wording of the question. If there are no questions or comments concerning the wording of the question, we will now open this question for discussion. Dr. Schumber? Yes, can you hear me? We can. Okay, I'm back, great. Yeah, so, so my thought on this is that um, while this is certainly a challenge, I think this is the challenge for non-operative management of rectal cancer in general. Um, and what we face moving forward, I think there, there will be disparities and, and differences in ability to do that based on resources um, and, um, and expertise. Um, but I don't think that it's, that is um, a negative for this study, I think if anything, um, it probably will, you'll probably get the best, um, the best assessment by these, by these sites. The issue is when you move it, if it becomes uh, a standard of care at some point or as it's being um, used off-label or, or immunotherapy in general is being used off-label for this instance, I think that's where you get into trouble. Um, but I don't think that that's a detriment to the study necessarily, though I do agree that it needs to be rigorously, you know, the surveillance needs to be rigor rigorously done and a very careful, um, careful ongoing assessment um, for patients. Thank you. Um, I think any of us who have sort of or claim to have this expertise in a particular area always continue to believe that, you know, uh, complicated cases uh, really need to be treated um, by disease experts, right? Uh, but yet, you know, and I don't want to sound demeaning to uh, the entire community in North America, it is fair to say that probably 65, two-thirds of the uh, patients with cancer in the United States are not being treated at large academic centers, but right in community sites and community, uh, by great doctors as well. Uh, but I think that it raises the question uh, for this specific patient population, which is not that common for that matter, whether or not these patients ultimately would be better care of by going to a center of excellence with high volume. Dr. Madan? Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously there are clinical implications here for the patients, and that's 
front of mind concern for everybody. But beyond that, this again gets back to the whole, you know, 12 month clinical CR component. And if there are inconsistencies in kind of how these multidisciplinary assessments are going to made th be made through the course of the trial, then, you know, 12 months might be too early. They might become much more clinically apparent uh, given the variabilities in the multidisciplinary approach at later time points. So, again, it just highlights to me why, why uh, I think even though if you want to choose the 12-month um, clinical CR, the follow-up is really going to have to be strong and, and rigorous to validate that. Thank you, Robbie. Dr. Kunz? Uh, yes. Um, so I, I agree this is a really important question. However, I think that it's really important to maintain sort of some heterogeneity of the sites in terms of community practices and academic practices, especially because we don't want to limit access to care. We don't want to limit the diversity of our patients. I think instead, it's, as others have already stated, um, really increasing the rigor of how we both educate and define these criteria. And perhaps that goes into to our kind of the GSK team really thinking about what types of supports are going to be provided to the study sites to do this. Um, but I think that we need some real world um, elements in this. And then I actually really think that that needs to be part of the study, as I've mentioned previously. Thank you. Dr. Kunz, what, you know, as I hear you, you know, you know, I cannot avoid thinking of, well, okay, that's great. You know, we do need heterogeneity across America, and it is fair to say that uh, most of our patients do really don't want to come even to facilities that have main campus and original practices. They want to get their care. You know, uh, they expect sophisticated care, compassionate care, access to uh, the best available treatment, even access to research strategies in community and original sites. But the reality of it is we also know the complexity of delivering their care. And what I'm worried sometimes, as I hear you, uh, is and it's not a criticism of your statement, it's just that it makes me wonder if that heterogeneity will ultimately lead to suboptimal outcomes. And can we afford to have suboptimal outcomes in a patient population that, number one, can achieve cure, and number two, that given the opportunity, if you're a patient and you're tall, that your outcome is going to be drastically improved if you drive and or travel to a center of high volume, that most people will actually look and decide in a different way. Yeah, I mean, Jorge, it's, it's a very good point. I think this is really the balancing act that we need to strike with the study. I know I think it was, what, 45 sites are planned, so it's not going to be an unlimited number of sites, and there will be some level of control over that. And perhaps if we, you know, if community sites are selected, there's the ones that have conducted clinical research previously. Um, but I think we need to have some ability to demonstrate that this has some real-world applicability. So I think the devil's in the details in terms of determining what these criteria are, how we educate, and how that gets built into the study. Thank you. And, and I think to your point, you know, I think the Janus trial, as Dr. Smith also eloquently stated, uh, hopes to also provide that sort of real-world experience and, 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 and follow-up. So uh, I think the bigger question, again, is the time, you know, when these trials are going to be completed. Uh, Dr. Liu? Yeah, I'm just going to uh, completely obviously agree with what Dr. Koontz has already said and, and just, you know, add on to that. I mean, I think that this is truly intention to treat. Uh, and um, the guardrails here are really within the protocol. And I'll be honest with you, with non-operative management, I worry more about the coordination of the follow-ups than I necessarily do the expertise that it takes to do a flex sig and see if there's a scar and biopsy it. There may be some heterogeneity in terms of how people read MRIs, depending on uh, how frequently uh, a site does that. Um, and then obviously reading of CT scans is pretty standard across, uh, across the country. And so, you know, with the protocol, uh, I, I have very little concerns. I always worry in real life about these patients just falling off of the surveillance schedule because it is quite intense. Um, but that won't be a problem in regards to this particular study. 
And then on top of that, you know, this is essentially where the field is moving. Uh, and I think our community sites are having more and more um, experience with this. Uh, and so hopefully um, the care will uh, uh, race to, to meet this kind of new paradigm that we're having to deal with fairly quickly. Thank you, Dr. Lou. You know, I, I agree. I, I think that uh, in the protocol, I think most of us will be comfortable the way that uh, then, uh, the trial has been run uh, and also the sites and they're going to be activated and participating. I think the bigger question comes again as a group is, you know, what happens when this agent is out there, right, after trials where it gets approved or used off-label? And that is obviously a concern that one would have. Uh, Dr. Nieva, you know, what are your thoughts? Uh, you, have, you, you are in a place where there's uh, variability in access, obviously. You have major academic centers all throughout from Southern California to Northern California. How do you think this will play in, in the West Coast? You know, I, I think the, the West Coast is like any other place, and there's going to be, you know, for, for me, the, the issue is going to be variability in biomarker testing. Um, and, and we need to recognize that um, there's going to be, you know, maybe 5 maybe 10% of people with rectal cancer who end up having a false positive MSI assay uh, on the basis of local testing who are going to receive this therapy, um, and it's likely to have zero clinical benefits from them because of the biomarker problem. So I, I think the biggest harm and the biggest risk um, from this approach is going to be that um, because there's going to be variability in the quality of pathology, uh, both IHC and molecular pathology, um, that we're going we're gonna to treat some people incorrectly. And, and I think it's going to be very important in this clinical trial that the magnitude of that harm is quantified um, so that... Um, we understand that part of the risk of using this strategy is going to be that you shouldn't have gotten it in the first place. And so I think it's going to be important that, that trials that get executed really do an analysis of the intent to treat population and not simply the final refined population. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Schumber? Yeah, I, th I think um, when it comes to MSI testing or MMR, um, I actually think it's becoming pretty ubiquitous, and I, and I, I hope this is not my academic bias, but um, I don't think, I don't feel like the test is often wrong. I feel like the biggest challenge is getting it done in the first place. Um, especially with rectal cancer biopsies being limited and tissue and sometimes having to do repeated biopsies to get invasive disease tested. So I'd be curious to hear if others have, are having more difficulty with incorrect results, either false negatives or false positives. Dr. Siember, you know, are you, uh, when you talk about limitations of tissue, you know, uh, I mean, certainly in other malignancies, there's a concordance, right, which is pretty high between a liquid uh, biopsy, if you will, and a tumor tissue. So, um, I mean, how do you feel about, you know, uh, that sort of limitation of tissue? You know, you feel comfortable with variability, or do you feel that the variability could also be if you don't have access to material? I think that's the biggest issue is access to tissue because in the localized setting, you're not necessarily doing NGS or liquid biopsies or other things because often it's just not paid for, right? So, um, so you're really depending on the rectal biopsy, generally speaking, and, and that can be limited or it can just be difficult to make the diagnosis. You know, it, it can look like dysplasia and, and not invasive disease, so it can be tough to, to make that diagnosis of MSI high. Any uh, of our GI medical oncologists also, uh, uh, can, can anybody comment as to a variability of biomarker testing? And whether or not that's going to be, you know, uh, a challenge when, when this gets rolled out. I will make one more comment just before anybody else chimes in, in that this is 
you know, the Dostralumab data has been ex extremely good for PR <laughs> for our patients, and and so many patients now ask about their biomarker status where where they didn't before. Um, so I think the word is getting out that this is important. Obviously, it's not everywhere, but um, but I think that we're moving in the right direction at least. Thank you. Dr. Nieva, you have an additional comment? Yeah, I mean, just remember there, there's going to be places that are, that are going to be rural communities where this is still going to be done under IHC conditions by, by local pathologists. Um, there's, there, there's going to be, you know, variability, um, you know, uh, where this is going to be getting done in very small hospitals, rural hospitals in particular, the strategy is going to be uh, incredibly popular, right? Because then you have this feeling like you don't need to travel to a multidisciplinary center. So I, I, I think, uh, you know, and even in the Memorial Sloan Kettering experience, you know, we, we, we had recognition that there were some patients where the initial MSI was, was positive and then, and then it was not um, on, on further testing. So I, I, I think that there, there's going to be lots of communities where there's going to be pathologic variability. I think I think the uh, last paper I looked at on this subject, the AUC is, you know, somewhere in the 0.91 range across different assays, uh, which is good, but, but it really means that there, there's going to be some people treated with this that are going to get a harm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nieva. So, so perhaps if I can summarize this uh, uh, question, you know, clearly there, there's some concerns about variability in the biomarker testing. Um, differences between IC and molecular path and uh, th with the limitations of tissue material uh, from those rectal biopsies. Uh, I'm not sure that, you know, we have agreed that a lot of people are not doing genomic testing, you know. Um, I haven't seen real world data, but, uh, you know, most people in America with an oncologic issue, you know, are requesting um, genomics, uh, but it's possible that, that, again, depends on where you are. Uh, some people are still not actively engaged in that process. Um, it seems that there is an expectation that there will be, uh, that it is important for us to continue seeing heterogeneity, not only in access, but also in, uh, uh, in just to document what really would happen in the real world, you know, outside of a clinical trial for these patient populations. Um, we, we also agree that, um, you know, the importance of education, the importance of you know, how are you going to train uh, the community, uh, not only on protocol, but in the future as well, how to define uh, a clinical complete response, looking at endoscopic evaluations, MRIs, and the like. Uh, there clearly appears to be a big difference between protocol life and real life. If, there no, if there's no further discussion on this question, uh, we can move on uh, and begin the next question. We will now move on, on to question number five, which is a voting question. Ms. Ria Bat will provide the instructions for the voting. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Question five is a voting question. Voting members will use the Adobe Connect platform to submit their votes for this meeting. After Garcia has read the voting question into the record and all questions and discussion regarding the wording of the vote question are complete, Dr. Garcia will announce that voting will begin. If you are a voting member, you will be moved to a breakout room. A new display will appear and submit your vote. There will be no discussion in the breakout room. You should select the radio button, the round circular button in the window that corresponds to your vote. Yes, no, or abstain. You should not leave the no vote choice selected. Please note that you do not need to submit or send your vote you only need to select the radio button that corresponds to your vote. You will have the opportunity to change your vote until the vote is announced as closed. Once all voting members have selected their vote, I will announce that the vote is closed. Next, the vote results will be displayed on the screen. I will read the vote results from the screen into the record. Next, Dr. Garcia will go down the roster and each voting member will state their name and their vote into the record. You can also state the reason why you voted as you did if you wish to. Are there any questions about the voting process before we begin? If 
If not, we can move on to question five for the voting question. I just lost my screen, but I'm going to do this, you know, out of the document. So <clears throat> I'm going to read the question. This is a voting question. Will the data from the proposed single arm trials enrolling a total of 130 patients be sufficient to characterize the benefits and risks of the of the Starlimab in the curative intent setting for patients with mismatch reaper deficient DMMR and microsatellite instability high locally advanced rectal cancer? Are there any issues or questions about the wording of this question? If there are no questions or comments concerning the wording of the question, we will now begin the voting on question five. A couple of people have Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Hey, it's Pam, Pam. Someone has a question? Go ahead, Dr. Kuhn. Great, thank you. Um, this is Pam Kuhn. Um, I have a question about um, the question just in terms of does a yes answer um, imply that we agree with the proposed current endpoints, or does it allow for suggested modifications to the endpoints as has been discussed by the committee? Thank you. Dr. Garcia, would the FDA would like to re Would you like me to clarify? That would be great. Yeah. Great. This is Lola Fashona J. Um, I, I think what we're asking you is to really um, comment on whether sort of the totality of the proposal that uh, we've been discussing is adequate. I think if you if you find it mostly adequate, but there are some areas where you'd like to see uh, changes made, then your vote would be a no. Um, so you know, I think we've heard a lot about sort of the single arm trial design, which seems to be acceptable to most. Um, so there are other aspects of this question that you may want to specifically comment on. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions or comments related to the wording of this question? If there are no questions or comments concerning the wording of the question, we will now begin the voting on question five. We will now move voting members to the voting breakout room to vote. There will be no discussion in the voting breakout room. You have 15 seconds before the vote closes. The vote is now closed. 
we will momentarily return to the main meeting room. Voting has closed and is now complete. Once the vote results display, I will read the vote result into the record. Dr. Garcia will go down the list and each voting member will state their name and their vote into the record. You can also state the reason why you voted as you did, if you wish to. There are eight yeses, five noes, and zero abstentions. Dr. Garcia? Thank you. We will now go down the list and have everyone, everybody, everyone who voted to state their name and vote into the record. You may also provide justification for your vote if you wish to. Would it start with Dr. Liu? This is Chris Liu and I voted yes. Uh, obviously in this setting, as has been discussed, I don't think a randomized study is feasible uh, given the presentation of the existing data and patients' uh, overall goals and expectations. I will clarify, I do have some concerns about the use of complete clinical response at 12 months as a definitive endpoint, mainly because I, I don't think that there's a clear correlation, although there's a suggestion uh, that there's a correlation between complete clinical response and disease-free survival and distant metastasis rate. And that's just my only concern in regards to the complete clinical response rate as a definitive endpoint. I do think the endpoint of event-free survival at three years, which is a secondary endpoint of the study, will be critically important uh, just to show that correlation. Uh, but overall, I believe that uh, the study as designed uh, will provide the data needed for accelerated approval. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mitchell? Yes, thank you. I'm David Mitchell. I voted yes. Uh, if the frequency of the disease is as small as the discussions 
today suggests that it's probably difficult, if not impossible, as Dr. Liu just said, to accrue a randomized standard control arm, even a small one, as one of the public commentators uh, or commenters suggested. Second, given the, the initial very positive data, I do think it's difficult to get patients to enroll in control, given the irreversible toxicities and lifestyle and extreme quality of life sacrifices. And finally, Accelerated approval is for patients, and this feels like a condition and a potential enormous step up in care for patients that's worth going with the current proposed trial design, not waiting three to five years. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Dr. Kasalaki? Hi, uh, yes, I voted uh, uh, no. I, I... Uh, just on the fact, <clears throat> I wish there were some of the modifications that were discussed uh, during our extensive discussion here, uh, the centralized uh, testing. I apologize. I had was trying to uh, pull up a study we had uh, performed in the VA. There's uh, discordance with uh, uh, IHC and NGS testing um, in the VA. We do have ability to uh, do uh, sort of uh, sequence uh, many patients, um, but there is a substantial discordance. Um, so for the biomarker testing, um, I like the three-year uh, event-free survival, I think, is a more meaningful um, uh, marker for these patients. And if we just rely on uh, the 12-month CCR and then we can't go back on accelerated uh, approval, that might be an issue, and that often is with a lot of the accelerated approvals for the drugs and the subsequent um, sort of follow-up then kind of goes by the wayside, so I did have some concerns about that um, and, uh, you know, possibly using this marker in other sites, um, although I know I understand it's a, a different entity um, and that what would that mean for the future and the landscape of oncology. Um, uh, I would have, I think this is a, you know, a great opportunity. I would have just liked to have seen a little more um, regulation in terms of um, the design, but otherwise I, I hope this drug is promising and I just wish they had a higher, higher threshold um, and more of uh, the intention to treat um, kind of discussion that was had earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Chang? Uh, yes, I'm George Chang, and I voted uh, yes. Um, I think Chris Liu uh, very eloquently made all the comments that I would make. Um, I do think that um, I do think that monitoring that three-year event-free survival will be very critical. Uh, but um, given the um, compelling nature of the current data, um, uh, I, I think this warrants um, uh, uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Park? <clears throat> yes, uh, I voted no. Um, I think uh, extrapolation from the chemo radiation data to single agent immunotherapy is a little too early, and I think uh, the CCR endpoint is also inadequate. Um, the, those are the main reasons for voting no. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Jorge Garcia, and I voted no. Um, I literally voted no because I took the uh, question uh, literally and grammatically, uh, where it clearly stated uh, that whether or not this data was sufficient, and I don't believe this data is sufficient. I do believe this agent uh, has uh, great safety, has efficacy, has a pretty impressive uh, clinical complete response with the current data, uh, and I do believe it has a huge opportunity for us to delay, for some, maybe never having to have uh, the morbidity of a surgical chemo rats or surgical approach. However, I do not believe the data that we have and the data has been proposed by the applicant is sufficient to characterize the benefits and risk uh, in the curative intent setting for this patient population. Thank you. Dr. Nieva? George Nieva, USC. I voted yes. Will the data be sufficient? Yes, I think it will. But will the analysis be sufficient? That part I'm not so sure. For all the reasons Dr. Katsulakis stated, there's going to be variability in the biomarker uh, 
and we're going to be defining the enrolled population down to the eligible population and I think potentially misinterpreting the data that we get. We're not going to be liberal in the radiographic definitions of what is persistent disease. We're going to be very strict about that. Uh, and because of that also, we make this study less valid to the external world if it's interpreted that way. So I think the design and the data we get is going to be sufficient. Um, but I do think we need to be very careful in the analysis that's finally done. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Siamber? Yes, it's Kristen Siamber. I voted yes. Um, while the proposed studies certainly won't answer all of our questions about the optimal use of immunotherapy and MSI high locally advanced rectal cancer, I think they'll provide additional data um, to determine whether the initial pilot results are generalizable given the multi-institutional, multinational nature of the proposed studies, the um, longer follow-up and increased sample size. So on that basis, I voted yes. Thank you. Dr. Conaway? Yes, Mark Conaway. I voted no. Um, despite the extraordinary promise of the agent and concerns about the feasibility of doing a randomized trial, uh, I voted no because of the difficulty in interpreting results of non-comparative trials and the uncertainty around the long-term applicability of the endpoint. Thank you. Dr. Bassan? My name is Neil Bassan. I voted no, uh, despite the incredible uh, data, the incredible response rate data, and the very compelling uh, patient testimonials. I felt that, uh, that the data were not sufficient, again, to sum up what Dr. Garcia said about the word sufficient, given the nature of the clinical complete response 12 endpoint, uh, especially in this curative setting. Thank you. Dr. Coons? Hi, this is Pam Coons. I voted yes um, for many of the reasons already stated. Um, I believe in the single arm design and I'm supportive of CCR as an acceptable primary endpoint. However, I do think that we need to expand on some of the secondary endpoints as has been previously discussed in um, the um, Event-free survival is already added, but adding organ preservation rate, considering adding um, central confirmation of DMMR MSI high as part of eligibility criteria and quality of life. Um, I really think that our goal um, and appreciate sort of robust conversation from colleagues today, but really it's this balancing act of, act of identifying effective agents and minimizing morbidity and providing access. And um, I think that this trial will um, really be the first attempt to do that in this disease. So I voted yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mikowski? This is Paul Mikowski. I voted yes. Um, I think that in the, for me, in the context of uh, improvements uh, to quality of life, um, that, uh, you know, the data um, and, the, and the design is sufficient at this stage to warrant, um, you know, essentially moving on, uh, again, enough to, to, you know, collect that data you know, at this stage and move on, I think that it's, uh, that it's sufficient. Um, again, viewing that, you know, largely in the context of the, you know, uh, promise of improving the quality of life aspects uh, of treatment of the disease. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Madan. I voted yes, but I think that this planned study in rectal cancer with the Starlimab is suboptimal. That said, I don't think a randomized study will be feasible as, uh, because of, as the discussion highlighted today, PDL1 inhibitors will likely be used off-label. And if off-label use becomes the standard practice, then there will be no way to capture data prospectively. Therefore, that makes this uh, proposed tr uh, trial important as perhaps the only means to obtain that prospective data. I'm not 100% confident in the one-year clinical CR endpoint, 
Uh, that makes transparency and adequate follow-up for durability of response really incumbent upon the sponsor to share with the FDA and the public as it becomes available. Those endpoints must also remain at a high bar for cure rate as, and, and not just survival in a population that likely would be cured with standard of care. So this trial is a potential platform to get the data, but the questions must be asked appropriately and rigorously evaluated. Thank you. Thank you. Would you mind uh, to restate your name for the record, Dr. Madan? Yes, this is Robbie Madden. I voted yes. Thank you. So how can I summarize this vote? And the only thing that I can come out is with three uh, single letters, B-U-T, but. So the people, the group who voted yes, believe in the efficacy, believe in the safety, believe in the C, the clinical complete response of 12 months, as an adequate endpoint, but they, everybody pretty much agreed that there were some concerns as to the long-term outcome with this agent. Everybody, to the extent of what I gather, you know, felt that the data would be sufficient, but yet again, the analysis of what comes out of that data may not allow us to define the outcomes that we're seeking to achieve. Uh, also, uh, important uh, was pressed on, on the uh, uh, secondary and tertiary endpoints and the importance of quality of life. For the group who voted no, again, BUT, but, you know, we took that into consideration and I think most of us felt that the data, although great, you know, um, with existing data, was not sufficient to demonstrate the outcome that we all are seeking as patients. Before we adjourn, are there any last comments from the FDA? Uh, Dr. Garcia, this is uh, Lola Fashona J. On behalf of the FDA, I just want to thank the committee for this really excellent discussion. Uh, you know, I think more important than the vote was really the discussion that we had throughout um, the meeting. I also want to thank the Division of Advisory Committee consultants, uh, the audiovisual staff, uh, our invited guest, Dr. Kimi Eng, who gave us a masterful review of uh, treatment of rectal cancer, the GSK team for agreeing to participate in this somewhat atypical ODAC, and the members of the uh, FDA clinical um, statistical uh, regulatory and uh, teams for um, their contributions to this meeting. And thank you, Dr. Garcia, for, uh, for, con for really uh, doing a great job at keeping everyone on, on track with uh, giving us the feedback that we were looking forward to. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fashoy and Ajay, and thanks again uh, to the FDA for uh, their commitment, for uh, their guidance today. Uh, to the committee members, I appreciate your effort. I appreciate our discussions. Um, thank you also to GSK, and I echo also um, the comments as to uh, the outstanding uh, clinical faculty who presented today. Um, we will now adjourn the meeting. Thank you all very much.